Section one of The Jolly Parisians and Other Novelettes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. The Jolly Parisians by Emile Zola. Translated by George D. Cox. Chapter one The Two Charmers. This is a deliciously exciting period of my life for I am about to try that most fascinating and hazardous of all experiences, a search for adventure in Paris. What I shall encounter I know not, and this very uncertainty is in itself a mighty charm. Of course I shall meet Parisian ladies, delightful ladies I am sure, though I actually feel afraid of them, such dreadful tales have I heard concerning their coquetry and artfulness, not to say wickedness, and I am only a country youth, with neither the wit nor the courage to defend myself against beautiful sorceresses so powerfully armed. Well, I wish to see all that can be seen, and enjoy all that can be enjoyed, and if I by chance should fall a victim to the wiles and witchery of any designing siren, why, all I can say is, heaven help me. Eight days ago my father, Monsieur de Vauglade, permitted me to quit Le Bouquet, the melancholy old chateau in Lower Normandy where I was born. My father has strange ideas concerning the present time. He is a good half-century behind the age. At last I live in Paris, my slight knowledge of which was derived from having passed through it twice. Fortunately, I am not too awkward. Felix Bodine, my old classmate at the Can Lyceum, claimed, on again seeing me here, that I was superb, and that the fair Parisians will fall passionately in love with me. That made me laugh. But when Felix had gone, I surprised myself in front of a mirror, gazing at my five feet six inches, and smiling with my white teeth and black eyes. Then I shrugged my shoulders, for I am not a coxcomb. Yesterday, for the first time, I passed the evening in a Parisian salon. The Countess de P., who is my aunt, had invited me to dinner, it was her last Saturday. She wished to present me to Monsieur Nijon, a deputy of our arrondissement of Gomerville, who had just been appointed Under Secretary of State, and who is, the rumor runs, in a fair way to become minister. My aunt, who is much more tolerant than my father, plumply declared to me that a young man of my age could not turn up his nose at his country, even if it was a republic. She desires me to get a position somewhere." I will take it on myself to catechize that old pigeon-headed Vauglade, she said to me. Leave everything to me, my dear George. At precisely seven o'clock I was at the Countess's, but it seemed that they dined late in Paris. The guests arrived one by one, and at half-past seven all were not there. The Countess informed me with an air of despair that she had been unable to secure Monsieur Nigron. He was detained at Versailles by I know not what parliamentary complication— Nevertheless, she still hoped that he would appear for a moment during the evening. Wishing to fill the gap, she had invited another deputy of our department, the enormous Gaucherand, as we style him down there, and whom I knew from having once hunted with him. This Gaucherand is a short, jovial man, who has recently let his side-whiskers grow in order to have a grave air. He was born in Paris, and was the son of a pettifogging lawyer without fortune but he has, down with us, a wealthy and very influential uncle, whom he persuaded, I know not how, to give him a candidacy. I was, besides, ignorant of the fact that he was married. My aunt placed me, at table, beside a blonde young lady, with a cunning and pretty air, whom the enormous Gaucherand, in a very loud tone, called Bertha. All the guests at last appeared. It was still daylight in the salon, which was exposed to the setting sun, and suddenly we entered an apartment with curtains drawn, lighted by a chandelier and lamps. The effect was singular. Hence, as we took our places, the guests chatted about these final dinners of the winter season, which are saddened by the twilight. My aunt detests this, and the conversation was prolonged upon the subject, upon the melancholy of Paris, traversed at the close of day, when one rides along in a carriage in response to an invitation. I was silent, but I had experienced nothing of that sensation in my fachra, which had, however, roughly jolted me for half an hour. Paris, in the first glimmer of the gas, had filled me with a desire for all the enjoyments with which it was about to flame. 
When the entrees appeared, the voices were raised, and they talked politics. I was surprised to hear my aunt formulate opinions. The other ladies also were posted. They called the well-known men by their last names, judged and decided. Opposite me, Gaucherand filled a tremendous space, talking loudly, without ceasing either to drink or eat. These matters did not interest me at all. A great deal had escaped me, and I had finished by occupying myself exclusively with my neighbor, Madame Gaucherand, Bertha, as I already called her, for short. She was, indeed, very pretty. Her ear, especially, seemed charming to me. A little round ear, behind which yellow locks were curling. Bertha had the bewildering nape of the neck of a blonde, covered with straggling hair. At certain movements of the shoulders, her corsage, cut down in a square, gaped slightly at the back, and I followed, from her neck to her waist, the supple undulation of a cat. I had less admiration for her profile, which was a trifle sharp. She talked politics with more eagerness than the rest. "'Madame, will you take some wine? Shall I pass you the salt, madame?' I was politeness itself. I anticipated her slightest wishes, interpreting her gestures and her glances. She had stared at me fixedly on taking her place at the table, as if to weigh me at one swoop. A politics bore you, she said to me at last. They stun me, but what can one do? One must talk, and they talk only politics now in society. Then she leaped to another subject. Is Gomerville a pretty place? My husband wanted, last summer, to take me to his uncle's, but I was afraid. I pretended that I was ill. The district is very fertile, I responded. It has some fine plains. Good. That settles it, resumed she, laughing. It's frightful. A district as flat as a pancake, fields and more fields, with the same row of poplars as far as the eye can reach. I strove to protest, but she was already off again. She was discussing a law relative to superior instruction with her neighbor on the right, a serious man with a white beard. At length they talked about the theater. When she bent forward to answer a question asked at the end of the table, the feline undulation of the nape of her neck put me all in a flutter. At Le Bouquet, in the secret impatience of my solitude, I had dreamed of a blonde charmer. But she was diffident, with a noble visage, and the smiling mien, the little curling locks of Bertha had played sad havoc with my ideal. Then, as the vegetables were being served, I glided into a mad romance, the details of which I arranged as I went along. We were alone, she and I. I kissed her on the neck from behind, and she turned with a smile. We fled together to a far distant land. They were passing around the dessert. At that moment she pressed against me and said in a low voice, Give me that plate of bonbons there, in front of you. It seemed to me that her eyes had a caressing softness, and the slight pressure of her bare arm on the sleeve of my coat warmed me deliciously. I adore sweet things, do you? she resumed, biting off a piece of candied fruit. These simple words thrilled me to such an extent that I believed myself in love with her. As I raised my head, I saw Gaucherod watching me whisper to his wife. He was as gay as usual, and smiled with an encouraging air. The husband's smile calmed me. Meanwhile, the dinner was drawing to a close. It did not seem to me that Paris dinners were any livelier than those of Caen. Bertha alone surprised me. My aunt complained of the heat, and they returned to the first topic of conversation, discussing the spring receptions, and concluding that one ate really well only in winter. Then the company went to take their coffee in the little salon. Gradually a great many people arrived. The three salons and the dining-room filled up. I took refuge in a corner, and, as my aunt passed, she said to me rapidly, "'Don't go, George. His wife has arrived. He has promised to come for her, and I will present you.' She spoke of Monsieur Nijon, but I did not listen to her very attentively. I had heard two young men exchange a few rapid words which had startled me. They were standing on tiptoe at a door of the main salon, and when Félix Baudin, my old classmate of Caen, entered and bowed to Madame Gaucherod, the smallest one said to the other, "'Is he still her fancy?' "'Yes,' answered the taller of the twain. "'Oh, they're very thick. Now it will last till winter. Never before has she kept a fellow so long.' This did not cause me great suffering. I simply felt a wound of vanity— 
why has she told me in such a tender tone that she adored sweet things certainly i did not mean to dispute her with felix however i finally persuaded myself that these young men had culminated madame gaucherod i knew that my aunt was excessively rigid she would never tolerate compromised ladies in her house gaucherod had rushed forward to meet felix and grasp his hand and he was giving him friendly taps on the shoulder and gazing tenderly at him ah here you are said felix to me when he had discovered my place of refuge i came on your account do you want me to pilot you we remained standing in the doorway i would have liked to question him about madame gaucherod but did not know how to do so in an off-hand way while searching for a transition point i asked him concerning a host of other persons for whom i cared absolutely nothing and he gave me the names of the people with precise information in regard to each born in paris he had spent only two years at the Cannes lyceum while his father was prefect of calvados i found him very free-spoken a smile puckered his lower lip when i asked him for details as to certain ladies present are you looking at madame nijon he suddenly demanded of me the truth was that i was looking at madame gaucherod hence i replied blankly enough madame nijon ah where is she that brunette down there by the mantelpiece who is chatting with the decollete blonde in fact beside madame gaucherod and laughing gaily was a lady whom i had not noticed before ah so that's madame nijon said i and i examined her it was exceedingly unfortunate that she was a brunette for she appeared to me equally as charming though not quite so tall as bertha with a magnificent crown of black hair she had eyes at once flashing and tender her small nose shapely mouth and dimpled cheeks indicated a nature both turbulent and thoughtful such was my first impression but as i looked at her my judgment wavered and i soon saw her gayer than her friend and laughing more loudly are you acquainted with nijon felix demanded of me not in the least my aunt is going to introduce me to him oh he's nobody but a perfect ninny continued felix he's political mediocrity in full bloom one of those stop gaps so useful under the parliamentary regime and he hasn't two ideas of his own and as all the cabinet heads can make use of him he is in the most conflicting combinations and his wife i asked his wife well you can see for yourself she is charming if you want to get anything out of nijon pay court to her felix affected to wish to say nothing further but he gave me to understand that madame nijon had made her husband's fortune and continued to watch over the prosperity of the family all paris credited her with devoted slaves and the blonde lady i demanded suddenly the blonde lady responded felix without wincing is madame gaucherod there is nothing to be said against her eh of course there is nothing to be said against her he had assumed a grave air which he was unable to maintain his smile reappeared i even thought that i could detect a trace of boastfulness on his visage which angered me the two ladies had without doubt observed that we were talking about them for they laughed more heartily than ever a lady having led felix away i remained alone and i passed the evening comparing madame nijon with madame gaucherod wounded and attracted not fully comprehending what was taking place around me experiencing the anxiety of a man who is afraid of committing some stupidity by risking himself in a society with which he is not yet acquainted how vexatious he has not come said my aunt to me when she again found me in the same corner of the doorway but it is always the same it's midnight and his wife is still waiting for him i went around through the dining-room and planted myself at the other door of the salon in this manner i found myself behind the two ladies as i reached the door i heard bertha call her friend louise louise is a pretty name she wore a high dress the ruching of which allowed to be seen beneath her heavy chignon only the white line of her neck this discreet whiteness seemed to me for an instant much more enticing than bertha's entirely bare back then i had no longer any preference both of them were adorable a choice appeared impossible to me in the bewildered condition in which i found myself my aunt meanwhile was hunting for me everywhere it was one o'clock so you have changed your door eh she said to me well he's not coming that nijon saves france every evening 
but at any rate i'll introduce you to his wife before she goes and be amiable it's important without awaiting my response the countess planted me in front of madame dijon uttering my name and telling her my business in a phrase i behaved very awkwardly and could scarcely find half a dozen words louisa waited smiling then seeing that i had stopped short she simply bowed it seemed to me that madame gaucherod was making fun of me they both arose and withdrew in the antechamber where the dressing-room was located they had a fit of wild gaiety their free and easy hoydendish behaviour and their bold grace astonished no one but me the men separated and bowed to them as they passed with a mixture of extreme politeness and fashionable familiarity which stupefied me felix had offered me a place in his carriage but i made my escape wishing to be alone and i did not take a fakra delighted to walk amid the silence and solitude of the streets i was feverish as at the approach of some grave malady was it a passion which was sprouting within me like travellers who pay their tribute to new climates i was about to be tried by the air of paris End of section one. Section two of the Jolly Parisians and Other Novelettes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. The Jolly Parisians by Emile Zola. Translated by George D. Cox. Chapter two. Salon and Theatre. This afternoon I again saw the two ladies at the art salon, which opened today. I confess that I knew I would be likely to meet them there, and that I would have great difficulty in giving an opinion of the three or four thousand pictures in front of which I promenaded for four hours. Yesterday Felix offered to call for me towards noon. We were to breakfast at a restaurant on the Champs-Élysées, and then go to the salon. I have thought a great deal since the Countess's soirée, but I admit that that has not brightened up my ideas much. What a strange society is this Parisian society, at once so polished and corrupt. I am not a rigid moralist. Still, I was none the less shocked at the idea of the enormities which I heard men talking to each other about in the corners of my aunt's salon. According to the scandalous chatter, exchanged in whispers, more than half the ladies there were no better than they should be, and there was, beneath the urbanity of conversation and manners, a brutality of valuation which degraded all of them, the mothers as well as the daughters, soiling the purest quite as much as the most compromised. How was one to discover the truth amid these risky tales, these affirmations of the first who came along, deciding the virtue or the shamelessness of a woman? I thought at first, in spite of what my father had said on the subject, that my aunt received very villainous company. But Felix claimed that it was the same way in almost all the Paris salons, the most severe hostesses themselves were forced to show toleration under penalty of having their salons deserted the effects of my first shock having passed away i found myself only desirous of profiting by the easily obtained pleasures by the enjoyments offered with such bewildering grace for four days i have been unable to awake in the morning in my little apartment on the rue lafitte without thinking of louise and bertha as i familiarly called them a singular phenomenon had been produced within me. I had finished by mixing them together. I was now certain that Felix was really Bertha's slave, but that did not wound me. Quite to the contrary, I looked upon it as an encouragement, as proof positive that I had a chance. I, therefore, associated them together, since they had accepted the devotion of others, why should they not accept mine? This was the constant subject of a delicious reverie at my hour of rising. I lingered in bed, enjoying the warmth of the covers and turning over twenty times with the delightful laziness of the limbs and i avoided getting down to anything precise for it was agreeable to me to remain in doubt as to the denouement which i incessantly arranged to suit myself i could thus be nice about the circumstances destined some day to bring about the offer of my homage to bertha or louise i did not even wish to know which finally i arose with the absolute conviction that I had but to choose in order to make one or the other the idol of my life. When we entered the first hall of the exposition of painting, I was surprised at the enormous crowd which was stifling there. "'Diable!' muttered Felix. 
We are a little late. We'll have to elbow our way. It was a very mixed throng, made up of artists, tradesmen, and people of society. Amid ill-brushed, pale tots, and dark coats were light-hued toilettes, those spring toilettes so gay in Paris, with their delicate silks and bright trimmings, and I was particularly delighted with the calm assurance of the ladies, pushing through the thickest of the groups, without bothering themselves about their trains, the floods of lace of which always ultimately got through too. They went thus from one picture to another, at the pace at which they would have traversed their own salons. None but the Parisian ladies preserved the serenity of a goddess amid popular throngs, as if the words they hear and the contacts they undergo cannot reach and soil them. For an instant I glanced after a lady who, Felix told me, was the Duchess of A. She was accompanied by her two daughters, aged from sixteen to eighteen years, and all three looked without wincing at Lida, while behind them a lot of young artists merrily chatted about the picture in very free terms. Felix made his way into the halls on the left, a range of huge square rooms where the crowd was less compact. A white light fell from the skylights of the ceilings, a hard light which canvas curtains sifted, but the dust raised by the trampling of the people floated like a light smoke above the swell of heads. The ladies had to be handsome, indeed, to resist this light, this uniform tone which the pictures on the four sides of the walls stained violently. There it was an extraordinary medley of colors, of reds, yellows, and blues, which jarred, a whole rainbow riot in the glistening gold of the frames. It began to grow very warm. Bald gentlemen, with polished craniums, walked about, panting, their hats in their hands. All the visitors were looking upwards. There was a crush in front of certain canvases. Currents were produced. People pushed. It was a helter-skelter rush of a let-loose human flock through the palace, and one heard incessantly the continuous roll of feet upon the floors, which was accompanied by the hollow and prolonged noise of the people, murmuring like the sea. Ah, said Felix to me, there's the great picture that's so much talked about. Five rows of persons were contemplating the great picture. There were ladies with eyeglasses, artists making wicked comments in low tones, and a tall, thin gentleman taking notes. But I scarcely looked. I had just perceived— in a neighboring hall, leaning on the railing in front of the wainscot, two ladies who were curiously examining a small picture. It was at first but a flash. Beneath the rims of hats I saw thick black tresses and a confusion of blonde locks. Then the vision was swept away. A flood of people, of swaying heads, swallowed up the two ladies. But I could have sworn to them. A few paces off, between the incessantly moving heads, I again found now the blonde locks, then the black tresses. I said nothing to Felix. I contented myself with leading him into the neighboring hall, maneuvering so that he appeared to be the first to recognize the ladies. Had he seen them as well as I? I thought so, for he cast at me a sidelong glance of cunning irony. "'Ah, what a fortunate meeting!' he exclaimed as he bowed to them. The ladies had turned and were smiling. I awaited the result of this second interview. It was decisive." Madame Nijon completely upset me with a mere glance of her black eyes, while I seemed to have found a friend in Madame Gaucherod. This time it was a stroke of lightning. She wore a small yellow hat, covered with a spray of glycina, and her dress was of mauve silk, trimmed with straw-colored satin, a toilette at once very gaudy and very delicate. But I did not dissect her until later, for, at first sight, she appeared to me like a sun, as if she created light around her. Meanwhile, Felix was chatting. "'There's nothing striking here,' said he. "'At least I haven't seen anything yet.' "'Mon Dieu!' declared Bertha. "'It's the same as it is every year.' Then, turning towards the wainscot, "'Take a look at this little picture which Louise has discovered. The dress is a success. Madame de Rochetel had one exactly like it, at the last Elysee Ball.' "'Yes,' murmured Louise. "'Only it had a square neck.' She again studied the little canvas, which represented a lady in a boudoir, standing before a mantelpiece and reading a letter. The painting seemed to me very mediocre, but I felt myself fully in sympathy with the painter. "'Where is he now?' demanded Bertha, searching around her. "'He loses us every ten steps.' She spoke of her husband. 
Gaucherod is down there, tranquilly replied Felix, who saw everybody. He is looking at that big sugar Christ, nailed to a gingerbread cross. In fact, the husband, with a peaceful and disinterested air, was making the tour of the halls on his own account, his hands behind his back. When he saw us, he came to shake hands with us, and he said, with a gay air, Have you noticed? There is a Christ down there of a truly remarkable religious feeling. The ladies had resumed walking. We followed them with Gaucherod. The husband's presence authorized us to accompany them. Monsieur Nijon was mentioned. He would come without a doubt, if he got away soon enough from a commission in which he was to make known the opinion of the government on a question of special importance. Gaucherod took possession of me and overwhelmed me with friendly attentions. This bored me, for I was compelled to reply. Felix smiled, giving me a slight push on the elbow, but I was unable to understand. And he profited by my occupation of the big man to walk on ahead with the ladies. I caught fragments of the conversation. "'Then you are going this evening to the varieties?' "'Yes, I have secured a beige noir. They say the play is comical. I shall take you along, Louise. Oh, I wish it!' And further on. "'Well, the season's over. This opening of the salon is the final Parisian solemnity.' you forget the races so i do i want to attend the masson lafitte races i've been told that they're very nice during this time gaucherod was talking to me of la boquette a superb property he said the value of which my father had doubled i realized that he was full of flattery but i did not listen to him much stirred to the depths of my being every time that louise on stopping suddenly in front of a picture touched me with her long train her white neck under her black hair, was as delicate as that of a baby. But she kept up her hoydenish behavior, which jarred upon me a little. She was much bowed to, and she laughed, attracting people's attention by her outbursts of gaiety and the swift movements of her skirts. Two or three times she turned around and gazed at me fixedly. I walked as if in a dream. I cannot say how many hours I followed her in this manner, stunned by Gaucherod's talk, blinded by the leagues of pictures which spread out to the right and to the left i only realized that towards the close the dust of the halls got into my mouth and that i felt horribly fatigued while the ladies remained fresh and smiling at six o'clock felix took me off to dine when we were at dessert he said suddenly to me i'm very much obliged to you what for i demanded greatly surprised why for your delicacy in not paying court to madame gaucherod so you prefer brunettes, eh? I could not prevent blushing. He hastened to add, I don't want any of your confidences. On the contrary, you must have noticed that I refrained from interfering. In my opinion, one ought to go through his apprenticeship to life alone. He did not laugh now. He was serious and friendly. Then you think it's possible for her to have some regard for me, I said, without daring to name Louise. I, he replied, I don't know a thing about it. Do whatever you like, and see how matters pan out. I regarded that as an encouragement. Felix had resumed his ironical tone, and gaily, in his joking way, he claimed that Gaucherod would have preferred to see me offer my homage to his better half. Oh, you don't know the worthy man. You didn't understand why he lavished so much attention on you. His uncle's influence is declining in your aggrandizement, and, if he were obliged to present himself again before his electors, he would be delighted to be able to count on your father. Dame, I am afraid of the moment when you can be useful to him, as you will readily understand. As for me, he has now used me up. How abominable! I exclaimed. Why abominable? resumed he, with such a tranquil air that I could not tell whether he was mocking me or not. When a wife must have gentlemen friends, they ought to be useful to the family. On quitting the table, Felix spoke of going to the varieties. I had seen the play two evenings before, but I told a white lie. I expressed a strong desire to see the piece. And what a charming evening! Bertha and Louise were in a bag noir, very near our fauteuils. By turning my head I could follow upon Louise's face the pleasure she took in the actor's drolleries. I had thought these drolleries stupid two nights previously, but they no longer bored me. On the contrary, I enjoyed them, because they seemed to me to establish a sort of gallant complicity between louise and myself the piece was very gay and she laughed particularly at the risky speeches 
the fact that she was in a bagnoir sufficed to make it an allowable jollification when our eyes met in the midst of a burst of laughter she did not lower her head i thought that a more refined perversion could not be found i said to myself that three hours spent thus in this frolicsome communion would greatly advance my affairs but the whole audience was amused many ladies in the balcony did not even use their fans during an entr'acte we called upon the ladies gaucherod had just gone out so there was room for us to sit down the bagnoire was dark and louise was beside me she gave her skirts a shake and they covered my knees i carried away with me the sensation of this contact like a first mute avowal which linked us together End of section two Section three of the Jolly Parisiennes and Other Novelettes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. The Jolly Parisiennes by Emile Zola, translated by George D. Cox. Chapter three The Masson Lafitte Races. Ten days elapsed. Felix had disappeared, and I could find no pretext for seeking out Madame Nijon. I was reduced, in order to occupy myself with her, to buying five or six leading journals in which I read her husband's name. He had participated in an important debate in the chamber, and had made a speech which was attracting much attention. That speech, at another time, would have appeared wearisome to me. Now it interested me, for I saw Louise's black tresses and white neck behind the filmy phrases. I even had, with a gentleman whom I scarcely knew, a violent discussion on the subject of Monsieur Nijon, whose incapacity I defended. The bitter attacks of the newspapers drove me wild. Without doubt, the man is a ninny, but that is merely an additional proof of his wife's intelligence, if she is, as they relate, the good fairy of his fortune. During those ten days of impatience in vain rambles, I went five or six times to my aunt's, always hoping for a happy bit of luck, for some unexpected meeting. But, on the occasion of my last visit, I so greatly displeased the countess that I dare not return there soon. She had taken it into her head to obtain me a diplomatic position through Monsieur Nijon's influence, and her stupor was great when I refused, alleging my political opinions. To make matters worse, I had consented to accept the post at first, when I did not wish to offer my homage to Louise, and it was not yet repugnant to me to be indebted to her husband for a benefit. Hence my aunt, who could not understand my fit of delicacy, was amazed at what she styled a childish caprice. Did not legitimists, as scrupulous as myself, represent the republic in foreign countries? In fact, diplomacy is the refuge of the legitimists. They fill up the embassies and render the good cause a useful service by retaining the high situations which the republicans covet. I was greatly embarrassed to give good reasons in reply. I entrenched myself in a ridiculous rigidity, and my aunt finally told me I was an ass, being the more furious because she had already mentioned the matter to Monsieur Nijon. No matter. Louise would not believe that I was paying court to her that I might obtain a government post. I should be laughed at if I related the strange feelings I experienced during the past ten days. At first I was convinced that Louise had noticed the deep emotion which the contact of her skirts with my knees had caused me and I concluded that I had not displeased her, since she had not immediately drawn away from me. I considered this an advance which went beyond permitted coquetry. These are sincere notes, a sort of confession in which I conceal nothing. Many men, if they told everything, would admit that surroundings change, but that woman remains the same. In the matter of admiration, a woman either courts homage or permits it. I speak of married women, of fashionable ladies having appearances to preserve, the men who desire to worship at their feet quickly note if they express willingness beneath the good manners of education and refinement of luxury. All this is to say that, in my youthful egotism, I found a possible friendship between Louise and myself altogether natural. That bit of her skirts upon my knees was simply a piece of charming frankness and boldness. But, several hours later, I began to doubt. I took to contrary arguments— only a girl could indulge in such a proceeding. I was a fool to believe that a woman would throw herself at my head, even in a moment of bewilderment. Madame Nijon did not give me a thought. 
Perhaps she had worshippers, but her friendships were certainly more calculated and more complicated. There must be a vast difference between the woman of whom I had dreamed and the woman instinctively seeking adoration, and the adroit woman, the tricky Parisienne, such as she was beyond a doubt. So she had altogether escaped from me. I saw her no more, and I could not tell even if it was, indeed, true that I had remained for five minutes in the obscurity of a theatre-box, feeling the pressure of her form against mine. And I was very unhappy, so much so that, for an instant, I thought of returning to La Boquette, there to shut myself up. Day before yesterday, I at last conceived an idea, which I was astonished had not come to me sooner. It was to attend a sitting of the chamber. Perhaps Monsieur Nijon would speak. Perhaps his wife would be there. But fate decreed that I was not yet to see that fiend of a man. He was to have spoken, but he did not even make his appearance. It was said that he was detained in I know not what commission of the Senate. In compensation, as I seated myself at the back of a tribune, I felt a thrill on perceiving Madame Gaucherod in the front row of the tribune opposite. She saw me, and glanced at me smilingly. Alas, Louise was not with her. My joy vanished. When the session was over, I managed to meet Madame Gaucherod in the lobby. She greeted me familiarly. Felix certainly had spoken to her about me. "'Have you been absent from Paris?' she asked me. I stood silent hurt by the question. I, who had run so furiously all over the city. I have not met you anywhere. The last reception at the ministry was superb, and there has been a marvellous horse exposition. Then, seeing my air of desperation, she burst out laughing. Well, good-bye until to-morrow, resumed she, as she was going away. I shall see you down there, shall I not? I answered yes, stupidly, not daring to risk a question for fear of hearing her laugh again. She turned and glanced at me with a mischievous air. "'Come,' she murmured, in the discreet tone of a friend who had some delightful surprise in reserve for me. I was seized with a mad desire to run after and question her, but she had already turned into another lobby, and I flew into a rage against my foolish pride, which had prevented me from avowing my ignorance. Certainly I was ready to go down there, but where was it? The vagueness of this rendezvous tortured my mind and besides, I felt ashamed of not knowing what society knew. In the evening I hastened to Felix's, proposing to myself to obtain from him, in a shrewd way, the information I needed. Felix was absent. Then, overcome by despair, I plunged into reading the newspapers, selecting the most fashionable ones, and those having the largest circulation, and strove to divine, amid the information published for the morrow, which was the spot most likely to be the rendezvous of the bon ton. My perplexities increased. There were all sorts of celebrations, an exhibition of the old masters, a charity sale at a famous club, a musical mass at St. Clotilde, a general rehearsal, two concerts, and a taking of the veil, without counting races pretty nearly everywhere. How was an unposted provincial, conscious of his defects, to find his way amid such confusion? I understood perfectly that the height of fashion was to go to one of these places, but which one? That was the question. Finally, at the risk of waiting in vain an entire day, and of being devoured by impatience if I made a mistake, I dared to choose. I thought I remembered having heard the two ladies speak of the Maison Lafitte races, and an inspiration came to me. I resolved to attend the Maison Lafitte races. This decision made, I grew calmer. What a ravishing corner of the world is this suburb of Paris! I was unacquainted with Maison Lafitte, which enchanted me with its gay houses built upon a hill which borders the Seine. It was the early part of May. The apple trees, all white with bloom, formed huge bouquets amid the tender verdure of the poplars and elms. However, I felt myself very much of a stranger at first, lost between walls and green hedges, unwilling to ask my way of any one. I had had the joy of seeing a great many people take the same train, but the two ladies were not there, and, as I watched the passers-by at Maison Lafitte, my heart grew heavy. Getting beyond the houses, I had lost myself completely on the bank of the Seine, when a sudden thrill stopped me short near a clump of briars. Fifty paces away, a group of persons was slowly advancing towards me, and I recognized Louise and Bertha, Gaucherand and Felix, always inseparable, were following at a short distance. 
so I had guessed correctly. This filled me with pride. But my excitement was so great that I committed a piece of genuine childishness. I concealed myself behind the clump of briars, seized upon by I know not what shame, fearing to appear ridiculous. When Louise passed, the hem of her dress touched the briars. I instantly comprehended the idiocy of my first impulse. Hence I hastened to cut across the fields, and, as the promenaders reached an elbow of the road, I made my appearance with the most natural air possible, like a man who believes himself alone, and has abandoned himself to reverie. "'What? It's you!' cried Gaucherand. I bowed, affecting the utmost surprise. Everybody uttered exclamations, and we all shook hands. But Felix laughed in his singular manner, while Bertha winked her eye at me, which established a complicity between us. The others resumed walking, and I found myself a few paces in the rear with her. "'So you came,' she said to me, gaily, in a low tone. And, without giving me time to reply, she grew jocose, adding that I was exceedingly fortunate to be still so much of a child. I felt that she was an ally. It seemed to me that she would have experienced a personal joy in bringing me to her friend's feet. Then Felix turned and asked, "'What are you laughing about there?' Monsieur de Vauglade has been telling me of his journey with a whole family of English people, she replied tranquilly. Gaucherade had again taken Felix's arm and drawn him away, as if it was his desire that my tete-a-tete -tete with his wife should not be interrupted. I was left alone between Louise and Bertha. I spent an hour of ecstasy upon the shady road which followed the Seine. Louise wore a dress of light silk, and her pink-lined parasol bathed her face with a clear, warm light, without a shadow. The country made her freer than ever. She spoke loudly, looked me in the face, and answered Bertha, who urged her on to bold conversation with a persistence which struck me afterwards. "'Give your arm to Madame Nijon,' said Bertha, at last. "'You are not very gallant. Don't you see that she's fatigued?' I offered my arm to Louise, who immediately leaned upon it. Bertha rejoined her husband and Felix. We were alone, more than forty paces behind. The road ascended the hill, and we walked very slowly. Below, the Seine flowed, between meadows spread out like green velvet carpets. There was a long, narrow island, cut by the two bridges, over which trains passed with a roll as of distant thunder. Then, on the other side of the water, an immense plain full of cultivated fields extended as far as Mont Valerine, the grey fortifications of which could be perceived at the edge of the sky, in a sprinkling of sunlight and what moved me almost to tears was the odour of springtime spread around us, mounting from the grass on both sides of the road. "'Do you soon return to Le Bouquet? Louise demanded of me. I was idiotic enough to answer no, not foreseeing that she was about to add. "'Ah, that's unfortunate. We start next week for Le Moreau, the property my husband owns, two leagues from yours, I believe, and he counted upon inviting you to visit us.' I stammered out that my father might recall me much sooner than I had thought. It had seemed to me that I had felt her arm lean more heavily upon mine. Was this, then, a rendezvous that she was giving me? With the gallant idea that I had formed of this Parisienne, so free and so refined, I immediately constructed a romance, homage offered to her in the country, a month of worship, beneath the great trees. Yes, it was that. She had, without doubt, discovered in me the grace of a country gentleman, and wished me to adore her in my proper sphere. "'I have something to scold you about,' she suddenly resumed, taking on a tender and maternal air. "'Eh?' I murmured. "'Yes. Your aunt has told me about you. It appears that you will accept nothing at our hands. That's very wounding, indeed. Why do you refuse? Pray tell me.' I blushed a second time. I was upon the point of risking my declaration, of crying out, I refuse because I wish to worship at your feet, but she had a look as if she understood and did not wish me to speak. Then she added, laughing, If you are proud, if you insist upon rendering service for service, we will very gladly accept your protection in the country. You are aware that a councillor general is to be elected. My husband is a candidate, but is afraid of being defeated, which would be exceedingly disagreeable in his situation. Will you aid us? She could not have been more charming. This story of the election seemed to me the pretext of a shrewd woman to bring us together again in the fields. Of course, I will aid you, I answered gaily. And, if you cause my husband's election, it is understood that he, in his turn, will give you a lift? It's a bargain. 
Yes, it's a bargain. She offered me her little hand, and I squeezed it. We both of us joked. This, indeed, seemed delicious to me. There were no longer any trees. The sun came straight down on the top of the hill, and we were walking in an excessive heat, both of us grown silent. But that imbecile Gaucherod came to trouble this quivering silence beneath the sky of flame. He had heard us talking of the Council General, and he clung to me, relating the story of his uncle, maneuvering to get an introduction to my father. Finally, we reached the race course. They thought the races superb. As for me, I was standing behind Louise, gazing at her delicate neck all the time. What an adorable return in a sudden shower! The green of the country was greener still beneath the rain. The leaves and the soil gave forth a delightful odor. Louise had half closed her eyes. She was weary and seemed as if taken possession of by the voluptuousness of spring. "'Don't forget our bargain,' she said to me at the depot, as she got into her carriage, which was waiting for her. "'At Les Moreaux, in fifteen days. Be sure to come.' I grasped the hand which she offered me, and I fear that I was a little rough, as, for the first time, she looked grave, with two wrinkles of displeasure about her lips. But Bertha seemed constantly to encourage me to dare further, and Felix preserved his enigmatical laugh, while Gaucheron tapped me on the shoulder, exclaiming, "'At Les Moreaux, in fifteen days, Monsieur de Vergelade, we shall all of us be there.' From the bottom of my soul, I wished the devil had Gaucherod. End of section 3section four of the jolly parisians and other novelettes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by marianne the jolly parisians by emile zola translated by george d cox chapter four in the volubilis bower i have just returned from les Moreaux and my mind is so full of contradictory thoughts that I have need to go over for myself the history of the day which I spent with Louise, in order to try and form a clear opinion. Although Le Mural is only two leagues from Le Bouquet, I am but slightly acquainted with that corner of our district. Our hunting grounds are in the direction of Gomerville, and, as it requires quite a long detour to cross the little river of Big, I have not taken that route ten times in my life." The hill, however, is delicious, with its ascending road, bordered with tall walnut trees. Then, on the plateau, one again descends, and Les Moreaux lies at the entrance of a valley, the slopes of which soon approach each other again to form a narrow gorge. The dwelling, a small mansion of the seventeenth century, is not of great importance, but the park is magnificent, with its broad downs, and the bit of forest which ends it, and is so tangled that the very paths themselves have been invaded by the branches. When I arrived on horseback, two huge dogs greeted me with barking and continuous leaps. At the end of the avenue I saw a white stain. It was Louise, in a light dress and straw hat. She did not come down to meet me, but stood motionless and smiling upon the huge front steps which led to the vestibule. It was not later than nine o'clock. "'Ah, how charming you are!' cried she to me. You, at least, are an early riser. As you see, I am the only one yet up in the chateau. I complimented her on such courage on the part of a Parisienne, but she laughed, adding, It is true that I have only been here five days. I would rise with the chickens the first morning after my arrival, but from the second week I resume my lazy habits little by little, and finish coming downstairs at ten o'clock, as in Paris. This morning, however, I am still a countrywoman." Never had I seen her so ravishing. In her haste to quit her chamber she had negligently done up her hair, had thrown on the first wrapper that came handy, and, fresh as a rose, her eyes yet moist from her sleep, she was again a child. Little tufts of hair were flying about her neck. I noticed that her arms were bare to the elbows, when her wide sleeves gaped open. "'You do not know where I was going,' she resumed." Well, I was going to see the volubilis growing upon that bower down there, which, it appears, is marvellous before the sun has closed its flowers. So the gardener informed me, and, as I missed my volubilis yesterday, I don't wish to do so today. You will accompany me, will you not? 
I had a strong desire to offer her my arm, but I realized that such a proceeding would be ridiculous. She ran along like an escaped boarding-school girl. On reaching the bower, she uttered a cry of admiration. A regular drapery of volubilis hung from above, covered with tiny bells pearly with dew, and the delicate tints of which varied from bright pink to violet and pale blue. The bower resembled one of those fantasies in the Japanese albums in its exquisite beauty and strangeness. "'Behold the reward for early rising,' said Louise gaily. Then she seated herself beneath the bower, and I hastened to sit beside her on seeing that she had pushed aside her skirts to make a little place for me. I was greatly excited, because the idea had come to me to bring matters to a crisis by seizing her round the waist and kissing her on the neck. I fully realized that this would be brutal behavior, but the idea possessed me, and I could think of nothing else. I don't know whether Louise understood what was passing in my mind. She did not get up, but her air grew grave. First and foremost, shall we not talk about our business, she said to me. My ears buzzed, but I strove to listen to her. It was dark and somewhat cold beneath the bower. The sun pierced the foliage of the volubilis with slender darts of gold, and it looked as if golden flies and other golden insects had settled upon Louise's white wrapper. "'Where were we?' she demanded of me, with the air of an accomplice. And then I told her of the strange tacking about I had observed in my father. He, who for ten years had cried down the new state of things, prohibiting me from ever serving the Republic, had given me to understand, from the very evening of my arrival, that a young man of my age owed a duty to his country. I suspected my aunt of this conversion. The women must have been let loose upon him. Louise smiled as she listened to me. At length she said, I met Monsieur Vauglade three days ago at a neighboring chateau, where I was on a visit. We had a chat together. Then she added briskly, You know that the election to the Council General takes place on Sunday. You must begin your campaign at once. With your father on our side, my husband's success is certain. Is Monsieur Nijon here? I inquired, after some hesitation. Yes, he arrived yesterday evening, but you will not see him this morning, for he has gone off again in the direction of Gomerville to take breakfast at the house of a proprietor, one of his friends, who has great influence. She had arisen. I remained seated for an instant longer, regretting decidedly that I had not kissed her on the neck. Never again would I find such an obscure little nook, such a suitable opportunity. But now it was too late, and I was so thoroughly convinced that I would make her laugh by falling at her feet on the damp ground that I postponed my declaration to a more favorable moment. Besides, at the extremity of the path I had just caught sight of the cumbersome silhouette of Gaucherod. On seeing Louise and me emerge from the bower, he gave a little chuckle. Then he went into ecstasies over our courage in rising so early. He had barely got downstairs. "'And did Bertha pass a comfortable night?' Louise demanded of him. "'Ma foi, I don't know anything about it,' he answered. "'I have not yet seen her.' And, noticing my astonishment, he explained that it gave his wife the headache for the day if anyone entered her chamber in the morning. They had two chambers. That was more comfortable, especially in the country.' He concluded tranquilly, with a perfectly serious face, My wife adores sleeping alone. As we were passing along the terrace, which overlooked the park, we saw Bertha and my friend Felix come out from the vestibule. You are not under the weather, then? Louise obligingly asked her friend. No, thank you. Only, you know, change of habitation upsets one's nerves. And besides, at daybreak, the birds make such a noise. I grasped Felix's hand, and the two ladies exchanged smiles, while Gaucherod whistled. Breakfast was served at eleven o'clock. When it was over, Gaucherod disappeared to take his siesta. He had opened his heart to me, confiding to me that he was afraid of not carrying the coming elections, and adding that he counted upon residing three weeks in the arrondissement in order to make friends there. Hence, after having stopped at his uncle's, he had decided to spend a few days at Les Moreaux, desiring to show the entire district that he was on the best terms with the Nijons. That, he thought, ought to gain him votes. I understood that he had a great desire to be also invited to my father's house. The misfortune was that I did not seem to like blondes. I passed an exceedingly lively afternoon in the company of the ladies and Felix. This chateau life, with these Parisian graces, 
disporting themselves in the open air amid the first sunbeams of summer is truly charming it is the salon enlarged and continued upon the downs no longer the winter salon where people are somewhat cramped for space where the ladies in low-necked dresses ply the fan in the midst of black-coated gentlemen standing along the wall but a holiday salon the ladies clad in light dresses running freely along the paths the gentlemen in jackets daring to show themselves good-natured an abandonment of fashionable etiquette a familiarity which excludes the ennui of ready-made conversation i must confess however that the behaviour of the two ladies continued to surprise me who had grown up in the country among religious women louise after breakfast as we were taking coffee upon the terrace indulged in a cigarette bertha made use of slang words as if they came natural to her later on they both disappeared with a great rustling of skirts laughing in the distance calling to each other full of a recklessness which troubled me it is idiotic to make such an avowal but these days so entirely new to me gave me hope that louise would speedily accept my homage felix quietly smoked cigars i surprised him occasionally looking at me with his jeering air at half-past four o'clock i spoke of taking my departure louise instantly protested no no you mustn't go i shall keep you to dinner my husband will surely return by that time and you must see him at last i must absolutely introduce you to him i explained to her that my father expected me we were going to have a dinner at le bouquet at which i found myself compelled to be present i added laughing it's an electoral dinner and i am going to work for you oh in that case go immediately she said and you know if you succeed you can come to me for your reward it seemed to me that she blushed as she said that did she allude merely to the diplomatic post which my father was urging me to accept i thought i could attribute a more tender meaning to her words whereupon i assumed an air so insupportably presumptuous that i saw her a second time grow grave with that curl of the lip which gave her an expression of haughty displeasure but i had no time to reflect as to that abrupt change of countenance as i was going away a light carriage stopped before the steps at once i believed that louise's husband had returned but the vehicle contained only two children a little girl of about five years and a little boy of four accompanied by a femme de chambre they put out their arms they laughed and as soon as they could leap to the ground they ran and clung to louise's skirts she kissed them on their hair whose are these pretty children i asked why mine of course she answered with an air of surprise hers i cannot explain the shock which her words gave me it seemed to me that she had suddenly escaped from me that those little creatures had dug with their tiny hands an impassable gulf between her and me what she had children and i knew nothing whatever about it i could not suppress this harsh exclamation you have children certainly she said tranquilly they have been a couple of leagues this morning to see their godmother permit me to introduce them to you monsieur lucien mademoiselle marguerite the little one smiled upon me i must have looked excessively stupid no i could not accustom myself to the idea that she was a mother that upset all my notions i went away with my head in a whirl and even now i do not know what to think i see louise beneath the volubilis bower and i see her kissing the hair of lucien and marguerite decidedly these parisian ladies are too complicated for a countryman of my experience i must sleep over the matter i will try to understand it to-morrow end of section four section five of the jolly parisiennes and other novelettes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by marianne the jolly parisiennes by emile zola translated by george d cox chapter five the reward here is the denouement of the adventure oh what a lesson but let me strive to give the particulars calmly on sunday m nijon was elected councillor general upon examining the ballots it became evident that without our aid the candidate would have been defeated my father who had seen m nijon had given me to understand that a man so absolutely mediocre was not to be feared 
Besides, he wished to beat the radical candidate. But in the evening, after dinner, my father's old nature awoke in him, and he said to me, All this is not exactly the proper thing, but they all drummed into my ears that I was working for you. Now, do what you ought to. As for me, I am going to get out of the business, for I no longer have the slightest comprehension of what they are at. On Monday and Tuesday I hesitated about going to Les Mereaux. It seemed to me that it would be somewhat brutal to go so quickly to seek my reward. The children had ceased to bother me now. I had argued the matter over with myself, and had proved that Louise was as little a mother as possible. Was it not said in my province that the Parisian ladies never sacrifice a pleasure to their children, and that they abandon them to the care of servants in order to be free? Yesterday, Wednesday, all my scruples finally disappeared. Impatience was devouring me. I started on the warpath at eight o'clock in the morning. My project was to arrive at Les Mereaux at the same early hour as before, and to find Louise alone when she arose. But, when I dismounted from my horse, a servant informed me that Madame had not yet quitted her chamber, without offering to notify her, however. I replied that I would wait. And I did wait. For two whole hours. I did not know how often I made the tour of the flower-garden. From time to time I raised my eyes to the window of the second story, but the blinds remained hermetically closed. Weary and disgusted by this prolonged promenade, I, at last, went to the voluminous bower and sat down within it. That morning the weather was cloudy, and the sunlight did not glide like golden dust between the leaves. It was almost as dark as night beneath the drapery of verdure. I had reflected, I had resolved to play for all. My conviction was that if I hesitated again Louise would never accept my homage. I encouraged myself by evoking her gaiety— and hoydenish ways. My plan was simple, and I had matured it. As soon as I was alone with her, I would take her hands and cautiously begin by kissing her on the neck. For the tenth time I was perfecting my plan, when suddenly Louise appeared. "'Where have you hidden yourself?' said she, gaily, searching for me in the obscurity. "'Ah, you are there. For the past ten minutes I have been trotting after you. I ask your pardon for having made you wait.' I answered her, in a somewhat hoarse voice, that there was nothing wearisome about waiting when one thought of her. "'I notified you,' she resumed, without appearing to heed this bit of fatuity, "'that I am a countrywoman only the first week. Now I have become a Parisian again, and stick to my bed.' She had remained at the entrance of the bower, as if she were afraid to risk venturing amid the darkness of the leaves. "'Well, why don't you come out?' she at last demanded of me. "'We have something to talk about.' "'But it's very nice in here,' said I, in a quivering voice. "'We can talk on this bench.' She hesitated a second longer, then she said bravely, "'As you will. But it's so dark in there. However, words are without color. She sat down beside me. I felt myself growing faint. So the hour had come at last. A moment more, and I would take her hands. Meanwhile, altogether at her ease, she continued to talk in her clear voice, which was not in the slightest degree affected by any emotion. I will not thank you in cut and dried phrases. You gave us powerful aid, without which we would have gone to the dogs. I was not in a condition to interrupt her. I was all in a tremble. I exhorted myself to audacity. Besides, between us, words are useless, she resumed. We made a bargain, you know. She laughed as she said that. That laugh suddenly decided me. I seized her hands, and she did not withdraw them. I felt them so small and so warm in mine. She abandoned them amicably, familiarly, while she said, And now it's for me to fulfill that bargain, isn't it? Then I dared to be brutal. I drew her hands toward me, to place them upon my lips. The darkness had increased. A cloud must have passed above our heads. The strong odor of the grass intoxicated me in this leafy nook. But— before my lips had touched her skin, she freed herself with a strength I could never have dreamed she possessed, and, in her turn, she seized me roughly by the wrists. She held me without anger, and said in a voice still calm, though somewhat reproving in its tone, "'Come now, don't be foolish. This is what I feared. Will you permit me to give you a lesson while I have you here in this little nook?' She had the smiling severity of a mother who reprimands a bad boy." 
From the very first day I fully understood what was in the wind. They had related horrors to you about me, had they not? You have hoped for some unutterable things, and I excuse you, for you know nothing of our world. You came to Paris with the ideas of this country of wolves. No doubt you will say to yourself that it was in some degree my fault if you deceived yourself. I ought to have stopped you. You would have retired had I uttered a single word. It is true that I did not utter that word. I allowed you to go on, and you must think me an abominable coquette. Do you know why I did not utter that word? I stammered. The astonishment caused by this scene had paralyzed me. She grasped my wrists tighter. She shook me, talking to me at such close quarters that I felt her breath in my face. I did not utter it because you interested me, and I wished to give you this lesson. You do not understand yet, but you will reflect and divine what I mean. We are greatly slandered. We give, perhaps, sufficient purchase for that. Only, you see, there are pure women, even among those who appear the wildest and most compromised. All this is very delicate. I repeat that you will reflect and comprehend. Let go of me, I murmured, utterly confused. No, I will not let go of you. Ask my pardon if you want to be released. And despite her tone of pleasantry, I felt that she was growing irritated, that tears of anger were mounting to her eyes because of the affront I had offered her. A feeling of esteem and genuine respect for this woman at once so charming and so firm was growing within me. Her Amazonian grace, in bearing virtuously, the imbecility of her husband, her mixture of coquetry and rigor, her disdain for slander, and her role of a man in her household, concealed beneath the recklessness of her conduct, made her a very complex personage who filled me with admiration. Pardon, I said, humbly. She released me. I instantly arose, while she remained tranquilly upon the bench, no longer fearing anything either from the obscurity or the troubling odor of the foliage. She resumed her gay voice and said, Now, I get back to our bargain. As I am very honest, I pay my debts. Here is your appointment as an embassy secretary. I received it yesterday evening. And, seeing that I hesitated about taking the envelope which she offered me, Why, she cried, with an accent of irony, it seems to me that at present you can accept a benefit from my husband without a blush. Such was the denouement of my first adventure. When we quitted the bower, Felix was on the terrace, with Gaucherand and Bertha. He puckered up his lips on seeing me advance with my appointment in my hand. Without doubt, he was posted about everything and was laughing at me. I took him aside and bitterly reproached him for having allowed me to make such a mistake. But he answered me that experience alone formed youth, and, as I called his attention to Bertha, who was walking in front of us, questioning him also about her, he gave a shrug of the shoulders, the signification of which was exceedingly clear. Such being the state of things, I must admit that, in spite of all, I am yet unable to fully comprehend the strange condition of society, in which the most spotless women behave so singularly. But what gave me the finishing stroke was to learn from Gaucheron himself that my father had invited him and his wife to spend three days at Le Boquet. Felix smiled again, as he announced to us that he should return to Paris on the morrow. Then I made my escape, urging as a pretext that I had formally promised my father to be back in time for breakfast. I was already at the end of the avenue when I caught sight of a gentleman in the cabriolet. Quite likely it was Monsieur Nijon. Ma foi, I am delighted to have missed him again. On Sunday, Gaucherand and his wife will install themselves at Le Bouquet. What a task is before me! End of section 5《セクション6》of《The Jolly Parisian》and other novelettes。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lisa Reichert.《Mademoiselle Flavie》by Emile Zola, translated by George D. Cox. Chapter 1. A Startling Proposition. The room in which Nantes had resided since his arrival from Marseilles was on the top floor of a house in the Rue de Lille, 
next to the mansion of Baron Donvilliers, a member of the Council of State. This house belonged to the Baron who had built it on the site of some old outbuildings. By leaning out of his window, Nantes could see a corner of the Baron's garden, across which some magnificent trees cast their shade. Beyond, by looking over their leafy crests, a glimpse of Paris was to be had, the open space left by the Seine with the Tuileries, the Louvre, the Quays, a whole sea of roofs, and the Père Lachaise cemetery in the dim distance. Nantes' room was a small attic with a dormer window amid the tiles. He had furnished it simply with a bed, a table, and a chair. He had taken up his abode there because he was attracted by the low rent, and had made up his mind to rough it until he found a situation of some kind. The dirty paper, the black ceiling, the general misery and barrenness of this garret did not deter him. Living in sight of the Louvre and the Tuileries, he compared himself to a general sleeping in some miserable inn at the roadside, within view of the wealthy city which he means to carry by assault on the morrow. Nantes' story was a short one. The son of a Marseille mason, he had begun his studies at the school in that town, stimulated by the ambitious affection of his mother, who had set her heart upon making a gentleman of him. His parents had stinted themselves to give him a good education, but his mother having died, Nantes had been obliged to accept an unprofitable situation in the office of a merchant, where for twelve years he had led a life of exasperating monotony. He would have taken himself off a score of times if his sense of filial duty had not tied him to Marseille, for his father, who had fallen from a scaffolding, was quite unable to work. One night, however, when Nantes returned home, he found the old fellow dead, with his pipe lying still warm at his side. Three days later the young man had sold the few sticks about the place, and started for Paris, with just two hundred francs in his pocket. Nantes had inherited boundless ambition from his mother. He was a young fellow of ready decision and firm will, and even when quite a boy he had been wont to say that he was a power. He was often laughed at when he so forgot himself as to repeat his favourite expression confidingly, I am a power, an expression which sounded comical indeed when one looked at him in his thin black coat, all out at the elbows, and with the cuffs halfway up his arms. However, he had gradually made power a religion, seeing nothing else in the world, and feeling convinced that the strong are necessarily the successful. According to his idea, to be willing and able ought to suffice one. All the rest was of no importance. One Sunday, while he was walking about alone in the scorching suburbs of Marseilles, he felt genius within him. In his innermost being there was, as it were, an instinctive impulse driving him onwards, and when he went home to eat his plate of potatoes with his bedridden father, he was determined in his own mind that some day or other he would carve his way in that world in which, at the age of thirty, he was still a nonentity. This was no low greed, no appetite for vulgar pleasures. It was the clearly defined longing of a will and intellect which, not being in their proper sphere, drove to attain to that sphere by the natural force of logic. As soon as Nantes felt the paving stones of Paris under his feet, he thought that he had merely to put forth his hands to find a situation worthy of him. On the very first day he began his search. He had been given various letters of introduction which he presented, and, moreover, he called upon several of his own countrymen, thinking that they would help him. But at the end of a month there was still no result. The time was a bad one, people said, beside which they merely made promises to break them. His little store of money was swiftly diminishing. Indeed, at the most, some twenty francs were left. It was upon these twenty francs, however, that he was forced to live for another month, eating nothing but bread, scouring Paris from morning till evening, and going home to bed without a light, feeling tired to death, and still as poor as ever. His courage did not fail him, but a mute anger arose within him. Destiny appeared to him illogical and unjust. One evening Nantes returned home supperless. He had finished his last morsel of bread on the day before. No money, and not a friend to lend him even a franc. Rain had been falling all day, one of those raw downfalls which are so cold in Paris. 
Rivers of mud were running in the streets, and Nantes, drenched to the skin, had gone to Bercy and afterwards to Montmartre, where he had been told of work. But the situation at Bercy was filled up, and at Montmartre they had decided that his handwriting was not good enough. Those were his last two hopes. He would have accepted anything with the certainty that he would soon command success. He only asked for bread at first, something to live upon in Paris, a foundation stone upon which he might build his fortune. He walked slowly from Montmartre to the Rue de Lille with his heart full of bitterness. The rain had ceased falling and busy throngs crowded the streets. He stopped for a few minutes in front of a money changer's office. Five francs would, perhaps, suffice him to become one day the master of them all. On five francs he could, indeed, live for a week, and in a week a man may achieve great things. While he was dreaming thus, a cab ran against him and splashed him with mud. He then walked on more quickly, setting his teeth and experiencing a savage desire to rush with clenched fists upon the crowd which barred the way thus taking a kind of vengeance for the cruelty of fate. In the Rue Richelieu he was almost run over by an omnibus, but he made his way to the Place du Carousel, whence he threw a jealous glance at the Tuileries. On the Saint-Père Bridge a little well-dressed girl obliged him to deviate from the straight path which he was following with the obstinacy of a wild boar tracked by hounds, and this deviation appeared to him a supreme humiliation the very children prevented his progress finally when he had taken refuge in his room as a wounded animal returns to its lair to die he threw himself heavily upon his chair dead beat gazing at his trousers which the mud had stiffened and at his worn-out boots which had left a track of wet on the floor the end had come then nantes debated how he should kill himself his pride held good, and he imagined that his suicide would injure Paris. To be a power, to feel one's own worth, and not to find a soul to appreciate you, not one to give you the first franc which you have ever wanted. It seemed monstrous to him, and his whole being revolted at the thought. Then he felt an immense regret as his glance fell upon his useless arms. No work had any terror for him, with the end of his little finger he would have raised the world, and yet there he was, cast into a corner, reduced to impotence, and fuming with impatience like a caged lion. But presently he became calmer. Death seemed to him grander. When he was a little boy he had been told the story of an inventor who, having constructed a marvellous machine, had one day smashed it to pieces with a hammer, because of the indifference of the world. Well, he was that man. He bore within him a new force, a rare mechanism of intelligence and will, and he was about to destroy his machine by dashing out his brains in the street. The sun was going down behind the tall trees of the Danvilliers mansion, an autumn sun it was, with golden rays lighting up the yellow leaves. Nantes rose as if attracted by the farewell beaming of the heavenly body. He was about to die, he wanted light. For a moment he leaned out of the window. Between the masses of foliage he had often seen a tall, fair young girl, walking with a queenly step in the garden. He was not romantic. He had passed that age when young men in garrets dream that well-born ladies approach them with their love and fortunes. Yet it chanced that, at this supreme hour of suicide, he suddenly recollected that fair and haughty girl. What could be her name? He knew not, but at the same time he clenched his fists, for his only feeling was one of hatred for the inhabitants of that mansion, where glimpses of luxury were afforded by the windows partially open, and he muttered in a burst of rage, I would sell myself, I would sell myself, if someone would only give me the first coppers I need for my fortune to come. This idea of selling himself occupied his mind for a moment. If there had been such a thing as a pawn-shop where people advanced money on energy and willingness, he would have gone and pledged himself. He set about imagining cases. A politician might buy him to make a tool of him, a banker to make use of every atom of his intelligence, 
and he accepted, scorning honour, and telling himself that it would suffice if he some day acquired strength and ended by winning the fight. Then he smiled. Did a man ever get a chance to sell himself? Rogues, who watch every opportunity, die of want without finding a purchaser. Now that suicide seemed his only course, he was fearful lest he should be overcome by cowardice, and he tried in this way to divert his thoughts. He had sat down again, swearing that he would throw himself out of the window as soon as it was dark. So great was his fatigue, however, that he fell asleep upon his chair. Suddenly he was awakened by the sound of a voice. It was the doorkeeper of the house, who was showing a lady into his room. Sir, the doorkeeper began, I took the liberty to come up. Then, seeing no light in the room, she quickly went downstairs and returned with a candle. She seemed to know the person whom she had brought with her, being at once complacent and respectful. There, said she, leaving the room after placing the candle on the table, you can talk at your ease, no one will disturb you. Nantas, who had awoke with a start, looked with astonishment at the lady. She had now raised her veil and appeared to be about five and forty, short, very stout, and with the face of a devotee. He had never seen her before. When he offered her the only chair, casting an inquiring glance at her, she gave her name. Mademoiselle Chouin, I have come, sir, to talk to you about a very important affair. Nantes had sat down on the edge of the bed. The name of Mademoiselle Chouin told him nothing, and his only course was to wait until she thought fit to explain herself. But she seemed in no hurry to do so. She had given a glance round the tiny room and appeared to be hesitating as to the way in which she should start the conversation. Finally, she spoke in a very gentle voice, emphasizing her remarks with a smile. "'Well, sir, I come as a friend. I have been told your touching story. Do not think that I am a spy. My only wish is to be of use to you. I know how full of trials your life has been till now, with what courage you have struggled to find a situation, and the final result of all your painful efforts. Once more, sir, forgive me for intruding upon you. I assure you that sympathy alone— Nantes, however, did not interrupt her. His curiosity was aroused, and he surmised that the doorkeeper of the house had furnished the lady with all these details. Mademoiselle Chouin, being at liberty to continue, seemed solely desirous of paying compliments and putting things in the most attractive way. "'You have a great future before you, sir,' she resumed. "'I have taken the liberty to follow your endeavours, and I have been greatly struck by your praiseworthy courage in misfortune. In one word, in my opinion there is a great future before you, if someone gives you a helping hand.' She stopped again. She was waiting for a word. The young man, who believed that the lady had come to offer him a situation, replied that he would accept anything. But she, now that the ice was broken, asked him point-blank, "'Would you have any objection to marry?' "'Marry!' cried Nantes. "'Goodness, madam, who would have me? Some poor girl that I could not even feed?' No, a very pretty girl, very rich, splendidly connected, who will at once put you in possession of the means to attain to the highest position. Nantes laughed no longer. Then what are the terms? he asked, instinctively lowering his voice. The girl has been unfortunate, and you must own her offspring, said Mademoiselle Chouin, putting aside her unctuous phraseology in her desire to come straight to the point. Nantes' first impulse was to turn the woman out of the door. "'It's an infamous thing you propose,' he muttered. "'Infamous!' exclaimed Mademoiselle Chouin, affecting her honeyed tones again. "'I can't admit that ugly word. The truth is, sir, that you will save a family from despair. Her father knows nothing as yet. She has not long been in this condition, and it was I myself who conceived the idea of marrying her as soon as possible, representing the husband to be the cause of the trouble. I know her father. It would kill him. My plan would soften the blow. He would think the wrong half redressed. The unfortunate part of it is that the real culprit is a married man. Ah, sir, there are men who really have no moral sense." She might have gone on like this for a long while, for Nantes was not listening to her. He was thinking, why should he refuse? 
Had he not been proposing to sell himself a little while back? Very well, here was a buyer. Fair exchange is no robbery. He would give his name, and he would be given a situation. It was an ordinary contract. He looked at his muddy trousers and felt that he had eaten nothing since the day before. All the disgust of his two months' struggling and humiliation rose up within him. At last he was about to set his foot on the world which had repulsed him, and driven him to the verge of suicide. "'I accept,' he said curtly. Then he demanded a clear explanation from Mademoiselle Chouin. What did she want for her services? She protested at first that she wanted nothing. However, she ended by claiming twenty thousand francs out of the dowry which the young man would receive, and as he did not haggle over the terms, she became expansive. Listen, she said, it was I who thought of you, and the young lady did not refuse when I mentioned your name. Oh, she will thank me later on. I might have got a title. I know a man who would have jumped at the chance, but I preferred to choose someone outside of the poor child's sphere. It will appear more romantic. And then I like you. You are good-looking and have plenty of sense. You will make your way, and you mustn't forget me. Remember that I am devoted to you. So far no name had been mentioned, and upon Nantas making an inquiry in this respect, the old maid stood up and said, introducing herself afresh, Mademoiselle Chouin, I have been living as governess in Baron Donvilliers' house since the Baroness's death. I educated Mademoiselle Flavie, the Baron's daughter. Mademoiselle Flavie is the young lady in question. Then she withdrew, after formally placing on the table an envelope containing a five-hundred-franc note. It was an advance which she herself made to defray the preliminary expenses. When Nantes found himself alone, he went to the window again. The night was very dark. Nothing was to be seen but the black masses of shadow cast by the trees. One window only, in the gloomy frontage of the mansion, showed a light. So it was that tall, fair girl who walked with such a queenly step and did not deign to notice him. She or some other what mattered it. The girl was no part of the bargain. Then Nantes raised his eyes still higher, upon Paris roaring in the gloom, upon the quays, the streets, the squares, upon the whole left bank of the river, illuminated by the flickering gaslights, and like a superior being he addressed the city, saying, Now you are mine. End of section six. Read by Lisa Reichert. Section 7 of The Jolly Parisienne and Other Novelettes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lisa Reichert. Mademoiselle Flavie by Emile Zola. Translated by George D. Cox. Chapter 2. Mademoiselle Flavie. Baron Danvier was sitting in the room which served him as a study, a cold, lofty apartment furnished with old-fashioned leather-covered furniture. For the last two days he had been in a state of stupor, Mademoiselle Chouin having informed him of what had befallen Flavie. In vain had she softened and toned down the facts. The old man had been overcome by the blow, and it was only the thought that the offender was in a position to offer the sole reparation possible that kept him from death. That morning he was awaiting the visit of this man, who was utterly unknown to him, but who had robbed him of his daughter. He rang the bell. "'Joseph, a young man will call, whom you will show in here at once. I am not at home to any one else,' he said. Sitting alone at his fireside, he brooded bitterly. The son of a mason, a starveling without any position— Mademoiselle had certainly spoken of him as a promising youth, but what a disgrace in a family whose honour had hitherto been stainless. Flavie had accused herself with a kind of passionate eagerness so as to acquit her governess of the slightest blame. Since the painful scene she had kept her room, and indeed the baron had refused to see her. Before forgiving her he was determined to look into the matter. All his plans were laid but his hair had grown whiter, and his head shook with age. "'Monsieur Nantes,' announced Joseph. The baron did not rise. 
he simply turned his head and looked fixedly at Nantas, who walked forward. The latter had had the good sense not to yield to a desire to dress himself up. He had simply bought a black coat and a pair of trousers, which were decent but very worn, and gave him the appearance of a poor but careful student, with nothing of the adventurer about him. He stopped in the middle of the room and waited, standing up, but without humility. "'So it is you, sir,' stammered the old man. But he could not continue, for his emotion choked him, and he feared lest he might commit some act of violence. After a pause he said simply, "'You have committed a wicked deed, sir.' Then, when Nantas was about to make some excuse, he repeated more emphatically, "'A wicked deed! I wish to know nothing. I request you not to explain anything to me. Even if my daughter had thrown herself at your head, your crime would have been the same. Only robbers break in upon families in this way.' Nantas hung his head again. It is making money very easily, setting a trap in which one is certain of catching both child and father. Allow me, sir, interrupted the young man, stung by these words. But the baron made a violent gesture. What? Why should I allow anything? It is not for you to speak here. I am telling you what I am in duty bound to tell you, and what you are bound to hear, since you come before me as a culprit— you have insulted me. Look at this house. Our family has lived here for more than three centuries without reproach. Standing here, are you not conscious of our ancient honour and dignity? Well, sir, you have trifled with all that. It nearly killed me, and to-day my hands tremble as if I had suddenly grown ten years older. Be silent and listen to me. Nantas had turned very pale. He had taken a difficult part upon himself. He felt anxious to make the blindness of passion serve as his pretext. "'I lost my head,' he muttered, trying to make up some tale. "'I could not look at Mademoiselle Flavie.' At his daughter's name, the baron rose and cried in a voice like thunder, "'Silence! I have told you that I do not wish to know anything.' Whether my daughter sought you or you sought her, it matters little to me. I have asked her nothing, and I ask you nothing. Keep your confessions to yourselves. I will have nothing to do with such things. Then he sat down again, trembling and exhausted. Nantas bent his head, feeling deeply moved in spite of the command he had over himself. After a pause, the old man continued in the dry tone of a person discussing business matters. I beg pardon, sir. I had determined to keep cool, but failed. You are not at my disposal. I am at yours, since I am in your power. You are here to carry out what has become necessary. To business, sir. And thenceforward he affected to speak like a lawyer, settling as agreeably as possible some shameful case in which he was loath to dabble. He began formally— Mademoiselle Flavie d'Anvilliers inherited at the death of her mother a sum of two hundred thousand francs, which she was not to receive until her marriage. This sum has produced interest, but here are the accounts of my guardianship which I will communicate to you. He opened a book and began to read some figures. Nantes in vain tried to stop him. Emotion seized him in the presence of this old man, who appeared so upright and simple, and who seemed to him so great because he was so calm. Finally, the baron concluded, I bestow on you, by an agreement which my notary drew up this morning, another sum of two hundred thousand francs. I know that you have nothing. You can draw those two hundred thousand francs at my banker's on the day after the marriage." "'But I don't ask for your money, sir,' said Nantes. "'I only want your daughter.' The baron cut him short. "'You have not the right to refuse,' he said, "'and my daughter could not marry a man with less money than herself. "'I give you the dowry which I intended for her, that is all. "'Possibly you reckoned on more, "'for I have the credit of being richer than I really am.' And as the young man remained mute at this last thrust, the baron put an end to the interview by ringing the bell. "'Joseph, 
Tell Mademoiselle Flavie that I want her in my room at once. He had risen from his chair and now began to walk slowly about the room. Nantes remained motionless. He was deceiving this old man, and he felt small and powerless before him. At last Flavie appeared. My child, said the baron, here is the man. The marriage will take place as soon as possible. Then he went out of the room, leaving them alone, as if, so far as he was concerned, the marriage were over. When the door shut, silence reigned. Nantes and Flavie looked at one another. They had never met before. He thought her very handsome with her pale and haughty face, and her large grey eyes which never drooped. Perhaps she had been crying during the three days that she had spent in her room, but the coldness of her cheeks must have frozen her tears. She it was who spoke first. "'Then the matter is settled, sir,' she said. "'Yes, madame,' replied Nantes simply. Her face contracted involuntarily as she cast a long look at him, a look which seemed to be fathoming his baseness. "'Well, so much the better,' she continued. "'I was afraid I should not find anyone to agree to such a bargain.' Nantes could distinguish in her voice all the scorn which she felt for him, but he raised his head. If he had trembled before the father, knowing that he was deceiving him, he determined to be firm with the daughter, who was his accomplice. "'Excuse me, madame,' he said calmly, and with the greatest politeness. "'I think you misconceive the position in which what you rightly call the bargain has placed us. I apprehend that, from to-day forth, we are on a footing of perfect equality.' "'Indeed,' interrupted Flavie with a scornful smile. "'Yes, perfect equality. You require a name in order to conceal a fault which I do not presume to condemn, and I give you my name. On my side I require money and a certain amount of social position in order to carry out some great enterprises, and you furnish me with that money and position. We thus become two partners whose capitals balance— it only remains for us to express our mutual thanks for the service which we are rendering to one another. She smiled no longer. Indeed, a look of irritated pride appeared upon her face. After a pause, she asked, You know my conditions? No, madame, said Nantes, preserving perfect calmness. Be good enough to name them. I agree to them in advance. Upon this she spoke as follows, without once hesitating or blushing. You will never be my husband save in name. Our lives will remain completely distant and separate. You will give up all rights over me, and I shall owe no duty towards you. At each sentence Nantes made an affirmative sign. This was precisely what he desired. If I thought it part of my duty to be gallant, he said, I should assert that such cruel conditions would drive me to despair. But we are above empty compliments. I am pleased to see that you have such a just appreciation of our respective positions. We are not entering upon life by the path of roses. I only ask one thing of you, madame, which is, that you will not make use of the liberty I shall accord you, in such a way as to necessitate any interference on my part. What, sir? exclaimed Flavie violently, her pride revolting. Nantes bowed respectfully, and entreated her not to be offended. Their position was a delicate one. They must both of them put up with certain illusions, without which a perfect understanding would be impossible. He refrained from insisting further. Mademoiselle Chouin, in a second interview, had told him of Flavie's fault. Her friend was a certain Monsieur de Fondant, the husband of one of Flavie's school companions. Whilst she was spending a month with them in the country, she one evening found herself in this man's power, without knowing exactly how it had all happened. Mademoiselle Chouin almost went so far as to speak of violence. Suddenly Nantes felt a friendly impulse. Like all those who are conscious of their own power, he was fond of being good-natured. "'Listen, madame,' he exclaimed. "'We don't know one another, but it would be really wrong of us to hate one another at first sight. Perhaps we are made to understand each other. I can see that you despise me, but perhaps that is because you do not know my story.' Then he began to talk feverishly, throwing himself into a state of excitement as he spoke of his life, his ambition, and his desperate, fruitless efforts in Paris. 
Then he displayed his scorn of what he called social conventionalism, in which ordinary men become entangled. What mattered the opinion of the world, he asked, when a man had his foot on it? He must show his superiority. Power was an excuse for all. And in glowing terms he painted the sovereign existence which he would make for himself. He feared no further obstacle. Nothing prevailed against power. He would be powerful, and therefore he would be happy. Don't imagine that I am miserably sordid, he continued. I am not selling myself for your fortune. I simply take your money as a means to rise. Oh, if you only knew what is working within me, if you only knew the burning nights which I have spent always meditating over the same idea, which was only swept away by the reality of the morrow, then you would understand me. You would then, perhaps, be proud to lean on my arm, saying to yourself that you at least had furnished me with the means to become someone. She listened to him in silence, without one of her features moving, and he asked himself a question which he had been turning over in his mind for three days past, without being able to find an answer to it. Had she noticed him at his window, that she had so readily accepted Mademoiselle Chouin's scheme when the latter had mentioned him? The singular idea occurred to him that, perhaps, she would have loved him with a romantic love if he had indignantly refused the bargain which the governess had proposed to him. He stopped at last, and Flavie maintained an icy silence. Then, as if he had not made his confession, she repeated in a dry voice, then, my husband in name only, our lives completely distinct, absolute liberty. Nantes at once resumed his ceremonious air, and in the curt voice of a man discussing an agreement, replied, It is settled, madame. Ill-pleased with himself, he then withdrew. How was it that he had yielded to the foolish desire to overcome that woman? She was very handsome, but it was better that there should be nothing in common between them, for she might hamper him in life. End of section 7 Section 8 of The Jolly Parisienne and Other Novelettes This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lisa Reichert Mademoiselle Flavie by Emile Zola Translated by George D. Cox. Chapter 3. A Spoiled Triumph Ten years had passed. One morning, Nantes was sitting in the study in which Baron d'Anvilliers had given him such a formidable reception on the occasion of their first meeting. The study was now his own. The Baron, after being reconciled to his daughter and his son-in-law, had given up the house to them, merely reserving for his own use a little building situated at the other end of the garden and overlooking the Rue de Beaune. In ten years' time Nantes had won for himself one of the highest positions attainable in the financial and mercantile worlds. Having a hand in all the great railway enterprises, engaged in all the land speculations which signalized the beginning of the Second Empire, he had rapidly realized an immense fortune. But his ambition did not halt at that, he was determined to play a part in politics, and he had succeeded in getting elected as a deputy in a department where he had several farms. Since taking his place in the legislative body, he had posed as a future finance minister. Thanks to his practical knowledge and his ready tongue, he was day by day acquiring a more important position. He was skilful enough to affect absolute devotion to the empire, but at the same time he professed theories on financial subjects which made a great stir, and which he knew gave the emperor a deal to think of. On this particular morning Nantes was overloaded with business. The greatest activity prevailed in the spacious offices which he had arranged on the ground floor of the mansion. There was a crowd of clerks, some sitting motionless behind wickets, and others constantly going backwards and forwards to the sound of banging doors. There was the constant ring of gold, bags open and overflowing on the tables, the tinkling music of wealth which might have flooded the streets. In the ante-room a crowd was surging. Place-hunters, financial agents, politicians, all Paris, on its knees before power. 
great men frequently waited there patiently for an hour at a stretch, and he, sitting at his table, in correspondence with people far and near, able to grasp the world with his outstretched arms, was realizing his former dream of force, feeling conscious that he was the intelligent motor of a colossal machine which moved kingdoms and empires. Suddenly he rang for his usher. He seemed anxious. Germain, he said, do you know whether your mistress has come in? And when the man replied that he did not know, he told him to summon his wife's maid, but Germain did not move. "'Excuse me, sir,' he whispered. "'The president of the corps législatif insists on seeing you.' Nantes made an impatient gesture and replied, "'Well, show him in and do as I told you.' On the day before, a speech which Nantes had made on an important budgetary question had produced such an impression that the matter had been referred to a commission to be amended according to his views. After the sitting of the chamber, a rumour had spread that the finance minister intended to resign, and Nantes was at once spoken of as his probable successor. For his part he shrugged his shoulders. Nothing had been done, he had only had an interview with the emperor with regard to certain special points. However, the president's visit might have vast significance. At this thought, Nantes tried to throw off the feeling of preoccupation which was weighing on him, and rose to grasp the president's hand. "'Ah, Monsieur le Deux, he said, "'I beg your pardon.' Footnote. The events of the story are supposed to take place during the earlier years of the Second Empire, when the Duc de Morny was president of the corps législatif. Translator. End footnote. "'I did not know you were here.' Believe me, I am deeply sensible of the honour which you are paying me. For a minute they talked cordially. Then the President, without saying anything definite, gave him to understand that he had been sent by the Emperor to sound him. Would he accept the finance portfolio, and what would be his programme? Upon this Nantes, with superb calmness, named his conditions. But beneath the impassibility of his face a mute triumph was swelling. At last he had mounted the final rung. He was at the top of the ladder. Another step, and he would have all heads, save that of the sovereign, beneath him. As the president concluded, saying that he was going at once to the emperor to communicate Nantes' program, a small door, which communicated with the private part of the house, opened, and the maid of the financier's wife appeared. Nantes, suddenly turning pale, stopped short in the middle of a sentence, and hurried to the girl, saying to the duke, "'Pray, excuse me.' Then he questioned the servant in whispers. "'Madame had gone out early? Had she said where she was going? When was she expected home?' The maid replied vaguely, like a clever girl who did not wish to compromise herself. Understanding the absurdity of the situation, Nantes concluded by remarking, "'Tell your mistress, as soon as she comes in, that I wish to speak to her.' The duke, somewhat surprised, had stepped up to a window and was looking into the courtyard. Nantes now returned to him, again apologizing, but he had lost his self-possession. He stammered and astonished the duke by his clumsy remarks. "'There, I've spoilt the whole business,' he exclaimed aloud when the president had gone. "'I've missed the portfolio.' He sat down, feeling disgusted and angry. Several more visitors were then shown in. An engineer had a report to present to him, announcing that enormous profits would arise from the working of some mine. A diplomatist interviewed him on the subject of a loan, which a foreign power wanted to negotiate in Paris. His tools flocked in, rendering accounts of twenty different schemes. Finally he received a large number of his colleagues in the chamber, all of whom went into raptures about his speech of the day before. Leaning back in his chair, he accepted all this flattery without a smile. The clink of gold was still audible in the neighbouring rooms. The house seemed to tremble like a factory, as if all this money were manufactured there. He had only to take up a pen to dispatch telegrams which would have spread joy or consternation through the markets of Europe. He could prevent or precipitate war by supporting or opposing the loans of which he had been told he even held the fate of the French budget in his hands, and he would soon know whether it would be best for him to support or oppose the empire. 
This was his triumph. His formidable personality had become the axis upon which a world was turning. And yet he did not enjoy this triumph, as he had promised himself that he would. He experienced a feeling of listlessness. His mind was elsewhere, on the alert at the slightest audible sound. Scarcely had a flame, a fever of satisfied ambition, risen in his cheeks than he felt himself turn pale, as if a cold hand from behind had been laid upon his neck. Two hours had passed, and Flavie had not yet appeared. Nantes at last called Germain and gave him orders to summon Baron d'Anvillers, if the old gentleman was at home. Then he began to pace his study, refusing to see anyone else that day. Little by little his agitation had increased. His wife had evidently been to keep some appointment. She must have renewed her acquaintance with Monsieur de Fondette. The latter's wife had died six months previously. True, Nantes disclaimed being jealous. During ten years he had strictly observed the agreement, but he drew the line, as he said, at being made a dupe of. Never would he allow his wife to compromise his position by making him a laughing-stock. His strength forsook him, as he became a prey to that feeling of a husband who demands respect. He experienced agony such as he had never endured, not even in his most hazardous speculations, at the commencement of his career. At last Flavie entered the room, still in her outdoor costume. She had merely taken off her gloves and hat. Nantes, whose voice trembled, told her that he would have gone to her if he had known that she had come in, but, without sitting down, she motioned for him to have done quickly. Madame, he began, an explanation has become necessary between us. Where were you this morning? Her husband's quivering voice and the pointedness of the question astonished her profoundly. Where it pleased me to go, she replied in a cold tone. That is exactly what, in future, I must object to, he resumed, turning very pale. It is your duty to recollect what I said to you. I will not allow you to make use of the liberty I grant you in a way which may bring disgrace upon my name. Flavie smiled in sovereign disdain. Disgrace your name, sir. But that is a question which regards yourself. It is a thing which no longer remains to be done. Upon this, Nantes, wild with passion, advanced as if to strike her. "'You wretched creature!' he stammered. "'You have just left Monsieur de Fondette. You have, I know it.' "'You are wrong,' she replied without recoiling. "'I have never seen Monsieur de Fondette again. But even if I had, it would not be for you to reproach me. What difference would it make to you? You forget our compact.' He looked at her for a moment with wild eyes, then choking with sobs and throwing into one cry all the passion which he had so long stifled, he flung himself at her feet. Oh, Flavie, I love you! Unbending still, she drew back, for he had touched the edge of her dress. But the wretched man followed her, dragging himself on his knees with his hands uplifted. I love you, Flavie, I love you to madness! How it happened I know not. It began years ago, and it grew and grew, till now it has absorbed my whole being. Oh, I have struggled. I thought this passion unworthy of me. I called our first interview to mind, but now I suffer too much. I must speak. For a long time he continued thus. It was the shattering of all his principles. This man who had put his trust in force who maintained that volition was the sole lever capable of moving the world, was crushed, feeble, like a child, disarmed by a woman, and his dream of fortune realized, his present high position, he would have given all for that woman to have raised him by a kiss upon his brow. She spoiled his triumph. He no longer heard the gold which sounded in his office. He no longer thought of the endless procession of flatterers who came to him to bow their knees to him. He forgot that the emperor at that moment, perhaps, was summoning him to power. All these things had no existence for him. He had everything save the only thing he wished for, Flavie. And if she denied herself, then he had nothing left him. Listen, he continued. Whatever I have done, I have done for you. At first, it is true, 
You went for nothing in it. I simply worked to gratify my own pride. But soon you became the one object of all my thoughts, of all my efforts. I told myself that I must mount as high as possible in order to become worthy of you. I hoped to make you unbend on the day when I laid my power at your feet. See what I am to-day. Have I not won your forgiveness? Do not despise me any longer, I entreat you. As yet she had not spoken. Now, however, she said calmly, Get up, sir. Somebody might come in. He refused and still went on entreating. Perhaps he would have bided his time if he had not been jealous of Monsieur de Fondette. It was that torture which maddened him. At last he became very humble. I see that you still despise me. Very well. Wait. Do not bestow your love on anyone. I can promise you so much that I shall know how to move you. You must forgive me if I was harsh just now. I am out of my senses. Oh, let me hope that you will love me some day. Never, she answered energetically. Then, as he still remained on the floor, seemingly crushed, she would have left the room. But suddenly, beside himself with fury, he sprang up and seized her by the wrists. A woman braved him thus when the world was at his feet. He was capable of anything, could overthrow states, rule France as he pleased, and yet he could not obtain his wife's love. He, so strong, so powerful, he whose slightest desires were orders, he had but one desire now, and that desire would never be gratified, because a creature, who was as weak as a child, refused her consent. He grasped her arms and repeated in a hoarse whisper, I will, I will, and I will not, replied Flavie, pale and obstinate. The struggle was still going on when the Baron d'Anvilliers opened the door. On seeing him, Nantes released Flavie and cried, your daughter has just come from a rendezvous, sir. Tell her that a woman should respect her husband's name, even if she does not love him, even if the thought of her own honour does not stand in the way. The baron, who was greatly aged, remained standing on the threshold, gazing at this violent scene. It was a melancholy surprise for him. He had believed them to be united, and he looked with approval on their ceremonious intercourse in public, considering that to be a mere matter of form. His son-in-law and he belonged to different generations, but although he disliked the financier's somewhat unscrupulous activity, although he condemned certain undertakings which he regarded as undesirable, he was forced to recognize Nanta's strength of will and his quick intellect, and now he suddenly came upon this drama which he had never even suspected. When Nantes accused Flavie of having an admirer, the baron, who still treated his married daughter with the same severity as he had shown her when a child, advanced with a stately step. "'I swear to you that she has just come from her admirers,' repeated Nantes, "'and look at her, she defies me.' Flavie turned away her head disdainfully. She was arranging her cuffs which her husband had crushed in his roughness. Not a blush was to be seen on her face. Her father spoke to her. My child, he said, why do you not defend yourself? Can your husband be speaking the truth? Can you have reserved this last grief for my old age? The offence would fall on me as well, for the fault of one member of a family falls upon the others. Flavie made a gesture of impatience. Her father had well chosen his time to accuse her. For a moment longer she bore his questions, wishing to spare him the shame of an explanation. But as he in his turn lost patience, seeing her mute and obstinate, she finally replied, "'Father, let this man play his part. You do not know him. For your own sake do not force me to speak out.' "'He is your husband,' said the old man, "'the father of your child.' Flavie started, stung to the quick." No, no, he is not the father of my child. I will tell you everything now. This man is not even a sinner, for it would be at least some excuse for him if he had loved me. This man simply sold himself and agreed to hide another's sin. The baron turned towards Nantes, who had recoiled deadly pale. Do you hear me, father? continued Flavie more violently. He sold himself, sold himself for money. 
I have never loved him, and he has never touched me, even with the tips of his fingers. I wish to spare you a great sorrow. I bought him so that he might lie to you. Look at him now. See whether I am not telling the truth. Nantas hid his face in his hands. And now, resumed the young woman, he actually wants me to love him. He went down on his knees a while ago and cried. Some comedy, no doubt. Forgive me for having deceived you, father, but how can I belong to this man? Now that you know all, take me away. Indeed, he treated me with violence a moment since, and I will not remain here an instant longer. The baron straightened his bent figure. In silence he stepped forward and gave his arm to his daughter. The two crossed the room without Nantes making a movement to detain them. Then, upon reaching the door, the old man spoke these two words. Farewell, sir. The door closed. Nantes remained alone, crushed, gazing wildly into the void around him. Germain came in and placed a letter on the table. Nantes opened it mechanically and cast his eyes over it. This letter, written by the Emperor himself, gave him the appointment of finance minister. It was couched in the most flattering terms. He could scarcely understand it. The realization of all his ambition did not affect him in the least. Meanwhile, in the neighboring rooms, the rattle of money had grown louder. It was the busiest hour of the day, the hour when Nantes' house seemed to shake the world. And he, amid this colossal machinery which was his work, he, at the apogee of his power, with his eyes stupidly fixed on the Emperor's letter, uttered this child's complaint, the negation of his whole life. I am not happy. I am not happy. Then, resting his head upon the table, he wept, and the hot tears that gushed forth from his eyes blotted the letter which he had just received, appointing him Minister of Finance. End of Section 8section nine of the jolly parisienne and other novelettes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by lisa reichert mademoiselle flavie by emile zola translated by george d cox chapter four treachery during the whole of the eighteen months that Nantes had been a minister, he had been trying to drown the past by superhuman toil. On the day after the scene in his study he had had an interview with Baron Danvilliers, and Flavie, acting on her father's advice, had consented to return to her husband's roof. But they spoke no word together except when they were forced to play a comedy in the eyes of the world. Nantes had determined not to leave his house. In the evening his secretaries came to him from the ministry, and he got through all his work at home. It was at this period of his life that he performed his greatest deeds. A secret voice suggested lofty and fruitful aspirations to him. Whenever he passed by, a murmur of sympathy and admiration was heard. But he remained insensible to eulogy. It may be said that he worked without hope of reward, with the sole idea of performing prodigies of which the only aim was to compass the impossible. At each step on his upward career he consulted Flavie's face. Was she touched at last? Did she pardon him his former baseness? Had she still any thought save of the development of his intellect? But never did he surprise any emotion on this woman's mute countenance, and he said to himself, as he redoubled his efforts, I am not high enough for her yet. I must mount, still mount. He was determined to compel happiness, as he had compelled fortune. All his old belief in his power returned. He would not admit that there was any other lever in this world. It was will which produced humanity. When discouragement seized him at times, he shut himself up so that no one should witness the weakness of his flesh. His struggles could only be read in his deep-set, dark-circled eyes, in which an intense flame blazed. He was devoured by jealousy now. To fail to win Flavie's love was a torture, but the thought that she might surrender herself to another drove him mad. 
by way of asserting her liberty it was quite possible that she might openly associate with Monsieur de Fondette. Her husband affected not to occupy himself with her, but all the time he endured agony whenever she absented herself, even if it were only for an hour. If he had not feared to make himself look ridiculous, he would have followed her in the streets. That course displeasing him, he determined to have someone beside her whose devotion he could purchase. Mademoiselle Chouin remained an intimate of the house. The baron was used to her, not to mention that she knew too much to make it advisable to get rid of her. At one time the old maid had resolved to retire on the twenty thousand francs that Nantes had paid over to her on the day after his marriage. But she had, no doubt, calculated that there would be further pickings to such a household. So she awaited her opportunity, having found, moreover, that she needed yet another twenty thousand francs to buy the long-desired notary's house at Roivy, the little market-town she came from. There was no occasion for Nantes to mince matters with this old lady, whose pious mien no longer deceived him. However, on the morning when he called her into his study and openly proposed to her that she should keep him informed as to his wife's slightest actions, she professed to be insulted and asked him what he took her for. Come, he said impatiently, I'm very busy. Someone is waiting for me. Let us be brief, please. But she would listen to nothing which was not couched in proper terms. One of her principles was that things are not ugly in themselves, that they only become ugly, or cease to be, according to the way in which they are presented. Very well, said Nantes. A good action is involved in this. I am fearful that my wife is hiding some grief from me. For the last few weeks I have observed that she has been very much depressed, and I thought that you could find out the cause of it. "'You can count on me,' said Mademoiselle Chouin, with a maternal outburst on hearing these words. "'I am devoted to your wife, and I will do anything for the sake of her honour or your own. From to-morrow we will keep a watch on her.' Nantes promised to reward the old maid for her services. She pretended to be angry at first, but she had the adroitness to make him fix a sum, and it was agreed that he should give her ten thousand francs upon her furnishing him with a formal proof of his wife's good or bad conduct. Little by little they had come to call things by their proper names. From that time forward Nantes was less uneasy. Three months passed, and he was engaged upon a great task, the preparation of the budget. With the Emperor's sanction he had introduced some important modifications into the financial system, and he knew that he would be fiercely attacked in the chamber, and he had to prepare a large quantity of documents. Frequently he sat up all night, and his hard work deadened him, as it were, and made him patient. Whenever he saw Mademoiselle Chouin, he questioned her briefly. Did she know anything? Had his wife made many visits? Had she stopped long at certain houses? Mademoiselle Chouin kept a journal of the slightest facts. But so far she had not succeeded in making any important discovery. Nantes felt reassured whilst the old woman occasionally blinked her eyes, saying that she should, perhaps, have some news for him soon. The truth was that Mademoiselle Chouin had indulged in further reflection. Ten thousand francs was not enough. She needed twenty thousand to purchase the notary's house. She at first thought of selling herself to the wife, after having sold herself to the husband, but she knew Flavie, and she was fearful of being dismissed at the first word. For a long time past, before she had even been charged with this matter, she had kept watch over Madame Nantes on her own account, remarking to herself that the servant's profits lie in the master's or mistress's vices. However, she had discovered that she had to deal with a virtue which was all the more rigid, since it was based upon pride. One effect of Flavie's sin had been that it had inspired her with a hatred of men. So Mademoiselle Chouin was in despair when one day she met Monsieur de Fondette in the street. He questioned her so eagerly about her mistress that she plainly realized that he was anxious to see her again. Thereupon she made up her mind. She would serve both the admirer and the husband, a combination worthy of genius." Everything favoured her. Monsieur de Fondette, having been repulsed by Flavie and thereby driven to despair, would have given his fortune to renew the acquaintance, 
and it was he who first sounded Mademoiselle Chouin. He met her again, affected sentiment, and swore that he would kill himself if she did not help him. At the end of a week's time, after a great outlay of sensibility on the one side, and of scruples on the other, the matter was settled. He was to give her ten thousand francs, and she was to conceal him one evening in Flavie's apartments. The arrangement having been arrived at, Mademoiselle Chouin sought Nantes. "'What have you learned?' he asked, turning pale. She would not say anything definite at first. She merely remarked that her mistress was certainly carrying on a flirtation, and that she even made appointments. "'The facts! the facts!' hissed Nantes, furiously impatient." At last she mentioned Monsieur de Fondette's name. This evening he will be in her private apartments. Very good, thank you, stammered Nantes, and he sent her off with a wave of the hand. He was afraid of giving way before her. This abrupt dismissal astonished and delighted the old woman, for she had prepared herself for a long cross-examination, and had even arranged her answers so as not to contradict herself. She made a bow and then retired, putting on a mournful face. Nantes had risen. As soon as he was alone, he said aloud, This evening, in her private rooms. Then he carried his hands to his head as if he feared it would burst. This appointment, under his own roof, seemed to him monstrously impudent. He could not allow himself to be insulted in that fashion. He clenched his fists, and his rage made him think of murder and yet he had his task to finish, those budgetary documents to complete. Three times he sat down at his table, three times a heaving of his whole body raised him to his feet again. Whilst behind him something seemed to be urging him to go at once to his wife and denounce her. At last, however, he conquered himself and resumed his work, swearing that he would strangle them both that very evening. It was the greatest victory that he had ever won over his feelings. That same afternoon Nantes went to submit to the emperor the definite plan of his budget. The sovereign, having raised certain objections, he discussed them with perfect clearness, but it became necessary that he should modify an important part of his program, a difficult matter as the debate was to take place on the next day. "'I will pass the night over it,' he said, and on his way home he thought, I'll kill them at midnight, and I shall have the whole night afterwards to finish this task. At dinner that evening, Baron d'Anvilliers began talking about the budget, which was making some little stir. He did not approve of all his son-in-law's views on financial matters, but he admitted that they were very broad and very remarkable. Whilst Nantes was replying to the Baron, he fancied on several occasions that he noticed his wife's eyes fixed upon him. She frequently looked at him in this way now. Her glance was not softened, however. She simply listened, and seemed to be trying to read his thoughts. Nantes fancied that she feared she was betrayed. Accordingly, he made an effort to appear careless. He talked a good deal, affected to be very animated, and finally overcame the objections of his father-in-law, who gave way to his great intellect. Lavie was still looking at him, and suddenly— a hardly perceptible glimpse of tenderness darted across her face. Nantes worked in his study until midnight. Little by little he had become absorbed in his task, and soon he lost consciousness of everything save this creation of his brain, this financial scheme which he had painfully constructed piece by piece in the midst of innumerable obstacles. When the clock struck twelve he instinctively raised his head. Deep silence reigned in the house. Suddenly he recollected everything treachery was lurking in this silent darkness. But it was a trial for him to leave his seat. He laid his pen down regretfully, and took a few steps as if in obedience to a will which had forsaken him. Then his face flushed, and a flame blazed in his eyes. He darted for his wife's room. That evening Flavie had dismissed her maid early, saying that she wished to be alone. Until midnight she remained in the little boudoir which adjoined her bedroom. Stretched on a sofa she had taken up a book, but at every instant this book fell from her hands and, closing her eyes, she became absorbed in thought. Her face still wore a softened expression, and a faint smile played upon it at intervals. Suddenly she started up. There was a knock outside. "'Who is there?' she asked. 
"'Open the door,' replied Nantas. She was so surprised that she opened it mechanically. Never before had her husband presented himself in this way. He entered the room half distracted. His rage had mastered him while he ascended the stairs. Mademoiselle Chouin, who was watching for him on the landing, had just told him that Monsieur de Fondette had been there for some hours. Accordingly, he was determined to show his wife no mercy. "'There is a man concealed in your bedroom,' said he. Flavie did not reply at first, so greatly did these words surprise her. At last she grasped their meaning. "'You are mad, sir,' she answered. But without stopping to argue, he was already on his way to the bedroom. Then, with one bound, she threw herself before the door, crying, "'You shall not go in. These are my rooms, and I forbid you to enter them.' Quivering with passion and looking taller in her pride, she guarded the door. For a moment they stood thus, motionless, speechless, gazing into one another's eyes. Nantas, his head bent forward, his arms expanded, was about to throw himself upon her to force a passage. "'Come away from that door,' he said in a hoarse whisper. "'I'm stronger than you, and go in I will.' "'You shall not go in. I will not permit it.' Almost beside himself, Nantas could only keep repeating, "'There is a man in there! There is a man in there!' Flavie, not even deigning to deny it, shrugged her shoulders. Then, as her husband took another step forward, she cried, "'And supposing that there is a man in there, what difference does that make to you? Am I not free?' He recoiled at these words, which struck him like a blow. It was quite true. She was free." A cold shudder ran through him. He plainly realized that she had the best of the argument, and that he was playing the part of a feeble and illogical child. He was not observing the compact. His foolish passion had made it hateful to him. Why had he not remained at work in his study? The blood fled from his cheeks, and an indefinable look of suffering overspread his face. When Flavie saw his pitiable condition, she left the door whilst a tender gleam came into her eyes. Look, she said simply, and then she passed into the bedroom herself, carrying a lamp in her hand, whilst Nantas remained standing at the door. He had made her a sign as if to say that it was sufficient, and that he did not wish to enter. But it was she who insisted now. When she had drawn aside the curtains, and Monsieur de Fondette appeared concealed behind them, so intense was her amazement, that she uttered a cry of horror. "'It was true,' she stammered. "'It was true this man was here, but I did not know it. On my life I swear it!' Then with an effort she calmed herself, and even seemed to regret the impulse which had led her to defend herself. "'You were right, sir, and I crave your pardon,' she said to Nantas, endeavouring to speak in her usual tone of voice. Monsieur de Fondette, however, felt somewhat foolish, and would have given a good deal if the husband had only flown into a passion. But Nantas remained silent. He had simply turned very pale. When he had carried his eyes from Monsieur de Fondette to Flavie, he bowed to the latter, merely saying, "'Excuse me, madame, you are free.' Then he turned and walked away. Something seemed broken within him. Merely the machinery of muscle and bone still worked. When he reached his study again, he walked straight to a drawer where he kept a revolver. Having examined the weapon, he said aloud, as if making a formal engagement with himself, "'That suffices. I will kill myself presently.' He turned up his lamp, sat down at his table, and quietly resumed his work. Amid the deep silence, he completed, without an instant's hesitation, a sentence that he had left unfinished. One by one fresh sheets of paper swelled the heap. Two hours later, when Flavie, who had driven Monsieur de Fondette away, came down with bare feet to listen at the door, she only heard the sound of her husband's pen scratching the paper. She bent down and applied her eye to the keyhole. Nantas was still calmly writing. His face was expressive of peace and satisfaction at his work but a ray of the lamp fell upon the barrel of the revolver at his side. End of chapter 4 
Section 10 of The Jolly Parisienne and Other Novelettes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Lisa Reichert. Mademoiselle Flavie by Emile Zola. Translated by George D. Cox. Chapter 5. One at Last. The house adjoining the garden of the mansion was now the property of Nantes, who had bought it from his father-in-law. Out of caprice, he refrained from letting the miserable garret where he had struggled against want for two months after his arrival in Paris. Since he had acquired an enormous fortune, he had, on more than one occasion, felt impelled to go and shut himself up in the little room for several hours. It was there that he had suffered, and it was there that he liked to enjoy his triumph. Again, whenever he met with any obstacle, he was wont to go there to reflect, and to form great resolutions. Once there he again became what he had formerly been, and now, when the hand of death was upon him, it was in this attic that he determined to meet it. Nantes did not finish his work until eight o'clock in the morning. Fearing that fatigue might overcome him, he took a cold bath. Then he summoned several of his clerks for the purpose of giving them instructions. When his secretary arrived, he had an interview with him, and the secretary received orders to take the plan of the budget to the Tuileries and to furnish certain explanations if the emperor raised any fresh objections. After this, Nantes considered that he had done enough. He had left everything in order. He was not going off like a demented bankrupt. After all, he was his own property. He could dispose of himself. Nine o'clock struck. The time had come. But as he was leaving his study, taking the revolver with him, he had to suffer a final humiliation. Mademoiselle Chouin presented herself to claim the ten thousand francs which he had promised her. He paid her, and was forced to put up with her familiarity. She assumed a maternal air, and seemed to treat him as a successful pupil. Even if he had had any hesitation left, this shameful complicity would have confirmed him in his intention. He sought the garret quickly, and in his haste he left the door unlocked. Nothing was changed there. The paper had the same rents. The bed, the table, and the chair were still there, with their same old look of poverty. For a moment he breathed this air which reminded him of his former struggles. Then he approached the window and caught sight of the same glimpse of Paris, the trees in the garden, the Seine, the quays, and a part of the right bank of the river where the houses rose up in confused masses, until lost to sight at the point where the Père Lachaise Cemetery appeared in the far distance. The revolver was lying within his reach on the rickety table. There was no hurry now. He felt certain that no one would disturb him and that he could kill himself whenever he pleased. He became absorbed in thought, and he reflected that he was now at the same point as formerly, led back to the same spot, with the same intention of suicide. One evening before, in this very room, he had determined to dash his brains out. In those days he had been too poor to purchase a pistol. He had had only the stones in the streets at his disposal, but death was awaiting him, now as then. So in this world death is the only thing which never fails, which is always sure and always ready. Nothing that he knew of was like death. He sought in vain. All else had given way beneath him. Death alone remained a certainty. He regretted that he had lived ten years too long. The experience that he had acquired of life, in his ascent to fortune and power, seemed to him puerile. Why this expenditure of will, to what purpose this waste of force, since will and force were not everything? One passion had sufficed to destroy him. He had foolishly allowed himself to love Flavie, and now the edifice which he had built up was cracking collapsing like a mere house of cards, swept away by the breath of a child. It was lamentable. It resembled the punishment of a marauding schoolboy, under whom a branch snaps, and who perishes there where he had sinned. Life was a mistake. The best men ended it as tamely as the fools. Nantes had taken the revolver from the table and was slowly loading it. At this supreme moment one last regret made him hesitate for a second. What great things he would have realized if Flavie had understood him. On the day when she had thrown herself on his neck, saying, I love you, 
on that day he would have found a lever to move the world and his last thought was one of disdain for force since force had not been able to give him flavie he raised the revolver the morning was a glorious one through the open window the sun poured in giving even a look of brightness to the wretched garret in the distance paris was awakening to its giant life nantes pressed the barrel to his temple but the door was suddenly flung open and flavie entered with one movement she dashed the weapon aside and the bullet lodged itself in the ceiling they looked at one another she was so out of breath so choked with emotion that she could not speak at last embracing nantes for the first time she uttered the only words which could have determined him to live i love you she cried sobbing on his breast and tearing the avowal from her pride her mastered being i love you because of your strong mind end of section 10 read by lisa reichert section 11 of the jolly parisiennes and other novelettes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand Nais the Brunette by Emile Zola Translated by George D. Cox Chapter 1. Friedrich During the fruit season, a brown-skinned little girl with bushy black hair used to come every month to the house of Monsieur Rostand, a lawyer of Aix, bringing an enormous basket of apricots or peaches, so heavy that she had hardly strength enough to carry it. She would wait in the large entrance hall, whither all the family came to greet her. "'So it's you, Nace, the lawyer would say. "'You've brought us some fruit, eh? "'Come, you're a good girl. "'And how is your father?' "'Quite well, sir,' replied the little girl. Then Madame Rostand would take her into the kitchen and ask her about the olives, the almonds, and the vines. But the most important question was whether there had been any rain at Le Stac, where the Rostand's estate was situated, a place called La Blancarde, which was cultivated by the Micoulins. There were but a few dozen almond and olive trees, but the question of rain was none the less an important one in this province where everything perishes from drought. There have been a few drops, Nace would say. The vines want more. Then, having imparted her news, she ate a piece of bread and some scraps of meat, and set out again for Le Stock in a butcher's cart which came to Aix every fortnight. Frequently she brought some shellfish, a lobster, a fine eel, for Micoulin fished more than he tilled the ground. When she came during the holidays, Friedrich, the lawyer's son, used to rush into the kitchen to tell her that the family would soon take up their quarters at La Blancarde, and that she must get some nets and lines ready. He was almost like a brother to her, for they had played together as children. Since the age of twelve, however, she had called him Monsieur Friedrich out of respect. Every time old Micoulin heard her speak familiarly to the young man, he boxed her ears, but in spite of this the two children were sworn allies. "'Don't forget to mend the nets,' repeated the schoolboy. "'No fear, Monsieur Frederick,' replied Nace. "'They'll be ready for you.' Monsieur Rostand was very wealthy. He had bought a splendid mansion in the Rue de Coulage at a very low price. The Hôtel de Quaronne, built during the latter part of the seventeenth century, had twelve windows in its frontage, and contained enough rooms to house a religious order. Amid these vast rooms, the family, consisting of five persons, including the two old servants, seemed lost. The lawyer occupied merely the first floor. For ten years he had tried, without success, to let the ground and second floors, and finally he had decided to lock them up, thus abandoning two-thirds of the house to the spiders. Echoes like those of a cathedral resounded through the empty, sonorous mansion at the least noise in the entrance hall, an enormous hall with a staircase from which one could easily have obtained sufficient material to build a modern house. 
Immediately after his purchase, Monsieur Rostand had divided the grand drawing-room into two offices by means of a partition. It was a room of thirty-six feet by twenty-four, lighted by six windows. Of one of the two parts he had formed his own private room, the other being allotted to his clerks. The first floor contained four other apartments, the smallest of which measured twenty feet by fifteen. Madame Rostrand, Frederick, and the two old servants had bedrooms as lofty as churches. The lawyer had been forced, for convenience's sake, to convert an old boudoir into a kitchen, for at an earlier stage, when they had made use of the kitchen on the ground floor, the food had come to the table quite cold, after passing through the chilly atmosphere of the entrance hall and staircase. To make matters worse, these gigantic apartments were furnished in the most sparing manner. In the lawyer's private room was an ancient suite of furniture, upholstered in green Utrecht velvet, and of the stiff and comfortless-looking empire style, did its best to fill up the space. With its sofa and eight chairs, a little round table belonging to the same period looked like a toy in this immensity. On the chimney-piece there was nothing beyond a horrible modern marble clock between two vases, whilst the tiled floor, looking much the worse for age, showed a dirty red. The bedrooms were more empty still. The whole house brought home to one the tranquil disdain which southern families, even the richest of them, display for comfort and luxury in this happy land of the sun, where life is mainly spent out of doors. The Rostands were certainly not conscious of the melancholy, mortal chilliness brooding over these huge rooms, and mainly due to the scantiness and poverty-stricken aspect of the furniture. Yet the lawyer was a shrewd man. His father had left him one of the best practices in Aix, and he had managed to improve it considerably by displaying an amount of activity rare in that land of indolence. Small, brisk, weasel-faced, his sole thought was of his work. No other matters troubled his brain. He never even looked at a paper during the rare hours of idleness passed at his club. His wife, on the contrary, had the reputation of being one of the cleverest and most accomplished women in the town. She was a de Villabon, a fact which invested her with a certain amount of dignity, in spite of her mesalliance. But she was straight-laced to such a point she practiced her religious duties with such bigoted obstinacy that she had, as it were, become shriveled up by the methodical life she led. As for Frederick, he grew up between this busy father and rigid mother. During his schoolboy days he was a dunce of the first water, trembling before his mother, but having such a distaste for work that he would often sit in the drawing-room during the evening, poring for hours over his books without reading a single line, his mind wandering, whilst his parents imagined from the look of him that he was preparing his lessons. Irritated by his laziness, they put him to board at the college, but he then worked less than ever, being less looked after than at home, and delighted to feel that he was no longer under his parents' stern eyes. Accordingly, alarmed by the airs of liberty which he put on, they took him away, in order to have him under their ferule again. So narrowly did they look after him that he was forced to work. His mother examined his exercises, made him repeat his lessons, and mounted guard over him unremittingly like a gendarme. Thanks to this supervision, Friedrich failed but twice in passing the examination for his degree. Aix is celebrated for its law school, and young Rostand was naturally sent to it. In this ancient town, the population is largely composed of barristers, notaries, and solicitors practicing at the appeal court. A youth takes a law degree as a matter of course, following it up, or not, as he pleases. So Friedrich remained at the college, working as little as possible, simply trying to make his parents believe that he was working a great deal. Madame Rostand, to her great sorrow, had been forced to give him more liberty. He now went out when he chose in the daytime, and was only expected to be at home to meals. He had, however, to be in by nine o'clock in the evening, except on those days when he was allowed to go to the theatre. Thus begun that country student's life, so full of vice when it is not entirely devoted to work. A person must know Aix, be acquainted with the quiet grass-grown streets, the state of torpor which enwraps the whole town, in order to understand the purposeless life which the students lead there. Those who work can manage to kill time over their books, but those who refuse to exert themselves steadily 
have no other places where they can while away their leisure save the cafes where people gamble or certain other resorts thus frederick soon became an inveterate gambler he passed the greater part of his evenings at cards and finished them elsewhere when he found his evenings too short for him he managed by stealing a key of the house door to have all night as well in this way his years of probation passed pleasantly enough Friedrich had sense enough to see that he must play the part of a tractable son the hypocrisy of a child curbed by fear had little by little grown upon him his mother now declared herself satisfied he took her to church conducted himself most properly told her with the greatest calmness the most unheard of lies which she took in owing to his air of candor and so clever did he become in this respect that he never allowed himself to be outwitted being always ready with an excuse always prepared in advance with the most extraordinary stories in support of his arguments he paid his gaming debts with money borrowed from his cousins and his pecuniary transactions would have filled a book once after an unhoped-for stroke of good luck he realized the dream of spending a week in paris getting himself invited by a friend who had a little estate near the durants Friedrich was a fine young fellow tall with regular features and a black beard his accomplishments made him good company especially with ladies he was quoted for his good manners those who knew his goings-on smiled a little but as he had the decency to throw a veil over this side of his life he came in for a certain amount of credit for not making an exhibition of his excesses like other students who were the scandal of the town Friedrich was nearly twenty-one and was soon to pass his last examination his father who was still young and not inclined as yet to hand his practice over to him talked of making him enter the magistrature to begin with he had friends in paris to whom he could apply to get him an appointment as public prosecutor's assessor the young man raised no objection for he never openly opposed his parents but a certain expressive smile on his face betokened his firm determination to prolong the pleasant existence which suited him so well he knew that his father was rich that he was his only son so why should he trouble himself in the meantime he smoked his cigar on the promenade gambled in the neighboring cafes and dallied on the sly with various damsels though all this did not prevent him from holding himself at his mother's orders and loading her with attentions at times when he felt out of sorts he went home to the huge gloomy mansion in the rue de college and enjoyed a delicious period of repose the emptiness of the rooms the sense of constraint perceptible on every side seemed to him to possess a soothing influence there he collected himself afresh making his mother believe that he was stopping at home for her sake until the day when health and appetite having returned he devised some fresh escapade in one word he was the best fellow in the world so long as his pleasures were not interfered with every year however nice came to the rostands with her fish and fruit and every year she grew she was of the same age of frederick or to be correct she was just three months older madame rostand would often say to her what a big girl you are growing nice and nice would smile showing her white teeth as a rule frederick was not there but one day during the last year of his probation he was going out when he found nice standing in the hall with her basket he stopped short in astonishment he did not recognize the girl though he had seen her only the year before at la blancarde nice was looking superb with her dark face and her head with its swarthy covering of thick black hair her broad shoulders her supple waist and her magnificent arms of which the bare wrists were exposed in a year she had grown like a young tree you said he in a hesitating voice yes monsieur frederic replied nice looking him in the face with her big eyes in which a somber fire smoldered i've brought some sea urchins when are you coming shall i get the nets ready he was still looking at her and muttering as if he had not heard her speaking how handsome you are nice what is there in you the compliment made her smile then as he took her hands playfully as he had done in the days gone by she became serious and said in a hoarse whisper no no not here take care here comes your mother end of section eleven section twelve of the jolly parisiennes and other novelettes 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Nace the Brunette by Emile Zola. Translated by George D. Cox. Chapter 2 Friedrich and Nace. A fortnight later, the Rostand family started for La Blancarde. The lawyer had to wait for the vacation, and September was a charming month at the seaside. The great heat was past, and the nights were deliciously cool. La Blancarde was not actually in Lestac, a village situated on the extreme outskirts of Marseilles and nestling among the rocks which bound the bay. The house was built on a cliff overlooking the village, and its yellow walls, glistening amongst the pines, could be seen from any part of the bay. It was one of those heavy square buildings pierced with irregular windows and called chateaux in Provence. In front of the house a broad terrace extended, rising almost perpendicularly above the pebbly beach. Behind there was a vast enclosure of poor land, upon which nothing but a few vines, almond or olive trees, would grow. One of the inconveniences, indeed, one of the dangers of La Blancarde, was the fact that the sea was gradually eating away the cliff. Infiltrations proceeding from neighboring springs were constantly at work in this softening mountain of clay and rock, and every year enormous masses fell away, being precipitated with a deafening crash into the sea. The property was becoming smaller and smaller. The pines had already begun to fall. The Miguelines had been settled at La Blancarde for forty years. According to the provincial custom, they cultivated the land and shared the crops with the landlord. These crops were scanty, and they would have died of hunger if during the summer they had not turned their attention to the sea. Between tilling and sowing there came an interval of fishing. The family consisted of Miguelin, a stern old man, with a black and seamy face, before whom the others trembled, of his wife, a tall woman, whose intellect was dulled by hard toil in the blazing sun, of a son who at that time was serving on board the arrogant man-of-war, and of Nace, whom her father, in spite of her numerous tasks at home, sent to work at a tile manufactory. Rarely did the sound of a laugh or a song enliven the tenant's dwelling, a hovel built against one of the sides of La Blancarde. Miguelin, buried in his reflections, preserved a gloomy silence. The two women exhibited towards him that cringing respect which southern wives and daughters always display for the head of the family. It was not often that silence was broken, except by the mother's furious calls, as she stood with her hands on her hips, her throat ready to burst, shouting out the name of Nace whenever her daughter disappeared. Nace heard her a mile away and returned home pale with stifled anger. The handsome Nace, as they called her at Lestac, was by no means happy. At the age of sixteen, Micoulin, on the slightest provocation, would strike her so roughly in the face as to make the blood fly from her nose. And even now, in spite of her twenty years, her bruised shoulders bore the marks of her father's brutality for weeks together. Not that he was cruel. He simply exercised a rigorous rule, insisting on implicit obedience, having in his own blood the old Roman feeling of authority over his own family, the authority of life and death. One day, Nace, on being unmercifully thrashed, dared to raise her hand to defend herself, and her father came near killing her. After a correction of this kind, the girl would throw herself trembling into a dark corner, and with dry eyes brood over the insult. Black rage would hold her there mute for hours together, gloating over revenge which lay beyond her power. It was her father's blood which rose within her, his blind passion, his furious determination to be the master. When she saw her trembling and submissive mother humble herself before Micheline, she looked at her with scorn. She would often say, If I'd a husband like that, I'd kill him. And yet Nace preferred those days when she was beaten, for this violence was a diversion. At other times she led such a dreary, monotonous life that it almost killed her. Her father forbade her to go down to Lestock, keeping her constantly at work at home. Even when she had nothing to do, it was his will that she should stay there beneath his eye. Accordingly, she looked forward impatiently to September, 
for as soon as the family took up their quarters at la blancarde Miguelin's surveillance necessarily became less strict and nais who was wont to run errands for madame rostand was only too glad to make up for her year's imprisonment one day the idea struck old Micheline that this big girl might bring him in a franc or two a day so he emancipated her and sent her to work at a tile manufactory although the labor was severe nais felt delighted she left home early proceeded to the other side of Lestock, and remained until evening in the hot sun turning over the tiles set out to dry sad work it made with her hands but she was freed from her father and she used to joke with the boys here it was in the midst of this rude toil that she filled out and became a handsome woman the blazing sun tinted her face and decked her neck with a ring of amber her black hair grew and enveloped her as if to protect her with its flying tresses her body continually on the move during the progress of her work acquired the supple vigor of a young warrior's frame when she stood upon the beaten ground at her full height amid the ruddy tiles she looked like some amazon like a statue suddenly imbued with life by the rain of fire falling from the sky Micheline glowered on her with his little eyes at seeing her so fair she laughed too much it did not seem to him natural that a girl should be so happy and he swore to himself to throttle all lovers should any ever venture to dangle about her petticoats lovers nais might have had them by the dozen but she gave them no encouragement she tossed her head at all the youths her only friend was a humpback who was employed at the same manufactory as herself a little friend called tuan whom the foundling hospital of aix had sent to Lestock and who had remained there adopted so to say by the district this humpback had a ringing laugh and a comical profile nais found an attraction in his gentleness she did what she liked with him and often tormented him when she felt inclined to take vengeance on some one for her father's violence towards herself all this however had no further consequences people used to make sport of tuan and Michelin himself said she's welcome to tuan i know her she's too proud that year when madame rostand came to la blancarde she asked Michelin to lend her nice one of her servants being ill work was slack just then at the manufactory and moreover Michelin, although brutal enough towards his own family was politeness itself with his masters he would not have refused even if the request had been against his wishes monsieur rostand had just then been forced to go to paris on sudden and important business and frederic was left alone with his mother as a rule on his arrival the young man was mad after outdoor exercise and intoxicated by the seaside air he would go with Micheline to set or draw up the nets or take long walks with nais in the gorges which abound in the neighborhood of Lestock. then his ardor cooled down and he remained for whole days lying under the pines on the edge of the terrace half asleep and gazing at the sea of which the monotonous azure finally palled upon him as a rule he had had enough of la blancarde at the end of a fortnight and was wont to invent some excuse to slip off to marseilles that year on the day after their arrival Micheline called frederic at sunrise he was going to take up the traps the long baskets with a narrow opening in which deep water fishes are caught but the young man turned a deaf ear to him fishing appeared to have lost its attraction for when he got up he threw himself on his back under the pines and fixed his eyes on the sky his mother was astonished not to see him set off for one of the long walks from which he usually returned as hungry as a wolf you are not going out she asked no mother he replied i shall stop with you as father is not here Micheline, who heard this muttered in his dialect it won't be long before monsieur frederic's off to marseilles but frederic did not go to marseilles the week passed by and found him still stretched on his back simply changing his position whenever the sun's rays fell on him for appearance sake he had taken a book but it was little he read the greater part of the time the book remained lying on the dry pine spikes the young man did not even look at the sea with his face turned towards the house he appeared to be interested in the domestic arrangements in watching the servants go backwards and forwards crossing the terrace at every moment and whenever it was nais who happened to pass him a flash shot from his delighted eyes but nais although she would slacken her pace and move off with the rhythmical sway of her body never cast a look behind her 
For several days this comedy went on. In his mother's presence, Friedrich treated Nais almost roughly, as if she had been some awkward servant. Then the young girl would cast her eyes down in pleased bashfulness, as if enjoying the harsh words. One morning at breakfast she broke a salad bowl, and Friedrich flew into a rage. "'How clumsy she is!' he cried. "'Wherever is her head?' and he jumped up furiously, saying that his trousers were spoiled. A drop of oil had stained his knee and sufficed to make him raise the house. "'What are you staring at? Give me a napkin and some water. Come and help me,' he said to the girl. Nais dipped the corner of a napkin in some water and went down on her knees in front of Friedrich to rub the spot. "'Don't bother,' said Madame Rostand. "'That will do no good.' But the girl did not let go of her master's leg, which she continued to rub with all the strength of her shapely arms, whilst he continued to scold her. I never saw such clumsiness. She must have brought it close to me on purpose to smash it. If she waited on us at Aix, our china would soon be all in pieces, he grumbled. These reproaches were so out of proportion to the gravity of the offence that Madame Rostand thought it proper to try and appease her son as soon as Nace had gone. What have you against the poor girl? One would think you could not endure her. Be more gentle with her. She is an old playmate of yours, and she is not in the position of an ordinary servant here. Oh, she's a nuisance, replied Friedrich, affecting a rough manner. That evening at dusk, however, Nais and Friedrich met in a shady spot at the end of the terrace. They had not yet spoken to one another alone. No one could hear them from the house. The pines filled the still air with a warm, resinous odor. Then Nace asked in a whisper, in the familiar way of their childhood, "'Why did you scold me so, Friedrich? You were unkind.' Without replying, he seized her hands, drew her to his breast, and kissed her lips. She let him have his way, and then went off, whilst he sat down on the parapet, in order not to appear before his mother in his present excited state. Ten minutes afterwards, the girl was waiting at table with her perfect and somewhat proud calmness. Friedrich and Nais made no appointments. Late one evening they found themselves together under an olive tree near the edge of the cliff. During dinner their eyes had several times exchanged ardent glances. Then Nais had gone home, and Friedrich had begun to roam about, possessed by a strange feeling. And indeed, when after a while he came to the old olive tree, he found her there as if waiting for him. He sat down by her side and put his arm around her waist whilst she let her head fall upon his shoulder. For a moment they remained silent. The old olive tree, with its gnarled limbs, covered them with a roof of grey leaves. Before them stretched the sea, motionless beneath the twinkling stars. Marseilles, on the far side of the bay, was hidden by a cloud. On the left, the revolving planier light shone out every minute, piercing the gloom with a yellow ray which suddenly disappeared and nothing could be softer or more tender than this light, constantly lost on the horizon, and constantly returning. "'Is your father away?' asked Friedrich. "'I got out of the window,' she said in her quiet voice. They spoke no word of their love. That love came from afar, from the days of their infancy. Now they remembered their childish romps, and it seemed natural to them to glide into caresses. Day was about to appear when they sought their rooms again." End of section 12section 13 of the jolly parisiennes and other novelettes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by k hand nace the brunette by emile zola Translated by George D. Cox. Chapter 3. Discovered. What a glorious month it was! Not one day of rain. The sky, invariably blue, displayed a satin sheen unflecked by any cloud. The sun rose a ruddy crystal and sank in a cloud of golden dust. Yet it was not hot, for the sea breeze came with the sun, and though it died away when he set, the nights were deliciously cool and balmy with the scent of aromatic plants diffusing the sweetness gathered during the day. The country is splendid. From the two sides of the bay rocky arms jut out, whilst in the distance the islands seemed to bound the horizon. 
in fine weather the sea appears to be nothing but a vast basin a lake of an intense blue in the distance at the foot of the mountains the houses of marseilles climb up the low hills when the atmosphere is clear one can see from Lestock the gray joliette pier and the slender masts of the vessels in the port beyond houses peep out from amongst the clumps of trees and the chapel of notre dame de la garde glitters white against the sky the coastline winds about and takes broad sweeps before reaching Lestock where manufactories throw out intermittent clouds of smoke. When the sun sinks below the horizon, the sea, almost black, seems as if asleep between two rocky promontories, whose whiteness is relieved by their tinges of yellow and brown, and the pines show their dark green foliage against the reddish soil beyond. It is a vast tableau, a glimpse of the east, disappearing with the dazzling heat of day. But Lestock has other sights besides the sea. The village, clinging to the mountainside, is traversed by roads which wind through a chaos of shattered rocks. The railway between Marseilles and Lyon passes amid these masses, crosses bridges thrown over ravines, and plunges under cliffs themselves, remaining there for some four miles in what is called the Tunnel of La Nerte, the longest one in France. Nothing can equal the savage grandeur of these gorges hollowed out amongst the hills, these narrow paths winding along at the foot of precipices, these barren mountains planted with pines, uprearing their ramparts tinged with rust and blood. Now and then a defile widens out, a field of struggling olive trees fills the hollow of a valley, a lonely house shows its white frontage and closed shutters. Then come other rugged paths, impenetrable thickets, overturned rocks, dried up torrents all the surprises of a desert march over all above the black fringe of pines the sky stretches its expanse of silky blue then there is the narrow line of coast between the rocks and the sea the red soil pitted with immense holes from which is taken the clay for tile making the chief industry of the district everywhere the ground is cracked and sundered supporting with difficulty a few sickly trees and seemingly parched by a breath of burning passion the roads are like beds of plaster in which the traveller sinks to the angles at every step and flying clouds of dust powder the hedges at the least puff of wind little gray lizards sleep along the heated walls which reverberate like ovens whilst from the scorched grass rise whirring clouds of locusts in the still and heavy air of the sleepy south there was no other sign of life than the grasshopper's monotonous song it was in this land of fire that Nais and Friedrich loved one another during a month. It was as if all the heat of the sky had entered their veins. For the first week they were satisfied with their nightly meetings under the same olive tree on the edge of the cliff. There they tasted untold bliss. The cool night soothed their fever. They held their burning cheeks and hands to the passing breeze, refreshing as a mountain spring. The sea broke with its slow and voluptuous dirge over the rocks at their feet the penetrating odor of seaweed intoxicated them then leaning on one another's arms overcome by delicious weariness they watched across the bay the lights of marseilles tinging the water at the mouth of the port with a reflection as of blood the twinkling gas lights outlining the streets in many a graceful curve while in the midst of all above the town it seemed as if there were a mass of sparkling flame the garden on the colline bonaparte was plainly distinguishable by a double row of lights mounting heavenwards. These innumerable lights above the bosom of the slumbering bay appeared to be illuminating some fairy town which the dawn would presently sweep away. And the sky, stretched over the black chaos of the horizon, also had its charm for them, a charm which alarmed and made them cling closer to one another. A rain of stars fell. On those clear provincial nights the constellations resembled living flames. Shuddering beneath the vast space, they bowed their heads, turning their gaze on the solitary flicker of the Planier lighthouse, whose dancing scintillation stirred them, whilst their lips met again in a caress. But one night their eyes fell on the gigantic disk of the moon, glaring upon them with her yellow face. On the sea a train of fire glittered, as if some enormous fish, some serpent from the depths were trailing its endless folds of golden scales and then a half-light obscured the glitter of marseilles and bathed the outlines of the gulf 
as the moon rose the light increased the shadows became more sharply defined this heavenly witness was unwelcome to them they feared they might be surprised if they remained so near la blancarde when they next met they left the grounds and walked into the shadowy open country they found a meeting place in the, a deserted tile field the ruined shed concealed a pit in which two ovens remained still open but this hovel saddened them they preferred to have the open sky above their heads they explored the red clay pits and discovered delightful nooks perfect little deserts whence they could hear nothing but the barking of watchdogs they prolonged their walks wandering along the rocky coast in the direction of nilon following the course of the narrow gorges in search of distant grottoes and crevasses for a fortnight their nights were one round of joy and love the moon had disappeared the sky had become dark again but now it seemed to them as if la blancarde was too small to hold them as if they needed the limitless expanse beyond one night as they were following a path above lestoc in order to gain the gorges of lanarte they fancied they heard a muffled step keeping pace with theirs behind a plantation of pines stretching by the side of the road they stopped in alarm did you hear that asked frederick yes some stray dog whispered nace and they continued on their way but at the first bend in the road after leaving the pines they distinctly saw a dark object glide behind the rocks it was certainly a human being curiously shaped looking indeed as if it were humpbacked nace uttered a slight exclamation wait here she said quickly and then she darted in pursuit of the shadow presently frederick heard the sound of a rapid whispering she returned composed but rather pale what is it he asked nothing she replied then after a moment's silence she continued if you hear any steps don't be alarmed it's tuan you know the humpback he wants to keep watch over us and in fact frederick was occasionally conscious of someone following them in the darkness it was as if a protecting arm were stretched over them more than once nace tried to drive tuan away but the poor fellow merely asked to be her dog he would not be seen he would not be heard why should he not be allowed to do as he pleased from that time forward if the lovers had listened between their caresses in the ruined tile sheds in the deserted quarries in the depths of the lonely gorges they would have caught the sound of smothered sobs behind them it was tuan their watchdog weeping in his horny hands but at last the nights no longer sufficed them they grew emboldened and took advantage of every opportunity often in a corridor at la blancarde in a room where they chanced to meet they exchanged a long caress even at a table when she was waiting and he asked for a plate or some bread he found means to clasp her hand madame rostand who saw nothing still blamed her son for being too severe towards his old playmate one day she almost surprised them but nace hearing the rustle of her dress quickly knelt down and began wiping with her handkerchief her young master's feet which were white with the dust nace and frederick had yet a thousand little joys after dinner when the evening was cool madame rostand often liked to go for a walk she then took her son's arm and went down to lestoc telling nace to bring her shawl as a measure of precaution they went all three of them to see the sardine fishers come in out at sea the lanterns danced and soon the dark outlines of the boats could be seen nearing the beach amid the muffled sound of the oars on good days joyous voices would ring out and the women would hurry down laden with baskets while the three men who manned each boat set to work to empty the net which as it lay under the thwarts looked like a broad dark ribbon dotted with flashes of silver the sardines hanging by the gills to the meshes still struggled and threw out a metallic luster then they fell into the baskets like a shower of silver pieces amid the pale light of the lanterns madame rostand would often stand near a boat interested by the sight and leave her son's arm to talk to the fishermen whilst frederick standing at nace's side outside the radius of light clasped the girl's hands in a burst of passion meantime old micoline preserved his stubborn silence he went out fishing and came home to do a day's work with always the same deep look on his face but for some time past his little gray eyes had worn an uneasy expression he threw side glances at nace without saying a word she seemed to him changed there was something about her that he could not quite understand 
One day she ventured to argue with him, and then he gave her a blow which cut her lip. That evening, when Friedrich saw her mouth swollen, he questioned her anxiously. "'It's nothing. Only a blow my father gave me,' she said. Her tone was gloomy. Then the young man became angry and declared that he would see into it. "'No, never mind,' she said. "'It's my business. There'll soon be an end to it.' She never told him of the beatings which she received. Only on the days when her father had treated her cruelly, she caressed her lover with more ardor, as if to avenge herself on the old man. For three weeks, Nice had left the house almost every night. At first she had taken the most minute precautions, then rashness seized hold of her, and she ventured upon everything. However, when she saw that her father suspected something, her prudence returned. She missed two appointments. Her mother had told her that Miguelin did not sleep at night. He got up and went from one door to another. But on the third day, seeing Friedrich's supplicating look, the girl once more forgot all prudence. She went out at about eleven o'clock, promising herself she would not stay away more than an hour, and she was in hopes that her father, being in his first sleep, would not hear her. Friedrich was waiting for her under the olive trees. Without telling her fears, she refused to go further away. They sat down in their usual place, looking at the sea and the glow of Marseilles. The plenier light was beaming. As Nace watched it, she fell asleep on Friedrich's shoulder. He did not move, and gradually yielding to fatigue himself, his own eyes closed. No sound, only the chirp of the grasshopper. The sea slept like the lovers. But suddenly a dark form issued from the shadows and approached them. It was Micheline who, awakened by the creaking of a window, had missed Nace from her room. He had left the house, taking a small hatchet with him. When he saw a dark mass under the olive tree, he grasped the handle of the implement. But the children did not stir. He was able to walk up to them, bend down, and look in their faces. A slight exclamation escaped him as he recognized his young master. No, no, he could not kill him thus. The blood spilled on the ground would leave traces behind it and would cost him too dear. He stood upright, while a look of savage determination came over his tanned face. A peasant does not openly murder his master, for the master, even when he lies under the ground, is always the stronger. And so Micheline shook his head and went off with stealthy strides, leaving the lovers asleep. When Nais returned to her room shortly before daybreak, much alarmed at having stayed away so long, she found her window just as she had left it. At breakfast, Micheline calmly watched her eating her piece of bread. She felt safe. Her father knew nothing. End of section 13、section、14 of The Jolly Parisiennes and Other Novelettes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Nais the Brunette by Emile Zola. Translated by George D. Cox. Chapter 4 Murderous Attempts. Aren't you coming out fishing any more, Monsieur Frederic? asked Micheline one evening. Madame Rostand was sitting on the terrace in the shade of the pines, embroidering a handkerchief, whilst her son, lying at her feet, was amusing himself by throwing pebbles. Not I, replied the young man. I'm getting lazy. You are wrong, continued Micheline. The traps were full of fish yesterday. You can catch as many as you like just now. You'd like it. Come with me to morrow morning. He said this so good humoredly that Frederick, who thought of Nace and did not want to fall out with the father, finally exclaimed, Very well, then, but you'll have to call me. I shall be sleeping like a log at five o'clock. Madame Rostand, rather uneasy, had ceased working. Mind you are careful, she said. I am always anxious when you are at sea. Next morning, Micheline shouted to Friedrich in vain. The young man's window remained closed. Upon this, he said to his daughter, in a voice of which she did not notice the savage irony, You go. He'll hear you, perhaps. Thus it was Nace who woke Friedrich that morning. Ten minutes later, the young man appeared, clad from head to foot in gray canvas. Old Micheline was sitting on the parapet of the terrace, patiently waiting for him. It's cool. You better take a wrapper, he said. Nace went to fetch one, after which the two men went down the steep steps which led to the sea, whilst the young girl, standing above, followed them with her eyes. 
At the bottom, old Micheline raised his head and looked at Nace. There were two deep wrinkles at the corners of his mouth. For the last five days, the northeast wind, the mistral, had been blowing. On the previous day it had fallen at evening, but when the sun rose it got up again, gently at first. At this early hour the sea, lashed by the sudden gusts, was of a deep, mottled blue, and the white crested waves, illuminated by the first slanting rays, chased one another over the bosom of the deep. The sky was almost white and clear as crystal. In the distance Marseilles stood out with a distinctness which enabled one to count the windows in the fronts of the houses whilst the rocks in the gulf were bathed in a delicate rose-colored haze. "'We shall have our work cut out to get back again,' said Frederick. "'Very likely,' replied Micheline, simply. He plied his oars silently, without turning his head. The young man looked for a moment at his rounded back, noting his sunburnt neck and his two red ears, from which little rings of gold were hanging. Then he leaned over the side of the boat, gazing into the depths. The sea became rougher, and great shadowy weeds floated by, looking like tufts of the hair of some drowned man. This saddened and even alarmed Frederick a little. "'I say, Micheline,' he said, after a long silence, "'the wind's getting stronger. Be careful, you know I swim like a lump of lead.' "'Yes, yes, I know,' replied the old man in a dry voice. Still he continued rowing with a mechanical motion. The boat began to pitch, the white foam on the crests of the waves turned into clouds of spray, which flew before the wind. Friedrich did not want to exhibit his alarm, but he felt very uncomfortable and would have given a great deal to be on land again. At last he grew angry and cried out, "'Where, the devil, have you stuck your traps? Are we bound for Algiers?' But old Micheline, without seeming to trouble himself, again replied, "'We're all right, we're all right.' All at once he let go the oars, stood up in the boat, and looked towards the shore, as if for certain guiding marks. There was still five minutes rowing to be accomplished before they came into the midst of the cork buoys which showed where the traps were placed. Then, while Micheline was in the act of drawing up the baskets, he remained for a few seconds with his face turned toward La Blancarde. Friedrich, following the direction of his eyes, distinctly saw a white form under the pines. It was Nays still leaning on the parapet, and distinguishable from her light dress. "'How many traps have you?' asked Friedrich. Thirty-five, and we mustn't stop here any longer than we can help,' said Micheline. He laid hold of the buoy nearest to him and drew the first basket in. The depth was enormous. There was no end to the rope. At last the trap appeared with the large stone which had kept it at the bottom, and as soon as it left the water three fish began to leap about like birds in a cage. It seemed as if one could hear the beating of wings. In the second basket there was nothing. But in the third was found a somewhat rare capture, a small lobster which flourished its tail violently. Friedrich was all attention now, forgetting his fears, leaning over the side of the boat and awaiting the baskets with beating heart. When he heard the sound of wings, he felt like a hunter who has just brought down his game. One by one, however, all the baskets were drawn into the boat, the water streaming around, and soon the whole thirty-five were secured. There were at least fifteen pounds of fish, a splendid catch, for the Gulf of Marseilles, which, from several causes, especially on account of the extremely fine nets which are used, has been yielding much less fish for many years past. "'That's the lot,' said Micheline. "'Now we can make for home.' He had carefully arranged his baskets in the stern, but when Frederick saw him prepare to set the sail, he remarked that with such a wind blowing it would be more prudent to confine themselves to rowing. The old man shrugged his shoulders. He knew what he was about, and before hoisting the sail he cast a last look towards La Blancarde. Nace's white dress was still there. Then came the catastrophe, as sudden as a thunderbolt. Afterwards, when Frederick tried to think over what had happened, he remembered that all at once a gust had caught the sail, and that then all had overturned. He could not call anything further to mind, only a feeling of intense cold and bitter agony. He owed his life to a miracle. He had fallen on the sail which kept him afloat. Some fishermen, having seen the accident, hastened to his help and picked him up, as well as old Micheline, who was already swimming towards the shore. Madame Rostand was still asleep, and they concealed from her the danger which her son had incurred. At the foot of the terrace, Frederick and Micheline, dripping with water, found Nais, who had witnessed the scene. "'Devil take it!' cried the old man. "'We'd taken up all the traps and were coming home. Bad luck to it all!' 
Nais, who was deadly pale, looked fixedly at her father. Yes, she muttered, it's bad luck. But when you sail in a wind like that, you know what to expect. Micheline flew into a rage. What's that to do with you, lazy bones? Can't you see Monsieur Frederic shivering? Help me to get him home. The young man got off with a day in bed, telling his mother that he had a headache. The next day he found Nais very dispirited. She refused to meet him out of doors again, though one evening, in the passage, she took him in her arms and kissed him passionately. She never told him of her suspicions, but from that day forward she watched over him. Then, at the end of a week, her fears began to diminish. Her father went about as usual. He even seemed kinder, and beat her less often. Every year the Rostans used to go to eat a bouillabaisse in a hollow of the rocks on the shore in the direction of Niolon. Afterwards, as partridges abounded amongst the hills, the gentlemen would organize a shooting party. That year, Madame Rostand wanted to take Nace to wait on them, and refused to listen to Micheline's remarks when the old savage wanted to raise some objection. They set out early. The morning was a charming one. Lying like a mirror beneath the gleaming sun, the sea displayed its blue expanse. Ripples appeared amid the currents, and the blue was tinged with violet, whilst in the stagnant spots the azure faded away into a milky transparency. You might have imagined the sea to be an immense piece of unfolded satin, with changing colors growing more and more indistinct as the limpid horizon was gained. Over this slumbering lake the boat glided very softly. The narrow beach on which they landed was at the mouth of a gorge, and they settled down on the strip of scorched grass which was to serve as a table. How enjoyable this open-air picnic was! First of all, Micheline set off alone in the boat to take up the baskets which he had set the day before. When he came back, Nais had gathered some thyme and lavender and enough dry wood to make a large fire. That day the old man was to make the bouillabaisse, the classic fish soup, the secret of which the coast fishermen transmit from father to son. And a terrible bouillabaisse it was, with its strong doses of pepper and odor of crushed garlic. The Rostans were greatly interested in the preparation of the mess. Micheline, said Madame Rostand, do you think you will be as successful as last year? The old man seemed to be in excellent spirits. First of all, he washed the fish in sea water, whilst Nace took the large pan out of the boat. Soon all was in progress. The fish at the bottom of the vessel, just covered with some water, with some onion, oil, garlic, a handful of pepper, and a tomato. Then the whole was placed on the fire, a formidable fire, large enough to roast a sheep. Fishermen say that the goodness of bouillabaisse lies in the cooking. The pan must disappear amid the flames. Micheline gravely cut some slices of bread into a salad bowl, and at the end of half an hour he poured the liqueur on the slices, serving up the fish separately. "'Come along,' he said. "'It's not good unless it's hot.' Then the bouillabaisse was eaten with the usual jokes. "'I say, Micheline, did you put any gunpowder in it?' "'It's very good, but it wants a throat of brass to swallow it.' Micheline devoured his share tranquilly, swallowing a slice of bread at each mouthful, and showing at the same time how flattered he felt at eating with his masters. Having finished, they sat there waiting for the heat of the day to pass off. The glistening rocks covered with ruddy streaks threw grateful shadows around. Clumps of evergreen oaks showed their somber foliage, whilst on the slopes the rows of pines ascended in regular lines, looking like little soldiers on the march. An oppressive silence filled the quivering air. Madame Rostand had brought the eternal embroidery, which was never seen to leave her hands. Nais, seated at her side, seemed interested in the movements of her needle, but her eyes were really on her father. He was lying on his back a few paces away, enjoying a siesta. Then, further still, Friedrich also was sleeping beneath the protecting shade of his broad-brimmed straw hat. At about four o'clock they awoke, and Micheline said that he knew of a covey of partridges at the bottom of the ravine. He had seen them three days previously, so Friedrich allowed himself to be tempted, and they both took their guns. "'Pray be careful,' said Madame Rostand. "'You might slip and hurt yourself.' "'Yes, that does happen sometimes,' said Micheline quietly. Then they went off, and as they disappeared behind the rocks, Nais jumped up and followed them at a distance, muttering, "'I'm going to see.' Instead of keeping to the pathway at the bottom of the gorge, she turned to the left among the bushes, hurrying along and avoiding the loose stones for fear of setting them rolling. 
At length, at a bend of the road, she espied Friedrich, who had no doubt put the partridges up, for he was walking quickly, bending slightly, and ready to lift the gun to his shoulder. As yet she saw nothing of her father, but presently she discovered him on the same slope as herself. He was crouching down, looking towards the gorge, and he seemed to be waiting for something. Twice he raised his gun. Supposing the partridges flew between the two sportsmen, Micheline and and Friedrich might shoot one another. Nais, gliding from bush to bush, had anxiously taken up her position behind the old man. Some minutes passed. On the other side, Friedrich had disappeared in a dip in the ground, but finally he reappeared and remained for an instant motionless. Then Micheline, still crouching down, took a long aim at the young man. But with a kick, Nace knocked the barrel of his gun upward, and the charge exploded in the air with a fearful report which brought down all the echoes. The old man sprang to his feet. Seeing Nace, he seized the gun by its smoking barrel, as if he meant to dash her to the ground with one blow. But the young girl stood her ground, her cheeks as white as death, her eyes darting fire. He dared not strike her, and trembling with rage, he could only stammer out in dialect, I'll kill him, never you fear. At the report of the gun, the partridges had flown off, Frederick winging two of them. At about six o'clock, the Rostans returned to La Blancarde, old Micheline rowing with his accustomed air of sullen, stubborn brutishness. End of section 14《Section 15 of the Jolly Parisiennes and Other Novelettes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Nace the Brunette by Emile Zola. Translated by George D. Cox. Chapter 5 The Land Slip. September was drawing to an end. After a violent storm, the air had become very cool. The days grew shorter, and Nais refused to meet Friedrich at night-time, excusing herself on the ground that she was too tired, and that they would catch cold in the heavy dews which saturated the ground. Still, as she came to the house every morning at six o'clock, and Madame Rostand did not get up till three hours later, the lovers were able to meet and exchange their kisses. It was at this period that Nais showed the greatest affection for Friedrich. She would take hold of his neck, draw his face towards hers, and look into it with a passion which filled her eyes with tears. It was as if she feared she might see him no more. Then she showered kisses upon him as if to protest and swear that she would guard him. "'What is the matter with Nace?' Madame Rostand would often remark. "'She changes every day.' And indeed she was becoming thinner and her cheeks more hollow. The fire in her eyes was dying away. She often remained for a long while, silent, rousing herself with a start, and the alarmed look of a girl awakening from a dream. "'You are ill, my child. You must take care of yourself,' repeated her mistress. Then Nace would smile and answer, "'Oh, no, madame. I'm quite well and happy. I've never been so happy.' One morning, as she was helping to count the linen, she ventured to ask a question. "'Are you going to stop late at La Blancarde this year?' "'Till the end of November.' replied Madame Rostand. Nais stood still for a moment with her eyes fixed, then she unconsciously said aloud, Twenty days more. A continual struggle was taking place within her. She wished to keep Frederick with her, and yet at the same time she was constantly tempted to cry out, Go! He was lost to her. Never would that season of love return. She had told herself so from their first meeting. During one night of gloomy despair, she had even gone so far as to wonder whether she ought not to allow her father to kill Friedrich, so that he might never love another, but the idea of seeing him dead, he so delicate, so fair, more like a girl than herself, was insupportable to her, and the evil thought filled her with horror. No, she would save him, and he should never know of it. He might love her no longer, but she would be happy in the thought that he still lived. She would often say to him, don't go to sea today, the weather will be rough. At other times she pressed him to leave La Blancarde. You must be sick of being here. You won't love me any longer. Go to town for a few days. These changes of humor surprised him. He thought her less handsome now that her face had become drawn, and besides, satiety had come. He pined for the eau de cologne and the rice powder of the Aix and Marseille beauties. 
the old man's words were constantly ringing in Nace's ears i'll kill him i'll kill him in the middle of the night she would wake up dreaming of shots being fired she became timid and uttered a cry when a stone rolled away from under her feet whenever frederick was out of her sight she would worry about him and what terrified her most was that from morning to night she still seemed to hear micoline repeating i'll kill him the old man in his stubborn silence never made any allusion to what had passed not a word not a gesture but for her his every look his every movement implied that he would kill his young master at the first opportunity he had of doing so without being disturbed afterwards he would deal with nace in the meantime he kicked her about like some disobedient dog does your father still use you badly asked frederick of nace one morning yes she replied he's going mad and after showing him her arms black with bruises she muttered these words which she often whispered to herself it'll soon be over it'll soon be over at the beginning of october she became more gloomy than ever she was absent-minded and one could see her lips move as if she were talking to herself frederick saw her several times standing on the cliff seemingly examining the trees around her and measuring the depths of the abyss a few days later he discovered her with twan the humpback plucking figs on the furthest part of the estate twan used to come and help her whenever she had too much to do he was under the fig tree and nace who had mounted on a thick branch was joking with him calling to him to open his mouth and then throwing down some figs which burst on his face the poor fellow opened his mouth as he was bidden and closed his eyes in ecstasy whilst his huge face expressed complete beatitude frederick was certainly not jealous but he could not refrain from taking nace to task twan would cut off his hand for us she said curtly we mustn't ill-treat him he may be useful later on the humpback continued coming to la blancarde every day he worked on the cliff cutting a narrow canal to bring some water to the end of an experimental kitchen garden nace used to go and watch him and lively talk would ensue between them he was so long over the task that old micheline finally called him a lazybones and kicked his legs as he would have done to his daughters for two days the rain fell frederick who had to return to aix the following week determined that before leaving he would go out fishing again with micheline seeing nace turn pale he laughed and said that he should not choose a day when the mistral was blowing then as he was so soon to go away the young girl consented to meet him once more at night about one o'clock they met on the terrace the rain had cleansed the soil and a strong scent arose from the freshened vegetation when this parched country is thoroughly soaked all its colors and odors become exaggerated as it were the red earth looks like blood the pines are of an emerald green the rocks of the whiteness of freshly washed linen but that night all the lovers could detect was the enchanted scent of the thyme and lavender old associations led them to the olive trees frederick was walking towards the one which had sheltered their first love meeting it stood quite at the edge of the abyss when nace as if aroused from a reverie seized his arm dragged him from the edge and said trembling no no not there why what is the matter he asked she hesitated and finally said that after such a fall of rain the cliff was not safe and she added last winter there was a landslip here they sat down further back under another olive tree at last nace convulsively burst into tears and would not say why she was crying then a cold silence took possession of her and when frederick joked her about her sadness and apathy in his company she murmured no don't say that i love you too much but i'm not well and besides it's all over you're going away he vainly tried to comfort her telling her that he would come again from time to time and that next autumn they would have two months before them again she shook her head she knew very well that wall was over now their meeting ended in embarrassing silence they gazed at the sea marseilles was glittering with gas lamps the planier lighthouse displayed its solitary mournful gleam gradually the vast horizon imparted some of its melancholy to them at three o'clock when frederick left nace kissing her lips he felt her shudder he could not sleep that night he read till dawn and then feeling feverish he took up his position at the window just at that moment micheline was starting off to take up his traps as the old man passed along the terrace he raised his head and asked frederick if he was coming that morning 
No, replied Friedrich, I've slept too badly. Tomorrow. The old fellow went off with a slouching gait. He had to go down to his boat at the foot of the cliff just under the olive tree, where he had surprised his daughter. When he had disappeared, Friedrich, on turning his head, was astonished to see Twine already at work. The humpback was standing near the olive tree with a pickaxe in his hand, repairing the narrow channel which the rain had damaged. The air was cool, it was pleasant at the window. Friedrich went to make a cigarette, and as he lounged back to the casement, a terrible crash, a roll of thunder, was suddenly heard. He rushed to the window. It was a land slip. He could only distinguish Tuan, who was running for his life, flourishing his pickaxe amid a cloud of red dust. At the edge of the abyss, the old olive tree with its gnarled branches had been pitched forward, crashing into the sea. A cloud of spray flew up, while a terrible cry rent the air. Then Friedrich saw Nais leaning over the parapet, her stiffened arms clutching at the stonework, while her eyes peered into the depths below. There she stood, motionless and expectant, with her hands, as it were, fixed to the low wall. Still, she no doubt realized that someone was looking at her, for she turned her head, saw Friedrich, and cried, My father! My father! An hour afterwards they found Micoline's mutilated body under the stones. Tuan, nearly crazy, related how he had almost been carried away, and everyone declared that it was wrong to carry a stream along the top of the cliff, on account of the infiltrations. The old wife wept a great deal. As for Nais, she followed her father to the cemetery with tearless eyes. On the day after the catastrophe, Madame Rostand had insisted upon returning to Aix. Frederick was very much pleased to leave, on seeing his tranquillity disturbed by this terrible drama, and moreover, in his opinion, peasant girls were not equal to their town-bred sisters. He resumed his old mode of life. His mother, touched by his attentiveness to her at La Blancarde, gave him more liberty, so that he passed a charming winter. He engaged a furnished room in the town, where he could do as he listed, and he slept from home, only returning to the vast, frigid mansion in the Rue des Collages, when his presence was indispensable. He fondly hoped that his existence would always continue to glide thus smoothly away. Monsieur Rostand had to go to La Blancarde at Easter, and wished his son to accompany him, but Friedrich made some excuse. When the lawyer came back, he said the next morning at breakfast, Oh, by the way, Nace is going to be married. Never, cried Friedrich in amazement. And you'd never guess to whom, continued Monsieur Rostand. She gave me such good reasons, however. The fact was, Nace was marrying Tuan. In that way, nothing would be changed at La Blancarde. Tuan would still manage the property, as he had done since Micheline's death. The young man listened with an awkward smile. Presently he gave it as his opinion that the arrangement was the best for everybody concerned. Nace has grown very old and plain, continued Monsieur Rostand. I didn't know her again. It's an astonishing thing how quickly girls age on the coast. And she used to be very pretty, too. Yes, a feast of sunlight, said Friedrich composedly, and then he quietly went on eating his cutlet. End of section 15《Section 15 》《Section 16 of the Jolly Parisiennes and Other Novelettes》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana.《Madame Chabre by Emile Zola Translated by George D. Cox Chapter 1. Hector Monsieur Chabre's great grief was that he had no children. He had married Mademoiselle Catineau, the daughter of the senior partner in the firm of De Vigne and Catineau, the fair Estelle, a tall, handsome girl of eighteen, and for the last four years he had been waiting for a son and heir. Monsieur Chabre was a retired grain merchant and was the possessor of a large fortune. Although he had led the chaste life of a citizen who is absorbed in the one idea of becoming a millionaire, he had, at the age of forty-five, the gait of an old man. 
his pallid face worn by pecuniary cares was as dull and expressionless as a paving stone and he was in despair for a man who has made an income of fifty thousand francs has certainly the right to worry over the fact that he is childless pretty madame chabre was at that time two and twenty she was an adorable creature with a complexion reminding one of a ripe peach and with fair hair floating about her shoulders her greenish-blue eyes resembled a sheet of still water beneath which it be difficult to distinguish anything among their friends madame chabre was looked upon as a woman of perfect education incapable of furnishing any cause for scandal fairly religious and brought up by a strict mother in the observance of the best principles but the delicate nostrils of her little white nose would sometimes quiver in a way which would have alarmed any other husband than a retired grain merchant however the family doctor monsieur guirot an acute and good-tempered man had had several private conversations with monsieur chavre and finally seeing that his patient was in an ailing state he advised him to take sea baths to go to the coast for a few weeks breathe the air from the briny deep and eat plenty of shellfish which so the doctor declared were extremely nutritious and the very kind of food that monsieur chavre needed then just as he was going away he added carelessly don't go and bury yourselves in some out-of-the-way nook madame chavre is young and once amusing go to trouville the air is very good there three days later the chavres started but the retired grain merchant had concluded that it would be folly to go to trouville where he would have to spend no end of money any place is good enough for a man to eat shellfish in more than that in a quiet place shellfish would be more plentiful and less costly as for amusement there would always be enough and to spare of that they were not going on a pleasure trip but simply for the benefit of his monsieur chavre's health a friend had recommended to monsieur chabre the little town of pouligan near saint nazire in la vendee madame chabre after a twelve-hour journey was bored to death during the day which they had spent at saint nazire that budding town with its new streets all straight and prim and still full of half-built houses they went to look at the harbour they wandered about the streets in which the shops were halfway between the dark-coloured groceries of villages and the luxurious emporiums of real towns at pouligan there was not a chalet to let the little houses of boards and plaster which surrounded the bay looking like the bedaubed shanties of a fair were already invaded by english visitors and rich tradesmen from nantes moreover estelle turned up her nose at the style of architecture in which the provincial builders had given full scope to their imagination the travellers were advised to go and sleep at garande it was sunday when they arrived there at about midday monsieur chavre was startled although he was not of a poetic temperament the sight of garande of this well-preserved feudal gem with its fortified enceinte and its deep-set gates surrounded by machicolations astonished him estelle looked at the silent town surrounded by great trees and promenades and a smile flashed from her quiet eyes but the vehicle rolled on the horse passed under a gateway at a trot and the wheels jolted over the rough stones of the narrow streets the chavres had not exchanged a word a regular hole at last muttered the grain merchant the villages about paris are much better built as the couple got out of the vehicle in front of the hotel de commerce which is situated in the middle of the town near the church the people were just coming from mass whilst her husband was seeing to the luggage estelle took a short walk being much interested in this procession of the devout a large number of whom wore very strange costumes there in white blouse and baggy trousers were the denizens of the salt marshes which stretch between guerande and le croisic then there were the petty farmers a totally distinct class wearing short cloth jackets and broad-brimmed hats but estelle was especially charmed by the rich costume of a young girl whose cap fitted close to her head and terminated in a point to the body of her red dress there was affixed a breastplate of bright-coloured brocaded silk 
a sash adorned with gold and silver embroidery was bound round her three superposed skirts which were of blue cloth with small tucks whilst a long apron of orange silk fell in front of her leaving uncovered her red woollen stockings and her feet clad in little yellow slippers well said monsieur chavre who had taken up his position behind his wife one must come to brittany to see a carnival like this estelle did not reply a tall young man of about twenty was coming out of church with an old lady on his arm his complexion was very fair his look proud and his hair of a yellowish tinge he was almost a giant with his broad shoulders his brawny limbs on which the muscles stood out and yet he had the soft delicate and rosy face of a young girl without a hair upon it as estelle was looking at him astonished by his surpassing comeliness he turned his head glanced at her for a second and blushed hello muttered monsieur chavre there's one man at least who's got a human face he'd make a splendid carabinier it's monsieur hector said the hotel servant who had heard this he's with his mother madame de plougastel he's such a nice good young man during lunch the shoppers heard a lively discussion the commissioner of mortgages who took his meals at the hotel de commerce was extolling the patriarchal life of guerande and especially the good morals of the young according to him it was the religious education of the inhabitants which thus preserved their innocence and he gave examples he quoted facts but a commercial traveller who had arrived that morning with some cases of cheap jewellery sneered saying that on his way thither he had seen boys and girls kissing behind the hedges he would have liked to see these virtuous country youths if some amiable ladies came within their reach and he wound up by making such sport of religion of priests and nuns that his opponent threw down his napkin and went off in high dudgeon the chabras had gone on eating without saying a word the husband furious at hearing such things talked of at a table d'hote his wife calm and smiling as if she had not understood a word to while away the afternoon the couple paid a visit to Guaranda. the church of st aubin was deliciously cool they walked slowly about it raising their eyes to the lofty vaulted roof supported by clusters of little columns they tarried before the curious carvings of the capitals on which one may see executioners sawing their victims in two and roasting them on gridirons whilst blowing into the fire to make it burn more fiercely afterwards they strolled about the five or six streets of the town and monsieur chavre kept to his opinion it was certainly a hole with no trade one of those relics of the middle ages of which so many have been already demolished the streets were deserted and bordered by gabled houses which leaned one against another like feeble old women pointed roofs pepper boxes covered with tiles corner towers the remains of time-worn carvings all helped to transform certain silent nooks into museums sleeping in the sun estelle who had read some novels since she had been married looked languishingly at the little windows with their panes surrounded by lead she was thinking of sir walter scott and kenilworth but when the shoppers went out of the town to walk around it they nodded their heads and had to admit that it was really pretty the granite walls stood there without a breach gilded by the sun and as sound as on the day they were built festoons of ivy and honeysuckle hung from the machicolations on the towers which flank the ramparts shrubs have grown golden broom and flaming wallflowers whose clumps of flowers blaze in the bright sunlight and all around the town stretch promenades overshadowed by tall trees ancient elms beneath which the grass grows thick and green one can walk there as on a carpet along the edge of the old moat filled up in places with masonry while in others there are stagnant pools whose weedy water is full of the reflections of silvery birch trees growing against the walls sunbeams glisten through the trees and light up mysterious corners and postern gates where only frogs with their sudden and terrified leaps abide in the sombre silence of forgotten centuries 
there are ten towers i counted them cried monsieur chambre when they had returned to their starting point the four gates of the town had particularly struck him with their deep and narrow archways through which only one vehicle could pass at a time was it not ridiculous in the nineteenth century to remain shut up thus he would have raised the gates regular citadels though they were filled with loopholes with walls so thick that two six-storied houses could have been built in their place just think he added of all the building materials that could be obtained from the ramparts they were then on the mail or mall a broad raised promenade forming a quarter of a circle from the eastern to the southern gate estelle remained thoughtful at the sight of the splendid view which stretched for miles beyond the roofs of the suburbs there was first a belt of green pine trees bent by the sea breezes gnarled shrubs a mass of dark verdure beyond this stretched the desert of salt marshes an immense barren plain with its mirror-like square basins and its little white heaps of salt glittering amid the dreary expanse of sand then further still on the edge of the horizon there appeared the deep blue ocean three sails on this blue streak looked like three white swallows there's the young man we saw this morning said monsieur chabre suddenly don't you think he's like little la riviere if he had the hump it would be himself estelle had slowly turned round but hector who was standing on the edge of the mall absorbed too in the distant view of the sea did not appear to notice that any one was looking at him estelle walked slowly on leaning upon the long handle of her sunshade after going a few steps the bow of the sunshade came off and the chabras suddenly heard a voice calling behind them madame madame it was hector who had picked up the bow thank you very much said estelle with her quiet smile he seemed a very timid and nice young fellow and took monsieur chabra's fancy at once the retired grain merchant confided to him his difficulties about a choice of seaside places and even went so far as to ask for information hector began to stammer oh i don't think you'll find what you want either at la croisique or at bordebeth he said pointing out the spires of these little towns on the horizon i should advise you to go to piriac he then gave them further particulars piriac was nine miles off he had an uncle who lived there and finally in answer to a question from monsieur chavre he stated that shellfish were to be found there in abundance meanwhile the lady tapped the short grass with the end of her sunshade and the young gentleman did not raise his eyes to her as if embarrassed by her presence what a pretty town Borand is said estelle at last in her musical voice yes very pretty stammered hector suddenly enwrapping her in an ardent gaze End of section 16section 17 of the jolly parisiennes and other novelettes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana in september 2018 madame chambre by emile zola translated by george d cox chapter 2 the swimmers one morning three days after the couple had taken up their quarters at pirac monsieur chavre standing on the jetty which protects the little harbour was placidly watching estelle who was floating about in the water the sun was already very hot and correctly got up in a black coat and felt hat the grain merchant was sheltering himself with the tourist's green-lined sunshade is it nice he asked wishing to appear interested in his wife's bath very nice replied estelle turning over again monsieur chavre never bathed he had a horror of the sea which he concealed by saying that his doctors had formerly forbidden him to bathe this was the contrary of the truth still whenever a wave rolled up on the beach and wet his feet he started back as if some savage animal had shown its teeth so it's nice 
he repeated, stupefied by the heat, and overcome by a sense of restless sleepiness. Estelle did not answer this time. She was swimming like a dog and beating the water with her arms. Being as hardy as a boy, she used to bathe for hours together, a fact which was the despair of her husband, for he thought himself obliged to wait for her on the beach. Estelle had found the bathing at Piriac just to her taste. She could not bear a sloping beach down which one has to walk for a long way before the water reaches one's waist. She used to step to the end of the jetty, wrapped in her downy white dressing gown, let it slip from her shoulders, and take a header. She wanted a depth of six yards, she said, so as not to strike against the rocks. Her bathing costume, made in one piece and without any skirts, showed off her tall figure, and the long blue sash girding her waist swept across her hips, which swayed with a rhythmical motion. In the clear water, with her hair gathered under a waterproof cap, from which a tress escaped here and there, she had all the suppleness of a fish, but with a woman's voluptuousness and rosy face. Monsieur Chabra had been waiting for a quarter of an hour in the blazing sun. Three times already he had looked at his watch. At last he ventured to remark timidly, "'You've uh, been in the water a long time, my dear. I think you ought to come out. Such a long bath must be tiring.' "'Why, I've only just got in,' cried Estelle. "'It's like milk.' Then, throwing herself on her back, "'You can go if you're tired. I have no need of you.' He shook his head and said that accidents happened so easily, whereupon Estelle smiled, thinking what a lot of good her husband would be to her if she was seized with cramp. But suddenly she looked toward the other side of the pier, where the bay extends on the left of the village. Look, she cried, what is that yonder? I'm going to see. And then away she shot, with long and regular strokes. Estelle, Estelle, cried Monsieur Chabra, don't go so far away. "'You know I can't bear such foolhardiness.' "'But Estelle did not hear him, and he had to resign himself. "'Standing on tiptoe to watch the white spot "'which the straw hat his wife was wearing over her glazed cap "'showed on the water, he kept changing his sunshade from hand to hand, "'feeling almost suffocated by the heat. "'Whatever has she seen?' he muttered. "'Oh, I see that thing that's floating there, some filth, "'a mass of seaweed, I suppose.' or a barrel but no it's moving then suddenly he saw what this object was why it's a man swimming he said estelle also after taking a few strokes had discovered that it was a man upon this she had ceased swimming straight towards him thinking it hardly proper to do so still from a feeling of coquetry and being happy to exhibit her skill she did not return to the pier but made for the open she swam quickly on without appearing to have noticed the bather. The latter, as if carried along by a current, was gradually approaching her. So when she turned to regain the pier, a meeting, which appeared quite undesigned, took place. "'Are you quite well, madam?' asked the gentleman politely. "'Oh, it's you,' said Estelle gaily. And she added with a slight laugh, "'How one does meet again!' It was young Hector de Plogastel. He was still shy, but he looked very strong and very rosy in the water. For a moment they swam on without speaking, at a decent distance from one another. They were obliged to raise their voices to hear what they said, but Estelle thought it her duty to be polite. "'We are so much obliged to you for telling us of Piriac, she said. "'My husband is delighted with it.' "'Is that your husband who is standing alone yonder on the pier?' asked Hector." yes replied estelle then they again became silent they looked at the husband who seemed no larger than a fly above the water monsieur chambre very much puzzled drew himself up wondering what acquaintance his wife could possibly have met with in the middle of the sea it was certain that she was talking to a gentleman he could see them turn their heads toward one another it must be one of their paris friends but he racked his brains to no purpose he could not think of one amongst them who would have been so adventurous so he waited twirling his sunshade to pass away the time yes explained hector to the handsome madame chabre i came to pass a few days with my uncle whose chateau you can see over yonder every day when i bathe i start from that point opposite the terrace and swim as far as the pier 
then i swim back it's two miles altogether and splendid exercise but you must be very brave madam i never saw a lady so brave oh said estelle when i was quite a child i used to paddle the sea knows me well we're old friends they had gradually approached one another so as not to have to shout so loud the sea on that sultry morning was sleeping like a vast lake in places it was like a piece of satin then there were stretches which resembled some crumpled material with the hardly perceptible vibration of a current rising and falling and spreading afar when they were close to one another the conversation took a more intimate turn it was a glorious day hector pointed out to estelle several points on the coast that village over there about a mile from piriac was port Olu. that stretch opposite where the white cliffs stood out so distinctly was morbihan there on the other side towards the open sea the island of dumet lay like a dark patch on the blue water as he pointed out each of these estelle followed the direction of hector's finger and stopped for a moment to look she was fond of gazing at these far-off coasts with her eyes on a level with the water when she turned towards the sun its dazzling light startled her and the sea appeared to be changed to a limitless sahara owing to the blinding reverberation of the luminary how lovely it is she murmured then she threw herself on her back to rest lying motionless with her hands crossed on her bosom and her head thrown back in an abandoned pose so you were born at guiranda she asked in order to talk more comfortably hector also turned upon his back yes he replied i have only been once to nantes then he told her about his younger days he had grown up beside his mother who was strictly pious and preserved the traditions of the old nobility intact his tutor a priest had taught him all that one learns at school with plenty of catechism thrown in and heraldry he could ride fence and was well inured to all bodily exercises and with all this he seemed to be of a virgin innocence for he confessed every week he never read novels and when he came of age he was to marry an ugly cousin what you are only just twenty exclaimed estelle casting a surprised look at this colossal child she became quite maternal this flower of the strong breton race interested her but as they lay on their backs their eyes gazing in the transparency of heaven thinking no longer of earth they were carried so close to one another that finally they gently collided oh i beg pardon said hector then he dived and reappeared a few yards off while she began to swim again and laughed heartily it was a case of boarding she cried hector was scarlet he came closer to her again looking slyly at her he thought her delicious beneath her broad-brimmed hat there was nothing to be seen but her face and her dimpled chin laved by the water a few drops which fell from the blonde tresses which had escaped from her cap shone like pearls amidst the down on her cheeks and nothing could have been more exquisite than her smile her pretty face moving silently along leaving a silver streak behind Hector blushed more than ever when he saw that Estelle knew that he was looking at her and was making merry over his confusion. "'Your husband must be getting alarmed,' he finally said, so as to start the conversation again. "'Oh, no,' she answered quickly. "'He's used to waiting for me when I bathe.' To tell the truth, Monsieur Chabert was getting agitated. He took a few steps, walked back, then set off again, each time twirling his sunshade more quickly, in the hope of getting some fresh air. His wife's conversation with that strange bather was beginning to alarm him. Suddenly Estelle thought that perhaps he had not recognized Hector. "'I'll call out and tell him that it's you,' she said to the young man and as soon as she came within hearing of the pier she shouted my dear it's the gentleman from guiranda who was so kind to us oh very well cried monsieur chabre in his turn and he took off his hat and bowed is the water pleasant sir he asked politely very pleasant sir replied hector the bathing went on under the eyes of the husband who did not dare to complain although his feet were roasted by the burning stones 
at the end of the pier the sea was of a lovely transparency the bottom was plainly to be seen at a depth of four or five yards with its fine sand its patches of dark or light pebbles its slender weeds standing upright and waving their long tresses this charming sight delighted estelle she swam about gently so as not to disturb the surface and bending down with the water coming up to her nose she gazed at the sand and pebbles in the mysterious depths beneath her the weeds especially almost frightened her when she passed over them there they lay in greenish masses as if alive swaying their jagged leaves and all in motion like the claws of crabs some short and clustering and nestling between the rocks others deformed straggling and seemingly as supple as serpents estelle kept uttering little screams as she made fresh discoveries oh what a big stone it looks as if it were moving and that's a tree a real tree with branches there there's a fish it's swimming then after a pause she cried out whatever is that a bunch of flowers why are there flowers in the sea look they're just like white blossoms oh how pretty hector dived and came to the surface again with a handful of whitish weeds which fell back and faded on leaving the water thank you so much said estelle you shouldn't have troubled here my dear take care of this for me and she threw the handful of weeds at monsieur chabre's feet for a few moments longer the two young people swam about making the water seethe with their short jerky strokes then all at once their energy seemed to leave them and they glided slowly about forming circles in the water which oscillated and then died away it was like some mysterious intimacy this reveling together in the same water hector as the water closed after estelle's moving body tried to glide into the wake which she left as if to occupy the same place and feel the warmth of her limbs around them the sea had become still calmer and of a blue of which the paleness almost verged on pink my dear you'll catch cold said monsieur chabre from whom the perspiration was dropping i'm coming out she replied she left the water and with the aid of a chain quickly mounted the sloping face of the pier hector had intended to watch her get out but when he turned his head at the sound of the water dripping from her she was already up above wrapped in her dressing-gown he looked so surprised and so annoyed that she smiled in the midst of her shivers and she shivered because she knew she looked charming thus with her tall draped silhouette standing out against the sky the young man took his leave i hope we shall have the pleasure of seeing you again sir said the husband and as estelle whilst tripping along the pier watched hector's head traversing the bay again monsieur chabre walked gravely behind her carrying the weed gathered by the young man with his arm outstretched so as not to wet his coat end of section seventeen Section 18 of The Jolly Parisiennes and Other Novelettes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in September 2018. Madame Chabre by Emile Zola. Translated by George D. Cox. Chapter 3 estelle's enjoyments the chabras had taken the first floor of a large house at puriac which overlooked the sea as there were only some taverns in the village they had been obliged to hire a woman from the neighborhood to cook for them and precious cooking it was joints reduced to charcoal and sauces of suspicious colors from which it resulted that estelle preferred to eat bread but as monsieur chabre said they had not come here to feed he for his part hardly touched the aforesaid joints and sauces following the doctor's advice he stuffed himself with shellfish the hardest part of it was that he detested these unknown things with their odd shapes having been accustomed to plain ordinary food though by the way he was as fond of sweetmeats as a child 
shellfish salted shellfish peppered shellfish of such strong and unexpected flavor tried his palate to such an extent that it was impossible to avoid making a wry face when he swallowed them but he would have swallowed them shells and all if necessary so desperately anxious was he to obey the doctor's behests my dear you don't eat any shellfish he would often say to estelle insisting that she should eat as much as he did and then the argument would begin estelle saying that dr guirard had not spoken of herself having discovered an oyster bed she at last complied so far as to eat a dozen at every meal it was not that she for the benefit of her health personally needed oysters to eat but she was very fond of them life at puriac was dull to a degree there were only three families of bathers a wholesale grocer of nantes a retired notary from guiranda a simple deaf old fellow and a family from angers who used to fish all day standing up to their waists in the water this little world gave few opportunities for diversion they used to bow to one another when they met and matters went no further on the deserted quay the greatest excitement that was known was an occasional dog-fight estelle who was accustomed to the turmoil of paris would have been bored to death if hector had not paid them a visit every day he became monsieur chabre's great friend after they had one day taken a walk together along the shore monsieur chabre in a moment of expansiveness had confided to the young man the object of his visit and when he had scientifically explained to him the reason why he ate so many shellfish hector gazed at him from head to foot without thinking of concealing his surprise however the next day he presented himself with a small basket full of whelks which the retired grain merchant accepted with a look of gratitude and from that day forward being very expert at all kinds of fishing and knowing every rock in the bay he never came without bringing some shellfish he made him eat some splendid mussels which he gathered at low tide sea urchins which pricked his fingers when he opened and cleaned them and all sorts of creatures with strange names which he detached from the rocks with the point of a knife and which he had never tasted himself monsieur chabre delighted and no longer having to spend a copper loaded the young man with thanks hector always had an excuse for coming there now every time that he arrived with his little basket and met estelle he made the same remark i've brought some shellfish for monsieur chabre and then they both smiled and their eyes twinkled monsieur chabre's shellfish were a great source of amusement to them from this time estelle thought Puriac delightful every day after bathing she went for a walk with hector her husband followed them at a distance for his legs were heavy and they often went too fast for him hector pointed out to estelle the ancient splendors of the Puriac, remains of carvings and delicately traced doors and windows to-day the town of former times is a deserted village with streets full of dirt heaps straggling between gloomy hovels but the solitude is so sweet that estelle strode over the open sewers in the streets interesting herself in the least little bit of stonework throwing surprised looks into the houses where a whole bric-a-brac of misery littered the floor of beaten earth hector made her stop in front of the superb fig trees with broad soft leathery leaves with which the gardens are planted and which stretch their branches over the low walls they explored the narrowest streets leaned over the parapets of the wells at the bottom of which they could see their smiling faces in the clear shining water whilst behind them monsieur chabre was digesting his shellfish sheltered beneath the green sunshade which never left him estelle derived great amusement from geese and pigs which go about in bands in perfect liberty at first she had been very much afraid of the pigs whose sudden rushes whose masses of fat rolling about on little feet kept her in constant fear of being pushed against and knocked over and they were so dirty too with their stomachs covered with mud and their grimy snouts grovelling in the earth but hector had assured her that pigs were the most good-natured creatures in the world and then she became amused with their mad rushing about at feeding time and admired their rosy skins which showed like ball dresses after a shower the geese too had attractions for her often two flocks would arrive at some heap of rubbish from different directions 
they seemed to salute each other with a snapping of beaks then they mingled with one another and discussed the vegetable refuse together one of them standing on the top of the heap with round eyes and stiffened neck as if immovably fixed to the spot and puffing out the white down on his breast had all the majesty of a king with his great yellow beak whilst the others with lowered heads searched on the ground with hoarse murmurs then suddenly the big gander would descend uttering a cry and the geese of his flock would follow him all their necks bent in the same direction walking in measure with an affected gait like that of disabled animals if a dog passed all necks were stretched out further and each goose hissed then estelle clapped her hands and followed the majestic procession of the two flocks who were returning home like grave individuals summoned by important business another of her amusements was to watch the pigs and the geese wash themselves when they went down on the beach in the afternoon to bathe like human beings the first sunday estelle thought fit to go to church she was not accustomed to do so in paris but in the country it passed away the time and gave one a chance to put on one's best clothes and look at other people and besides she came across hector there using an enormous prayer-book with worn covers he never ceased looking at her over the top of it with grave lips but eyes so sparkling that one could see smiles in them on coming out he offered her his arm to cross the little cemetery which surrounds the church in the evening after vespers there was another spectacle a procession to a calvary at the end of the village a peasant marched first carrying a banner of violet silk embroidered with gold and suspended from a red handle then came two long lines of women walking at distant intervals the clergy were in the middle the village priest a curate and the chaplain of a neighboring chateau singing their loudest last of all following a white banner which was carried by a stout wench with sunburnt arms came a crowd of the faithful trailing along like a straggling flock with a din of clogs when the procession passed the harbor the banners and the white caps of the women contrasted with the brilliant blue of the sea and the slowly moving procession seemed invested with singular purity in the sunlight the cemetery affected estelle very much she did not as a rule care for sad sights and on the day of her arrival she had shuddered on seeing all the tombstones in front of her windows the church faced the harbor and was surrounded with wooden crosses whose arms stretched toward the immensity of the sea and sky and on stormy nights the breeze from the ocean sobbed through this forest of black boards estelle however had quickly become accustomed to the sight for the little cemetery had a gentle gaiety of its own the dead seemed to smile there in the midst of the living who crowded around them the cemetery was enclosed by a low wall which was about breast high and barred the way in the very midst of the village but people did not hesitate about clambering over it and following the walls which were hardly discernible amid the high grass children played there a crowd of children let loose among the granite slabs cats too hiding under shrubs sprang out suddenly and pursued one another one might often hear their amorous mewing and see the shadows of their bristling bodies and long tails lashing the air it was a delicious nook overgrown with wild vegetation planted with gigantic fennels with large yellow umbrels whose smell was so penetrating that after a hot day the scent of aniseed which arose from the tombs filled the whole of piriac and what a calm and tranquil spot the cemetery was at night it seemed to waft peace over all the slumbering village darkness blotted out the crosses belated promenaders sat on the granite seats against the wall whilst opposite the sea waves rolled the breeze blowing their salt breath inland estelle while returning one evening on hector's arm felt a wish to cross this deserted spot monsieur chabre thought the idea too romantic and went along the quay protesting the young woman had to let go of hector's arm so narrow was the path in the midst of the tall grass her dress made one long rustle the scent of the fennel was so strong that the amorous cats lying overcome on the ground did not even stir at her approach as she reached the shadow cast by the church she felt hector's hand on her waist she then felt frightened and gave a little scream 
"'Oh, how stupid of me,' she said when they emerged from the shade. "'I thought a ghost had got hold of me.' Hector began to laugh and tried to explain it. "'Oh, it was some branch, some fennel that brushed against your dress,' said he. Then they stopped and looked at the crosses around them. The deep silence of death affected them, and, without saying another word, they went on, ill at ease. "'You were frightened, I heard you,' said Monsieur Chabre. "'Just what I told you.' When the tide came in, they used to go and watch the sardine boats arrive, just to pass away the time. As soon as the sail was visible, Hector went on to tell them about it. But the husband, after he had seen half a dozen of them, declared that it was the same thing over and over again. Estelle, on the contrary, did not seem tired of it. She was more delighted every time she went on the pier. Frequently they had to run, and she would leap from stone to stone, holding up her flying skirts with one hand so as not to fall. She was quite out of breath when they arrived, and had to hold her hands to her chest, whilst she threw herself back to recover herself. Hector thought her delightful thus, with her hat off and her boyish look, but the boat was made fast, and the fishermen began to carry up the baskets of sardines, which glittered like silver in the sun, with their sapphire-like blues and their pinks of a pale ruby shade. Then the young man always gave the same explanations. Each basket contained a thousand sardines. A thousand were worth a sum which was fixed every morning, according to the abundance of the hall. The fishermen divided the produce of the sail, after having set one-third aside for the owner of the boat. Then there was the salting, which was done at once in wooden cases, pierced with holes to allow the brine to run off. However, after a while, Estelle and her companion neglected the sardine boats. They went to see them, but did not look at them. They would start off at a run and return lazily, silently gazing at the sea. "'A good haul?' asked Monsieur Chambre each time they got back. "'Yes, very good,' they would reply. On Sunday evening there was an open-air dance at Piriac. The country lads and lasses, with joined hands, whirled round for hours, repeating the same verse in the same low and regular cadence. These rough voices, murmuring in the twilight, had a wild charm of their own. Estelle, sitting on the beach with Hector at her feet, listened and became absorbed in reverie. The sea flowed in with a caressing sound. One might have imagined it was the voice of love when the waves beat upon the sand. Then the voice suddenly grew low and died away in the retreating water with the plaintive murmur of subdued tenderness. "'You must be tired of Piriac, my dear,' said Monsieur Chambre sometimes. But Estelle hastened to reply, "'Oh, no, not at all, really.' She enjoyed herself in this deserted nook. These geese, the pigs, the sardines, all had their attractions. The little cemetery, too, was very pleasant. This sleepy life, this solitude, peopled only by the grocer from Nantes and the deaf notary of Guerand, seemed to her more tumultuous than a noisy, fashionable watering place. At the end of a fortnight, Monsieur Chambre, who was tired to death of it, wanted to go back to Paris. The shellfish, he said, had done him enough good. But Estelle protested, saying, "'Oh, no, my dear, you haven't eaten enough. I'm certain you need more.'" End of section 18section 19 of the jolly parisiennes and other novelettes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana madame chabre by emile zola translated by george d cox chapter 4 shrimping one evening Hector said to the Chabras, "'There'll be a high tide tomorrow. We might go shrimping.' This proposal seemed to delight Estelle. Yes, yes, they would go shrimping. She had been looking forward to it for a long time. Monsieur Chabra, however, raised various objections. In the first place, one never caught anything. Then it was better to give some woman a franc or so for her to take than to get wet through and hurt one's feet.' but he had to yield to his wife's enthusiasm, and preparations were made on a large scale. Hector had engaged to provide the necessary nets. 
monsieur chabre in spite of his dread of cold water declared that he would make one of the party and when he once gave his consent to fish it meant serious business in the morning he had a pair of boots greased and then proceeded to don a white suit but all his wife's persuasion could not make him neglect his necktie which he arranged as carefully as if he were going to a wedding this necktie was the protest of a well-dressed man against the untidy ways of the sea as for estelle she simply put on her bathing costume over which she wore a jersey hector too was in bathing dress the trio set out at two o'clock each carrying a net on the shoulder they had to walk for a mile and a half amid sand and seaweed to reach a rock where hector said he knew there were regular shoals of shrimps he calmly led the way splashing through the water and going straight on without troubling himself about the difficulties they met with estelle followed him gaily delighted at the coolness of the puddles in which she splashed her little feet monsieur chabre who came last did not see the necessity of wetting his boots before arriving at the fishing grounds he conscientiously went round all the wet places strode over the little streams which the falling tide had hollowed out in the sand and picked out the dry spots with the carefulness of a parisian stepping over the paving stones in the rue vivienne on a muddy day he was out of breath already and kept asking is it much further monsieur hector why shouldn't we fish here i assure you i can see some shrimps besides they're everywhere in the sea aren't they and one would only have to push one's net along push it along then monsieur chabre replied hector and monsieur chabre in order to recover his breath cast his net in a pool about as large as his hand he caught nothing however not even a piece of seaweed so clear and empty was the water then he walked on again with a dignified air and his lips pursed but as he lost his way in his anxiety to prove that there were shrimps everywhere he finally found himself left considerably in the rear the tide was still going out and the coast was more than a mile away there were pebbles and rocks on all sides as far as the eye could reach there stretched a rugged watery desert of a solitary grandeur looking like some expanse that a storm had devastated there was nothing to be seen in the distance but the green line of the sea still running out as if conquered by the land whilst black rocks in the great narrow strips reared up and projected like promontories in the stagnant water estelle stood and gazed intently on this gloomy immensity how grand it is she murmured hector pointed out to her some green-clad rocks forming platforms which were washed by the surf they are only above water twice a month he explained there are quantities of mussels to be found there do you see those brown masses over there they are called the red cows and are the best place for lobsters they never appear but at the lowest tides but we must hurry we're going to those rocks of which you can just see the points estelle was delighted when they reached the water she lifted her feet up as high as she could and then stamped about laughing at the splashing foam then when the water reached her knees she had to struggle against the current and she enjoyed walking quickly and feeling the resistance of the water rushing past and caressing her limbs don't be frightened said hector the water will be up to our waists but it will get shallower again we're nearly there and as he said the water grew shallower they had been crossing a small arm of the sea and were now on a broad platform of rocks which had been left high and dry when estelle turned to look back she uttered a slight scream on seeing how far they were from the shore piriac appeared far away on the horizon with its white houses and square church tower never had she seen such a vast expanse streaked in the brilliant sunshine by the golden sands the dark verdure of the seaweed and the varied and striking colors of the rocks it was like the world's end the waste of ruins where nothingness begins estelle and hector were preparing to make their first cast when a doleful voice was heard monsieur chabre standing in embarrassment amid the little arm of the sea was tremulously asking his way how do you get out of this he cried straight on the water was up to his middle and he did not dare to make another step being terrified by the thought that he might fall into some hole and disappear to the left cried hector 
he turned towards the left but getting deeper and deeper he stopped again frightened out of his wits and not even having the courage to go back he began to deplore his fate come give me a hand i'm certain there are some holes here i feel them he said to the right monsieur chabre to the right cried hector again the poor man looked so comical in the midst of the water with his net over his shoulder and his beautiful necktie that estelle and hector could not help laughing at last he extricated himself but he was very much upset and said in a furious voice you know i can't swim he was now full of alarm about the return journey when hector told him that they must not be caught by the tide on the rocks he became very uneasy you'll warn me won't you he said oh don't be alarmed i'll answer for you then they began to fish thrusting their narrow nets into all the holes estelle took a woman's delight in it she it was who took the first shrimps three great red fellows who leaped about violently at the bottom of her net with loud cries she called hector to her help for these lively creatures alarmed her but when she saw that they did not move again after being taken hold of by the head she grew bold and managed to slip them herself into the little basket which she carried slung across her shoulder occasionally she brought up a bunch of seaweed and searched amongst it when a little noise like the beating of wings told her that there were some shrimps there she picked the weeds over daintily throwing them away by little handfuls and not feeling very comfortable at the sight of the tangle of strange leaves soft and slippery like dead fish from time to time she looked into her basket impatiently wishing to see it full it's an odd thing monsieur chabre kept saying i can't catch one as he dared not venture between the clefts of the rocks and was moreover very much hampered by his boots which were full of water he thrust his net under the sand and merely caught some crabs five eight ten at a time he was terribly frightened of them and made desperate struggles to get them out of his net every now and then he turned round uneasily to see whether the sea was still going out are you certain it's going out he would say to hector the latter contented himself with nodding his head he was fishing like a man who knows all the best spots and consequently he brought out handfuls of shrimps at each cast whenever he was near estelle he put his take in her basket whilst she laughed and made signs in her husband's direction placing her fingers on her lips she looked charming bending over the long wooden handle or holding her fair head over the net to see what was in it a breeze was blowing and the water dripping from the meshes covered her hair with a fine spray whilst her bathing costume now fluttering now clinging to her showed off the elegance of her dainty figure they had been fishing like this for two hours when estelle with her fair curls wet with perspiration stopped for a moment to recover her breath around her the immense desert was lying in sovereign peace only the sea was shivering and murmuring in a voice which rose and fell the sky glowing in the afternoon sun was of a pale blue almost gray but in spite of this furnace-like color there was no heat for the freshness rose from the water and swept the dazzling ether what interested estelle the most was that on the horizon on every rock she saw a multitude of objects which stood out black and distinct they were shrimpers like themselves but looking inconceivably small not larger than ants ridiculous in their nothingness amid the immensity around them their least movements were plainly visible their backs rounded when they thrust their nets along or their arms stretched out and moved like flies legs when they sorted their take throwing away the weeds and crabs i'm certain the water is rising cried monsieur chambre in perfect agony look he added that rock was uncovered just now of course it's rising cried hector impatiently it's precisely when it's rising that the most shrimps are to be caught but monsieur chambre had lost his head in his last cast he had captured a strange fish a sea devil which perfectly terrified him with its monstrous head he had had enough of it let's go let's go he repeated it's stupid to be so rash don't you understand that the fishing is better when the tide's coming in replied his wife and it is coming in added hector in a half whisper with his eyes full of mischief 
the waves were in fact growing higher encroaching upon the rocks with an ever-increasing clamour and now and again a sudden gush of water covered all at once a whole spit of land it was the conquering sea taking back foot by foot the domain which it had swept with its storms for centuries past estelle had discovered a puddle full of long weeds as flexible as hair and she was catching enormous shrimps in the water there throwing up the sand and leaving a furrow behind her like that of a plough she proved obstinate and nothing could tear her from it well i'm going cried m chambre half crying there's no sense in it we shall never escape to tell the tale and off he went despairingly sounding the depth of the holes with the handle of his net when he had gone two or three hundred yards hector at last persuaded estelle to follow the water will be up to our shoulders he said smiling a regular bath for monsieur chambre look how he's sinking already since turning back the young man's face had worn the sly and anxious look of a lover who has determined to make a declaration and dares not do so whilst putting the shrimps in estelle's basket he had done his best to clasp her fingers but he was plainly vexed at his own want of boldness if m chambre had been drowned he would have been delighted for m chambre was in his way do you know he said suddenly you ought to get on my back and i'll carry you otherwise you will be drenched come along jump up he stooped down but she refused awkward and blushing but he laid hold of her saying that he was responsible for her safety and so she clambered up placing her hands on his shoulders firm as a rock and straightening his back he seemed to have merely a bird on his neck telling her to hold fast he plunged with long strides into the water to the right isn't it monsieur hector cried the doleful voice of monsieur chambre who had the water up to his middle yes still to the right then as the husband turned his back trembling with fear as he felt the sea mount to his armpits hector ventured to kiss one of the little hands on his shoulders estelle tried to withdraw it but he told her not to move or else he would not answer for the consequences and he then again began to cover her hands with kisses they were cool and salt and he inhaled from them the briny delights of the ocean don't please said estelle putting on an angry air you are taking a strange advantage i shall jump into the water if you do it again he did it again however she did not jump he clasped her tightly by the ankles and devoured her hands without saying a word only watching what remained of monsieur chambre's back a little bit of back which threatened to disappear at every step did you say to the right implored the husband to the left if you like monsieur chambre then took a step to the left and uttered a cry he had gone up to the neck and his cravat was afloat then hector made his confession i love you said he be quiet sir i command you i love you i adore you until now my lips were closed out of respect he did not look at her but continued taking long strides with the water up to his chest estelle could not restrain a loud laugh so comical did the situation appear there be quiet she continued maternally giving him a pat on the shoulder be good and above all don't fall this pat filled hector with delight and as the husband was still in distress to the right now he cried gaily when they reached the shore monsieur chabre wanted to begin a long explanation i was nearly drowned upon my word it was my boots but estelle opened her basket and showed it to him full of shrimps what you caught all those he cried in amazement what a good hand you are at it oh she said smiling and looking at hector i had a good master end of section nineteen section twenty of the jolly parisiennes and other novelettes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Madame Chambre by Emile Zola. Translated by George D. Cox. Chapter 5. The Castelli Rocks. The Chambres had only two more days to stay at Piriac. Hector seemed in despair and furious, albeit humble, 
as for monsieur chabre he consulted his health every morning and appeared to feel perplexed you can't go away without seeing the castelli rocks said hector one evening we ought to walk there to-morrow he proceeded to explain the rocks were only a mile away they ran along in the water for a mile and a half and were hollowed out with grottoes and worn by waves according to his account nothing could be wilder than the sight which they presented very well we'll go to-morrow said estelle finally is the way there difficult no there are two or three places where you may wet your feet but that's all monsieur chabre however would not even wet his feet he had had a perfect horror of the sea ever since his bathing in it while shrimping so he showed himself very much averse to this project it was ridiculous to risk one's life in such a way in the first place he would not venture into the midst of those rocks for he had no wish to break his legs in jumping about like a goat he would accompany them by the top of the cliff if it were absolutely necessary and even that was a great concession hector suddenly thought of a good way of tranquillizing him listen he said you will pass by the castelli semaphore and you can go in and buy some shellfish of the men there they've almost always got some splendid ones which they sell for next to nothing that's a good idea said monsieur chabre recovering his temper i'll take a little basket with me and i'll have one more blowout the next day they had to wait for low tide before setting out then as estelle was not ready they waited and in fact they did not start until five o'clock in the evening however hector declared that they would not be overtaken by the high tide estelle put on some canvas shoes and a very short gray dress which she looped up so as to show her dainty ankles as for monsieur chabre he was correctly attired in white trousers and an alpaca coat he carried his sunshade and a little basket with the satisfied air of a parisian who is going to do his own marketing until they reached the first rocks the way was a very difficult one they had to walk along a stretch of drifting sand into which their feet plunged at every step the retired grain merchant snorted like a grampus well i am going to leave you i am going up on the cliffs he said at last that's right follow that path replied hector you wouldn't be able to get up further on do you want any help they watched him climb up to the summit of the cliff when he arrived there he opened his sunshade and swung his basket calling out here i am it's better up here but don't be rash mind i shall keep my eye on you hector and estelle were soon among the rocks the former, wearing high-laced boots, walked first, leaping from stone to stone with the active grace of a mountain hunter. Estelle, who was on her mettle, chose the same stones, and when he turned round and asked her whether she would have a hand, she replied, "'Certainly not. Why, do you think I'm already an old woman?' They were at that point on a broad platform of granite, which the sea had washed and hollowed out into great clefts one might have imagined one saw the bones of some monster piercing the sand and displaying its shattered vertebra in every hollow streams of water trickled and black weeds hung about like dripping hair the pair went leaping along balancing themselves from time to time on the tops of the rocks and screaming with laughter whenever a stone swayed beneath their weight it's like being at home said estelle gaily you could put these rocks into a drawing-room wait a little said hector you shall see there's something very different ahead of us they were reaching a narrow passage a kind of rift which yawned between two enormous blocks of stone there a pool a watery space barred the way i shall never get across it cried estelle hector proposed to carry her but she shook her head slowly she didn't want to be carried any more so he set to work to collect some large stones and made a kind of bridge the stones however slipped down and fell into the water give me your hand and i'll jump she cried at length seized with impatience but she did not jump far enough and one of her feet alighted in the pool at which they both laughed heartily then as they emerged from the narrow passage estelle uttered a cry of admiration before them there was a creek filled with an enormous mass of rocks immense blocks were standing upright like advanced sentinels posted in the midst of the waves 
along the cliffs the sea had eaten the land away leaving only some bare masses of granite and there were bays running in between promontories disclosing at every turn deep caverns and ridges of black marble protruding from the sand like great stranded fishes the spot might have been likened to a cyclopean city taken by assault and laid waste by the sea with its ramparts overthrown its towers half demolished its buildings piled one upon another hector pointed out to estelle every nook in these storm-beaten ruins she walked along over sand as fine and yellow as powdered gold over pebbles whose particles of mica glittered in the sunlight over fallen rocks where she had now and then to make use of both hands to prevent herself from falling she passed under natural porticoes and triumphal arches bearing the stamp of both roman and gothic architecture she descended into caverns filled with cool air into lonely and spacious grottoes she gazed at the blue tinted rocks in the sombre weeds which dotted the grey walls of the cliffs she watched the sea-birds little brown creatures which flew about within the reach of her hand uttering a low and continuous twitter but what delighted her above all was when in the midst of the rocks she turned round and always beheld the sea with its blue waters for ever reappearing and spreading out between each boulder in tranquil grandeur oh there you are suddenly cried monsieur chabre from the top of the cliff i was frightened i thought you were lost i say aren't those caverns terrible he was prudently standing at half a dozen paces from the edge with his sunshade over his head and with his basket on his arm it's coming in quick he added take care we've plenty of time don't be alarmed replied hector quietly estelle who had sat down was silently gazing on the vast horizon in front of her three granite pillars rounded by the waves rose up like the giant columns of some ruined temple and beyond the blue sea lay burnished in the golden evening glow a little sail in the offing appeared between two pillars looking in its dazzling whiteness like a gull skimming the water from the pale sky the evening twilight was already falling never before had estelle been pervaded with so great and tender a delight come said hector softly at the same time laying his hand upon her shoulder she started and rose up overcome with a languid feeling of content that's the semaphore isn't it that house with the masts cried monsieur chambre i'm going to fetch my shellfish i'll overtake you then estelle in order to shake off the feeling of lassitude which had laid hold of her began to run about like a child she leaped over the pools of water and rushed toward the sea being seized with a desire to mount to the summit of a heap of rocks which remained above the water at high tide and when after a laborious climb among the clefts she reached the top she clambered on to the highest spot and felt delighted at dominating the scene of gloomy desolation around her her slender outline stood out against the clear sky and her skirts fluttered in the wind like a flag on coming down she peered into all the holes that she came across in the smallest cavities there were little calm and sleeping lakes with water whose perfect clearness showed the reflection of the sky as in a mirror down below the weeds of emerald green grew like miniature forests and great black crabs leaped like frogs and disappeared without even rippling the water estelle stood thoughtful as if she were gazing upon mysterious lands upon unknown and delightful countries when they returned to the foot of the cliffs she saw that hector had filled his handkerchief with limpets therefore monsieur chambre said he i'm going to take them up to him just at that moment indeed monsieur chambre came back in a state of despair they haven't a single muscle at the semaphore he cried i didn't want to come you see i was quite right but when Hector showed him in the distance the contents of his handkerchief, he became happy again, and he stood amazed at the agility with which the young man clambered up, by a path known to himself alone, over rocks which looked as steep as walls. The descent was more foolhardy still. "'It's nothing,' said Hector. "'It's a regular staircase. Only you want to know where the steps are.' Monsieur Chambre now wished to go back the sea was rising and he implored his wife at any rate to come up upon the cliff there must surely be some easy way to reach it the young man laughed saying that there was no way for ladies that they must go to the end now and besides they had not seen the grottoes 
upon this monsieur chambre had to resign himself and followed the path to the top of the cliff as the sun was going down he closed his shade and used it as a walking stick in the other hand he still carried his basket of limpets are you tired asked hector gently yes a little replied estelle she took his arm she was not tired but a delicious feeling of lassitude was creeping upon her the excitement which she had just felt on seeing the young man clinging to the face of the rocks had caused a kind of flutter within her they walked slowly along the beach beneath their feet the shingle formed mainly of fragments of shells crunched like a garden walk they did not speak at last hector pointed out to her two broad fissures the mad monk's hole and the cat's grotto estelle entered raised her eyes and shuddered when they continued on their way over beautiful fine sand they looked at one another and remained still mute and smiling the sea was coming in with short rattling waves but they did not hear it monsieur chambre over their heads began to shout to them but they did not hear him either why it's madness cried the retired grain merchant waving his sunshade in his basket of limpets estelle monsieur hector listen you'll be drowned the water's up to your feet already but they did not feel the coolness of the little wavelets advancing upon them well what is it said estelle at last oh it's you monsieur chambre said the young man it's all right don't be afraid we've only got madame's grotto to look at monsieur chambre however made a gesture of despair and remarked it's simple madness you'll be drowned but they were out of hearing again in order to escape from the rising sea they stepped over the rocks and finally reached madame's grotto it was an excavation in a block of granite which formed a promontory the roof which was very lofty was dome-shaped and during the storms the water had polished the walls which shone like agate pink and blue veins formed arabesques of magnificent and barbaric appearance as if some savage artist had adorned this bathroom of the queens of the sea underfoot the shingle which was still damp was of a transparence which made it look like a bed of precious stones at the far end there was a ridge of sand soft and dry and of such pale yellow that it seemed almost white estelle had sat down on this sand and was examining the grotto one could live here she answered but hector who seemed to have been watching the sea for the last five minutes suddenly pretended to become extremely alarmed goodness we're caught the sea has cut us off we shall have two hours to wait he went out and looked up from monsieur chabra the latter was on the cliff just above the grotto and when hector told him that they were cut off what did i tell you he cried triumphantly but you wouldn't listen to me is there any danger none at all replied hector there'll only be five or six inches of water in the grotto don't be alarmed but we can't get out for two hours monsieur chambre was angry then they would have no dinner he was hungry already well this was a pretty affair he sat down grumbling on the stubbly grass set his sunshade on his left side and his basket of prawns on his right i suppose i must wait he said well go back to my wife and take care she doesn't catch cold hector sat down in the grotto at estelle's side after a moment's silence he ventured to take hold of her hand which she did not withdraw she was gazing out to sea twilight was gathering and a golden dust was gradually veiling the sun on the horizon the sea assumed a delicate pale violet tint and the dusky sea stretched away with never a sail upon its bosom gradually the water crept into the grotto laving the transparent shingle with a gentle sound it brought with it the delights of the ocean its caressing murmur its intoxicating odour estelle i love you said hector kissing her hands she did not reply she seemed as if stifled suddenly monsieur chambre's voice reached them hardly audible as if coming from the sky aren't you hungry i'm famished luckily i've got my knife i'm having a snack i love you estelle said hector again the night was dark the white sea lighted up the heavens 
at the entry of the grotto the waves gave vent to their long plaint whilst beneath the vaulted roof the last ray of daylight faded away estelle let her head fall on hector's shoulders above by the light of the stars monsieur chambre was methodically eating his limpets without bread for he had none and he swallowed them all careless as to the attack of indigestion which might be in store for him some months after their return to paris when pretty madame chabre presented her husband with a son and heir monsieur chambre was in a state of high glee he thanked dr guillard effusively for having sent him to the seaside and has ever since remained a firm believer in the peculiar virtues of shellfish end of section twenty end of madame chambre Section 21 of the Jolly Parisienne and Other Novelets. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Indu Nair. Margot's Gallant by Emile Zola. Translated by George D. Cox. Chapter One The Mahes and the Floches. Coqueville is a little village situated in a cleft of the rocks, some two miles from Grandport, with a fine sandy beach stretching out before the houses which cling halfway up the side of the cliff, like shells left there by the tide from the heights of Grandport towards the west the smooth yellow sand can be clearly discerned looking like a stream of gold dust issuing from the cloven rocks and any one with good eyes can even distinguish the reddish coloured houses and the blue smoke curling up from their chimneys and floating upwards above the lofty cliff it is a deserted spot and the inhabitants have never reached the number of two hundred the ravine which opens on to the beach and at the beginning of which the village lies is so winding and so very narrow that it is almost impossible to pass through it except on foot this cuts off most communication and isolates the little village which might be a hundred miles from the neighbouring hamlets nearly all the inhabitants are fishermen gaining their livelihood from the sea and each day they go to grandport by water taking with them their fish which one big firm that of dufeu and company buys by the catch monsieur dufeu has been dead some years but his widow carries on the business with the assistance of a manager monsieur mouchel a tall fair man who has to make all the arrangements with the fishermen this monsieur mouchel is the one link between coqueville and the civilized world the history of coqueville is worthy of being related it seems certain that sometime during the middle ages the village was founded by the mahe family who established themselves and prospered exceedingly at the foot of the cliff they must always have intermarried as for centuries there is no mention of any one besides the mahes in the place then during the reign of louis the thirteenth a man named floche appeared upon the scene it is not exactly known whence he came but he married a mahe girl and from that moment a phenomenon was witnessed the floches prospered in their turn and multiplied to such an extent that they gradually absorbed the mahes whose number diminished and whose fortune passed into the hands of the newcomers no doubt the floches had the advantage of possessing fresher blood more vigorous physique and temperaments which were better adapted to the inclemency of wind and waves at any rate nowadays the floches are the masters of coqueville 
it can be understood that this displacement of position and wealth was not accomplished without many terrible struggles the mahes and the flushes cordially hate one another in spite of their fall the mahes are still proud of having been the first conquerors and rulers of the place and they speak in terms of contempt of the first flush as a beggar a vagrant whom they had taken in and sheltered from pity and to whom to their eternal regret they had given one of their poor daughters according to them the descendants of this flush have never been anything but libertines and thieves and with the bitter rage of ruined fallen nobles who see the brats of their inferiors lording it over their chateaux and lands there is no insult that the mahes do not heap upon the powerful tribe of flosh naturally the floshes on their side are insolently triumphant they jeer at the ancient race of mahe and swear that they will drive the others from the village if they do not bow to their rule in their eyes the older family are good for nothings who would do better to mend their rags rather than proudly drape them round their shoulders and thus coqueville is divided into two fanatic factions that is to say about a hundred and thirty of the inhabitants are quite determined to demolish the other fifty simply because they are the stronger a struggle between two empires is carried on upon exactly the same lines amongst the most recent quarrels which have shaken coqueville people quote the famous enmity between the two brothers fouas and tupin and the noisy battles of the rouget household it must be stated that each inhabitant formerly received a nickname which with time has become a regular family surname but it is difficult to find one's way amidst the labyrinth of marriages between the mahes and the flushes rouget certainly did have an ancestor of ruddy hair and complexion but one cannot account for such names as fouas and tupin for many cognomens lost all sense as time passed on now old françoise a jolly old woman of eighty still living had had fouas by a mahe then her husband dying she had taken a floch as her second partner and had given birth to tupin hence came the hatred between the two brothers which was all the more lively on account of a dispute about some inheritance the rougets too were always fighting because rouget accused marie his wife of being too fond of a big dark floche named brismotte upon whom he rouget a little nervous man had already twice dashed knife in hand swearing that he would cut his heart out however coqueville's chief object of interest was neither rouget's hot passions nor the arguments between tupin and fouas there was a much more important rumour about namely that delpha a young fellow of about twenty and a mahe had dared to fall in love with margot the daughter of laquie who was the richest of the floches and mayor of the village he was called laquie that is pigtail because his father had in louis philippe's time been the last to wear his hair plaited with the obstinate determination of an old man clinging to the fashions of his youth now laquie owned one of the two biggest fishing boats in coqueville the zephyr or zephyr which was by far the best of all the smacks and still new and in perfect order the other large boat the baleine or whale a leaking pinnace belonged to rouget and was manned by delphin and fouas while tupin and brismotte went with la queue tupin and brismotte were never tired of laughing contemptuously at the baleine an old tub so they said which would some day disappear beneath the waves like a handful of mud so when la queue learned 
that that vagabond delpha belonging to the baleine was daring to hang about his daughter margot he gave the latter two sounding smacks simply to warn her that she should never be the wife of a mahe margot in a furious rage vowed that she would pass on the blows to delpha if he ever came near her for it was indeed aggravating to be clouted on account of a fellow she never even looked at margot who at sixteen was as strong as a man and as handsome as a fully developed woman was said to be very hard on any one who made love to her and to hold sweethearts in contempt so one can understand the amount of gossip that went on in cockfield about delphine's audacity and the two smacks that margot had received still there were some who said that margot in her heart was not really so very angry at seeing delphine come after her he was a short fair fellow with a tanned skin long thick hair and very strong in spite of his slender figure quite capable indeed of beating a man three times his size it was said that sometimes he went off to have a spree at Comport, and this gave him a somewhat disreputable name among the girls who accused him amongst themselves of living a fast life a vague expression which denoted any and every unknown pleasure whenever margot spoke of delpha she waxed wrathful but he always smiled knowingly and gazed calmly at her with his small bright eyes not troubling himself in the least either about her contempt or her anger he walked up and down before her house and stealthily followed her under cover of the brambles and thickets watching her for hours with the patience and cunning of a cat after a mouse when she suddenly found him behind her so close that the warmth of his breath had betrayed him he did not take to his heels but put on a gentle sorrowful air which took margot by surprise and made her forget her anger until he was a long way off again if her father had seen her then he would certainly have hit her the state of affairs could not last long and yet margot seemed to have sworn to no purpose that delpha should one day have the smacks she had promised him for she never seized the opportunity of bestowing them when he was there and people said she should not talk about doing it so much as in the end she would keep the buffets for herself no one ever dreamed that she could possibly become delphine's wife for a marriage between the most beggarly of all the mahes a fellow who had not six shirts to his back and the mayor's daughter who would be the richest of the floshes seemed simply monstrous and absurd ill-disposed people said that she might keep company with him but she would never marry him a rich girl can choose as she pleases in short all cockfield was interested in the affair and felt anxious to know how things would end would delpha have his ears boxed or would margot allow herself to be kissed in some quiet corner among the rocks that was what time alone would prove but pending the result cockville was in a state of civil war some being for the blow and others for the kiss two people only in the village sided neither with the mahes nor the floshes and those were the priest and the rural constable the latter a tall thin man whose real name no one seemed to know but who was called the emperor no doubt because he had served under charles the tenth did not exercise in reality the slightest surveillance over the land belonging to the state which in fact consisted chiefly of bare rocks and barren fields a sub-prefect who befriended him had created this sinecure for his benefit and he peacefully lived on his microscopical salary as for the abbe radiguet he was one of those simple-minded priests whom the bishops are only too glad to get rid of 
by burying them in some forsaken village. He lived the life of an honest peasant, tilling the small garden he had managed to form on the rock, and smoking his pipe as he watched the growth of his vegetables. His only fault was his greediness, a greediness which did not long for dainties, but was confined to eating mackerel and drinking sometimes more cider than was good for him. Still, he was indeed a father to his parishioners, and every now and then they came to hear Mass just by way of pleasing him. However, the priest and the constable were in the end forced to take sides after succeeding in remaining neutral so long. Now the emperor stood up for the Mahes while the Abbe Radiguet lent his support to the Floches, and thence arose various complications. As the emperor had nothing to do from morning to night, and at last got tired of counting the boats leaving Grandport, he had constituted himself the village detective, and since becoming a partisan of the Mahes, he upheld Fouas against Tupin tried to surprise Rouget's wife with Brismot, and above all else, closed his eyes whenever he saw Delphin slip into the courtyard of Margot's house. The worst of all this was that it led to violent quarrels between the emperor and his natural superior, the mayor Lacue. In his respect for discipline, the former listened to all the latter's reprimands, and then went and did exactly the same as before, thus disorganizing public authority in Coqueville. It was impossible to pass before the barn, which was termed by courtesy the municipal building, without being half deafened by the noise of a dispute. The Abbe Radiguet, on the other hand, now that he had reinforced the ranks of the Floches, who showered superb mackerel upon him, stealthily encouraged Rouget's wife in the resistance she made to her husband, and threatened Margot with the infernal flames if she ever dared to allow Delpha to touch her with the tip of his finger. It was simply utter anarchy, the army in revolt against civil authority, religion winking at the misdeeds of the well-to-do, and a whole nation numbering a hundred and eighty souls, ready to eat each other up in their mouse hole, situated between the immense sea and the infinite vastness of the sky. Delphin was the only one who still smiled amiably in the midst of this general agitation, for he only cared about Margot. He laid snares for her, much as if he had been trying to catch a rabbit, and he aimed at getting the priest to marry them. One evening, Margot found him watching for her in a lane, and then at last she raised her hand to strike. But she suddenly turned very red, for, without waiting for the blow to fall, Delpha had seized the hand which threatened him, and was passionately kissing it. She began to tremble, while he whispered to her, I love you. Will you have me? Never, she cried, in revolt at the idea. Delpha shrugged his shoulders, then went on in a quiet, tender voice. Don't say that. We should suit each other very well, and you'd see how nice it would be. End of section 21。section 22 of the Jolie Parisienne and other novelettes。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Indu Nair. Margot's Gallant by Emile Zola. Translated by George D. Cox. Chapter 2 The Strange Catch That Sunday was a terrible day. 
one of those sudden September storms which set such awful tempests raging round the rocky coast of Grandport had arisen. And as the light began to fade, a ship in distress was espied from Coqueville. But the darkness was increasing, and it was not possible to attempt to render any aid. The Zephyr and the Baleine had been anchored since the evening before in the little natural harbour lying between two granite walls to the left of the beach. Neither Lucky nor Rouget daring to go out in such weather, which was especially to be regretted, as Monsieur Michel, Madame de Faux's representative, had taken the trouble to come in person on the Saturday to offer them particularly good terms if they would make every effort and work hard for the catches had not been very good lately and the markets were complaining so coqueville muttered and grumbled as it went to bed that sunday evening with the torrents of rain pouring down around it it was the old old tale Whenever fish was not to be got from the sea, orders came in. Between its grumblings, the village talked of the ship which had been seen driving before the wind, and which, by now, must certainly be lying at the bottom of the sea. On the following day, Monday, the sky was still overcast, and the sea still ran high and obstinately refused to become calmer although the wind had fallen it ceased blowing entirely but the waves still dashed on then towards the afternoon the two boats put out in spite of everything at about four o'clock the zephyr returned having caught nothing and while Tupin and Brismont anchored it in the little harbour, Laqueu stood on the beach, shaking his fist at the ocean in his exasperation. Was not Monsieur Mouchel waiting, he said. Margot was there, with half Coqueville indeed, watching the furious billows and sharing her father's rancour against sea and sky. But where's the baleine? asked someone down there behind that point replied la queue and if that old tub returns to-day without being smashed it will be by sheer good luck he spoke in tones of great contempt and then he let it be understood that it was all very well for the mahes to risk their lives in that fashion it didn't so much matter when a man hadn't a copper to call his own but for his part he would rather fail in his promise to monsieur michel all this was said while margot stood observing the rocks behind which the baleine was supposed to be father she said at last have they taken anything they he cried not a thing he restrained himself as he caught sight of the emperor smiling and then went on more softly i don't know whether they have caught anything or not but as they never do catch anything perhaps though they have caught something to-day said the emperor maliciously such things have happened before now la queue was on the point of making an angry reply but the abbe radiguet came up at that moment and succeeded in soothing him he the abbe had just seen the baleine from the roof of the church and the boat seemed to be after some big fish this news caused great excitement the group on the beach comprised both mahes and floches the former wishing that the boat would return with a marvellous catch the others praying that it might come in empty margot was standing perfectly erect attentively watching the sea here they are 
she said quietly there was indeed a black speck coming round the point towards which they all turned their eyes it looked like a cork dancing on the water and the emperor whose eyesight was failing could not see even that much it needed a native of coqueville to recognize the baleine and its crew at such a distance why cried margot who had the best eyes in the village fouas and Hugé are rowing and the boy is standing in the bows she called adelpha and the boy to avoid mentioning his name after that every one watched the boat and tried to account for its strange movements as the priest had said it appeared to be after some fish which had fled before it that seemed extraordinary but the emperor declared that no doubt the fish had carried the net away with it at that la queue exclaimed that they were idle rogues and were only amusing themselves they certainly were not fishing for sea wolves all the floches laughed at this joke while the mahes in their vexation protested that rouget was a plucky fellow ever ready to risk his life when others would rather make for land at the least capful of wind the abbe radiguet had again to interfere for matters threatened to come to blows what is the matter with them exclaimed margot suddenly they've gone off again every one then ceased to menace his neighbor and all eyes were turned to the horizon the baleine was again hidden behind the point and this time la queue himself became uneasy he could not account for such maneuvers and the fear that rouget was really catching some fish made him lose all control over himself no one left the beach though there was nothing to be seen and for two hours the group stood there waiting for the boat which came just in sight from time to time and then again disappeared at last it did not reappear at all and la queue in his rage declared that it had gone to the bottom really wishing that it might be so as rouget's wife happened to be there with brismot the mayor looked at them both with a chuckle and patted Tupin on the shoulder to console him for the death of his brother Fouas. But his laughter ceased when he saw his daughter Margot standing still and silent, gazing out to sea. Perhaps things were looking up for Delphin. What are you doing here? he scolded. Get back to the house, Margot, and you'd better take care what you're up to she did not move but suddenly exclaimed ah here they are there was a cry of surprise for margot vowed she could not see a soul on board neither rouget nor fouas nor anybody the baleine was running before the wind as though forsaken tacking at every minute and lazily rocking from side to side fortunately a westerly wind had arisen and was driving the boat towards land though in a strange zigzag fashion then all coqueville went down on the beach some calling the others until there was not a girl left in all the houses to look after the dinner there was some catastrophe something inexplicable which turned everybody's head marie rouget's wife thought she ought to burst into tears and did so tupin only succeeded in putting on an air of sorrow and all the mahes began lamenting while the floches tried to dissimulate their delight margot had sat down as if her limbs had given way under her what are you up to now cried la queue as he found her under his feet i am tired she answered quietly and she turned her face towards the sea 
her cheeks in her hands and her eyes hidden by the tips of her fingers as she gazed at the boat which was rocking still more lazily like a good-tempered craft that has drunk too much different suppositions were still forthcoming perhaps the three men had fallen into the water only it seemed odd that they should all have fallen in together la queue would have liked to make everyone believe that the baleine had gone to pieces like a rotten egg but the boat was still floating and people shrugged their shoulders at the mayor's words then suddenly the latter remembered that he was the mayor and he spoke of the formalities that would have to be gone through as if the men had really perished don't talk like that cried the emperor do people ever die in such a stupid senseless fashion if they had fallen into the water little delphin would have been here by now all coqueville was obliged to own that little delphin swam like a fish but then where could the three men be there were cries of i tell you they are drowned i tell you they are not you great fool fool yourself and sundry blows were also exchanged the abbe radiguet had to entreat his parishioners not to quarrel and the emperor proceeded to restore order by pushing everybody about all this while the boat was dancing on the waves in sight of every one the tide which was bringing it in making it salute the shore in long measured bows the craft had certainly gone mad margot was still sitting with her cheeks between her hands watching it a skiff had just put out from the harbour to go and meet the baleine it was brismot who had had this idea for he was too impatient to wait any longer and wanted to relieve the suspense of rouget's wife then everyone's interest was centred in the smaller boat and voices were raised and became excited well could brismot see anything the baleine was still coming on in its mysterious facetious way and at last from the shore they saw brismot rise and look into the fishing boat one of the ropes of which he had caught hold of all the people on the beach held their breath but suddenly brismot burst out laughing that was indeed a surprise what could there be to amuse him what is it what is it shouted every one at the top of their voices he said nothing in reply but laughed still louder and made signs to them that they would soon see for themselves what the matter was then tying the baleine to his boat he towed it to land and coqueville was stupefied by a totally unexpected sight rouget delphin and fouaz were lying on their backs at the bottom of the craft snoring heavily and dead drunk beside them there was a little staved in cask a cask which they had found full and the contents of which they had tasted whatever it had contained had no doubt been very good for they had drunk every drop except about a pint which had run out and was now mixed with some sea-water in the boat oh the pig cried rouget's wife roughly drying her eyes well their cat is something to be proud of said la queue affecting great disgust well replied the emperor people catch what they can get and at any rate they have caught a cask while others have caught nothing at all the mayor was greatly put out but he said no more all coqueville was talking they understood it now when boats are tipsy they reel about like men and that one was indeed full of liquor coqueville then laughed and gave way to its ill-temper the mahes thinking the incident very droll 
while the floches thought it disgusting both factions crowded round the baleine their necks stretched out and their eyes wide opened to look at these three jubilant faced men who slept calmly on unconscious of the crowd leaning over them the scolding and the laughter did not disturb them in the slightest degree rouget did not hear his wife accuse him of always drinking all he could lay his hands on and fouas did not feel the stealthy kicks his brother tupin was bestowing on his ribs as for delphin he looked quite pretty when he had drunk a good deal with his fair hair and pink face with its rapturous expression margot had risen to her feet and was now silently contemplating the lad with an air of severity they ought to be put to bed exclaimed some one but just then delphin opened his eyes and looked around he was at once assailed with eager questions which somewhat dazed him for he was still very tipsy well what's the matter he stammered it's a little cask there's no fish so we caught a little cask that was all that could be got from him and at the end of every sentence he added it was very nice but what was there in the cask oh i don't know but it was very nice now every one was burning with curiosity as to what the liquor was and every nose in cockville was sniffing at the boat it was unanimously agreed that it smelt like some liquor only no one could say what liquor it was the emperor who flattered himself that he had tasted everything possible for man to drink said that he would see and in the hollow of his hand he gravely scooped up a little of the liquid lying in the bottom of the boat the crowd stood silently awaiting his verdict but after the first mouthful he shook his head as though he had not yet arrived at a conclusion he tasted it twice more and became very much embarrassed and surprised it's funny but i don't know what it is he was forced to own no doubt i should know if there wasn't any sea water mixed with it but upon my word it's funny people looked at each other for it must be something remarkable if the emperor himself could not say what it was and all coqueville gazed at the little empty barrel with respect it was very nice said delphin again who seemed utterly regardless of the people around him then designating the sea with a broad wave of the hand he added if you want any there's some more left i saw some little casks little casks little casks and he rocked himself to and fro humming this refrain and gazing at margot whose presence he had only just perceived she was furious and she raised her hand to give him a box on the ears but he did not even close his eyes and awaited the blow with a tender look on his face puzzled by this unknown beverage the abbe radiguet dipped his finger in the liquid also and then sucked it but like the emperor he shook his head no it was very astonishing but he could not tell what it was there was only one point on which every one was agreed and that was that the barrel must have been part of the cargo of the vessel in distress which had been seen on the sunday evening english ships often brought liquors and wines to Cromport. the day gradually closed in and in the deepening shadows the crowd withdrew but la queue tormented by an idea he had not revealed still stood thinking and as they carried delphin away he still seemed to hear the lad saying in his sing-song voice little casks little casks little casks if you want any 
there's some more left end of section 22section 23 of the jolly parisienne and other novelettes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by indu nair Margot's Gallant by Emile Zola Translated by George D. Cox Chapter 3 Tasting the Drink During that night there came a complete change in the weather and Coqueville awoke the next morning to a bright sun a sea as smooth as a huge piece of green satin and a warm autumn day la queue was the first one to rise his head still full of the dreams of the night for a long time he gazed at the sea in all directions and at last he said with a grumble that after all monsieur mouchel's wants must be satisfied then he set off with Chupin and Brismaud, threatening Margot before he went that he would give her a thrashing if she didn't keep straight. However, when the Zephyr left the harbor and he saw the baleine still swinging at anchor, he became a little better tempered and cried, Hot today, we've got to start as soon as the zephyr was well out to sea la queue dropped his nets overboard and then went to visit his baskets used especially to catch lobsters but despite the calm sea he found every one empty except the last at the bottom of which there was a tiny mackerel which he threw back into the sea in a passion it was a regular fate there were weeks like that when every fish seemed to be avoiding coqueville and it was always those very weeks that monsieur mouchel wanted all that could be caught la queue swore roundly when an hour later he pulled up his nets and found they contained nothing but a bundle of seaweeds and his anger was all the greater since the ocean was perfectly smooth and calm and lay under the blue sky like a sheet of burnished silver the zephyr glided so smoothly over the water that it hardly seemed to be moving at all and la queue finally decided to go back after once more setting his baskets he would visit them again in the afternoon and in awful oaths he threatened to revenge himself on the divinity and all the saints if he found them empty Rouget, Fouas, and Delphin were still asleep, and no one was able to arouse them until just before the midday meal. They could remember nothing, being merely conscious that they had regaled themselves with something strange, with which they had previously been totally unacquainted. That afternoon, as they were all three standing near the harbour, having regained their senses the emperor tried to question them well perhaps it was like brandy with licorice juice in it or rather it was more like sugared rum with a burnt flavour about it they said yes and no and from their answers the emperor suspected that it was ratafia but he would not have sworn to it rouget and his men were all too tired and dazed that day to go fishing besides they knew that la queue had not caught anything in the morning and they talked of waiting till the following day before visiting their lobster traps they were all three sitting on the rocks half asleep when suddenly delphin jumped to his feet crying look there governor 
Over there. What? asked Rouget, stretching his limbs. A barrel. The words were hardly out of his mouth before Rouget and Fouaz were on their feet, eagerly scanning the horizon. Where is it, lad? Where is the barrel? asked Rouget excitedly. Over there, to the left, that black spot. At first, the others could see nothing. Then Rouget muttered an oath. Curse it all! By an oblique ray of the setting sun, he had just seen the barrel, which looked about the size of a bean on the white water, and he at once ran to the baleine, followed by Delphin and Fouaz, who rushed along as fast as their legs would carry them. The baleine was just leaving the harbour when the news that there was a barrel in sight spread through Coqueville. Men, women and children ran down to the beach crying, A barrel! A barrel! Can you see it? Is the current carrying it to Grand Port? Oh yes, there it is to the left. Come along, there's a barrel in sight. And Coqueville hastened down from its rock, the children turning cartwheels on the way, while the women gathered up their petticoats in both hands to get along as quickly as possible. Soon, as on the preceding evening, the whole village was on the beach. Margot had come out for a moment, and had then hastened back to the house to tell the news to her father, who was arguing with the emperor about some municipal matters, and at last Laquier appeared upon the scene, white with passion. Shut up, will you? he exclaimed to the constable. Rouget sent you to me to keep me out of the way, but you'll see he won't get the cask this time. When he saw the baleine three hundred yards out to sea, rowing as hard as it could go towards the black speck in the distance, his rage increased, and pushing Tupin and Prismot into the Zephyr, he in his turn left the harbour, repeating, No, they shan't have it. I'll go to the bottom first. Then Coqueville had the pleasure of seeing an exciting race between the baleine and the Zephyr. When the former saw the other boat put out from the harbour, she understood the danger and made off as quickly as she could go. She may have been about four hundred yards ahead, but the chances were equal, for the Zephyr was the lighter and the quicker craft, and thus the excitement on the beach was at its height. The Mahes and the Floches had instinctively formed into two groups, each member supporting his particular party's boat, as they all eagerly watched the struggle. At first, the baleine kept her advantage, but it was soon seen that the Zephyr was gradually gaining upon her. Then she made a supreme effort and succeeded for some minutes in again increasing the distance between her adversary and herself. But again this distance was diminished, and the Zephyr drew up to her with marvellous rapidity. From that moment it became clear that the two boats would meet just as they both reached the barrel. The victory would depend on an accident on the slightest mistake the baleine wins the baleine wins cried the mahes but suddenly their cries ceased the baleine was almost touching the barrel when the zephyr by a bold manoeuvre succeeded in passing before her and in throwing the barrel to the left where la queue harpooned it with a boat hook hooray for the zephyr screamed the floches the emperor said something about cheating while margot clapped her hands and harsh words were exchanged but the abbe radiguet who had come down to the beach breviary in hand suddenly quieted his parishioners throwing them all into a state of consternation by a profound remark perhaps they'll drink it all up like the others did he said with a melancholy look on the sea 
A violent quarrel was raging between the Baleine and the Zephyr. Rouget stigmatized La Queue as a thief, and the latter retorted by calling the master of the Baleine a scoundrel. The men even took up their oars to strike at one another, and the adventure was within an ace of becoming a naval combat. However, they contented themselves with shaking their fists and oars at one another and threatening to knock all the breath out of each other's body the first time they met on land. The rogue, muttered Rouget, that cask's bigger than the one we caught yesterday, and it's painted yellow. There must be some capital stuff inside. Then he went on, despondingly. Let's go and look at the traps. Perhaps we shall find some lobsters in them. Then the baleen went slowly off towards the little promontory on the left. On board the Zephyr, La Queue had to use all his authority to keep Dupin and Prismode from the barrel. The boat hook had broken one of the hoops, and a red liquid was oozing out, which the two men licked off the tips of their fingers and thought delicious. One glass wouldn't make much difference, surely, but La Queue wouldn't hear of it. He stood the cask on end and said the first who touched it would have him to deal with. He would see about giving them some when they had landed. In that case, asked Tupin, bad-temperedly, aren't we going to take up the traps? Yes, we will. There's no hurry, answered La Queue. He himself was looking longingly at the barrel, and he wanted to go back at once to taste its contents. He couldn't bother about fishing. Bah, he said after a pause. It's getting late, and we had better go back. We'll come again tomorrow. They had turned round when suddenly he caught sight of another barrel on his right a tiny one which was floating on end and turning round and round. That settled the question of fishing, and the zephyr gave chase to the little cask, which was easily caught. Meanwhile, a similar thing had happened to the baleen. Rouget had already visited five traps and found them empty, when Delphin, always on the alert, cried out that he could see something, but it looked too long to be a barrel. It's a beam of wood, said Fouas. Rouget let his sixth lobster trap drop back again before he had quite lifted it out of the water. Well, we'll go and see what it is at any rate, he said. As they advanced, they thought it a plank, a chest, or the trunk of a tree, then they uttered a cry of delight. It was a cask, but a cask such as they had never seen before. It looked like a pipe, swollen in the middle, and closed at both ends by a layer of plaster. Oh, isn't it funny? cried Rouget in delight. I want the emperor to taste this one, so let's go in, boys. They all agreed that they would not touch it and the Belaine returned to Coqueville at the very moment when the Zephyr was anchoring in the harbour. Not one of the inquisitive crowd had left the beach, and this unexpected catch of three barrels was hailed with shouts of joy. Boys threw their caps into the air, and the women ran off to get glasses. It was at once decided to taste the liquors then and there. All wreckage belonged to the whole village, so that no question of proprietorship was raised. But two groups were formed, the Mahes surrounding Rouget and the Floches La Queue. The first glass is for you, Emperor, cried Rouget, and tell us what it is. The fluid was of a bright golden colour, and the constable raised the glass, looked, smelt, and finally decided to drink. That comes from Holland, he said, after a long silence. He added no other information, 
but all the Mahes drank reverentially. The liquor was rather thick and had a flowery taste, which the women thought very nice, though the men would have liked it better if it had not been so sweet. However, the more they drank of it, the more they liked it, and at the third or fourth glass, the men began to get merry and the women funny. In spite of his recent quarrel with the mayor, the emperor now went and hung round the floches. The larger barrel gave forth a dark red liquid, while from the smaller one there issued a stream as white as spring water, and so strong and hot that it burned the tongue. Not one of the floches knew what either the red or the white liquid was, and yet there were some knowing ones among them. It vexed them not to know the name of what they were enjoying. Here, Emperor, taste that, said La Queue at last, thus making the first advance. The Emperor, who was waiting for the invitation, again posed as a connoisseur. There is orange in that, he said, when he had tasted the red. The white, he declared, was not up too much. Everyone had to be contented with these answers, for he put on the happy look of a man who has fully satisfied his audience. The Abbe Radigue was the only person who did not seem convinced. He wanted to know the names. According to his own account, he had the names on the tip of his tongue and could not think of them. To help his memory, he drank several glasses one after the other, saying, as he did so, Wait a minute. I know what it is. I shall be able to tell you presently. The two groups were gradually getting very merry. The floches, especially, were very gay, for they were mixing the liquors. Both floches and mahes kept entirely to themselves and their own barrels, merely casting longing glances at each other from time to time as they felt a desire which they would not confess to taste their neighbor's drink which no doubt was better than their own the two unfriendly brothers chupin and fouas stood side by side all the evening without even shaking their fists at one another and it was also remarked that rouget and his wife were drinking out of the same cup. As for Margot, she was serving the drink to the floches, and as she filled the glasses too full and the liquor ran over on to her hands, she was constantly sucking her fingers, until at last, although she was obeying her father's injunctions not to drink, she became as intoxicated as a woman vintaging. It rather improved her than otherwise, for her face became a rosy pink and her eyes shone like stars. The sun was setting, but the evening was mild and spring-like. Coqueville had emptied the casks, and yet it was not thinking of going in to dinner. It was so pleasant on the beach. When it was dark, Margot, who was sitting apart from everyone else, felt someone breathing on her neck. It was Delpha, who was very lively and who was wandering about behind her on all fours like a wolf. She stifled an exclamation so as not to rouse her father, who would have kicked Delpha away if he had seen him. Go away, you idiot, she whispered, half angry, half laughing. You'll be caught. End of section 23
by Emile Zola. Translated by George D. Cox. Chapter 4 More Jollification. Coqueville did not awake on the following day until the sun was well above the horizon. It was warmer even than before and the sea lay dozing under a cloudless sky. In fact, it was just the sort of day when most pleasure is to be found in being absolutely idle. Until lunchtime, Coqueville rested after the treat of the evening before. Then everyone went down to the beach to keep a lookout, and that Wednesday, fishing, Madame Dufault and Monsieur Mouchel were all forgotten. La Queue and Roger did not even speak of going to pull up their baskets. About three o'clock, some casks were sighted. Four were dancing on the waves opposite the village. Both the Zephyr and the Baleine gave chase, but there was no dispute, as there was enough for all, and each boat had its share. After sailing over every inch of the little gulf, Rouget and La Queue came back at six o'clock with three barrels each, and again the festival began. The women had brought out some tables to be more comfortable, then seats were brought, and two open-air cafés, such as there are at Grand Port, were at once established. The Mahés were on the left, and the Floches on the right, and between them there was a heap of sand. That evening, the emperor went from one group to the other with full glasses in his hands, that everyone might taste the contents of all six barrels. By nine o'clock, the scene was a much more gay and festive one than that of the evening before, and the next day, try as it would, Coqueville could not remember how it managed to get to bed. On the Thursday, the Zephyr and the Baleine only took two barrels each, but those were huge ones. On Friday, the catch was superb and quite beyond everyone's hopes. Seven barrels were brought to land, three by Rouget, four by La Queue. Then came golden hours for Coqueville no one did any work the fishermen lay in bed till noon sleeping off their potations of the night before and then sauntered down to the beach and gazed at the sea their only anxiety was as to the kind of liquor the tide was going to bring them and they stood on the sand for hours giving shouts of delight as soon as any wreckage appeared the women and the children stood on top of the rocks and pointed out everything floating on the water, even to the smallest bundle of seaweed, and the Zephyr and the Baleine were kept in readiness to go out to sea at any moment. They set off and tacked about the gulf, fishing for casks as they might have done for tunny quite despising the mackerel which leaped in the sunlight and the soles which floated lazily along at the top of the water. Coqueville watched the fishers from the shore and burst its sides with laughing. Then, in the evening, the catch was drunk. What delighted Coqueville most was that the supply of casks did not cease the wrecked vessel must have had a large cargo and coqueville now selfish and gay joked about the lost ship which folks said was a regular wine cellar containing enough liquor to intoxicate all the fish in the sea they never caught two barrels alike the casks were of all shapes sizes and colors and each contained a different liquid the emperor fell into profound reveries. He, who had drunk everything, could no longer give an opinion. And La Queue himself declared he had never seen such a cargo. 
the abbe radiguet believed it had been destined for some savage king who had wished to stock his cellar but the rest of coqueville no longer even tried to find out what they were drinking the elder ladies preferred the liquors flavored with mocha peppermint and vanilla and marie rouget drank so much aniseed one evening that it made her perfectly ill margot and the other young ladies devoted themselves to curaçao benedictine trappistine and chartreuse while the cases was given to the children the men were naturally most pleased when the catch included cognac rum or gin a barrel of raki from chio stupefied coqueville who thought it had got hold of a cask of turpentine all the same it was drunk because it is not right to waste anything but it was talked about for a long time batavian arak swedish brandy romanian suica calagaresca servian slivovitz also upset all coquevillian ideas about what was fit to drink but there was a general leaning towards kummel and kirsch liquors clear as water and strong enough to kill a man how could so many good things have been invented at coqueville brandy had been the only drink known and all the inhabitants were not even acquainted with that a veritable worship for this inexhaustible variety of intoxicants began to spring up oh to get drunk every evening on something different and of which even the name was unknown it seemed like a fairy tale in which there is a magic fountain spouting forth strange alcoholic liquids perfumed and flavoured with all the flowers and fruits in creation as has been said there were seven barrels on the sands on friday evening coqueville now simply lived on the beach which thanks to the mildness of the weather it could do with comfort never had there been so fine a week in september the feast had lasted since monday and there was no reason why it should not last for ever if only providence for in this affair the abbe radiguet discerned the finger of providence would continue to send them casks all work was suspended and every one for the time being was a gentleman and a gentleman who drank expensive liquors without having to pay for them coqueville put its hands in its pockets and basked in the sun while it waited for the evening carols besides it was never sober one after another it tried the joys of kummel kirsch and ratafia and in the course of a week it had experienced the angers of gin the soft-heartedness of curaçao and the laughter of brandy for coqueville in the innocent way of a new-born child thankfully drank whatever heaven sent it it was on the friday that the mahes and the flushes fraternized every one was merry that evening and even on the night before the distance between the two groups had been lessened for the most intoxicated had trodden down the heap of sand and now there was only about a foot of it between the two parties the floches were emptying their four casks while the mahes were making an end of three little barrels of liquors the colours of which were the same as those of the french flag red white and blue the flushes were filled with envy and jealousy whenever they saw the blue for a blue liquor seemed to them something really wonderful and at last la queue who had turned quite good-natured now that he was never sober came forward glass in hand thinking that it was his place as mayor to make the first advance i say rouget he stuttered will you drink with me certainly replied rouget whose emotion made him reel they fell on each other's necks and every one wept the scene was so touching then the mahes and the floches 
who had been ready to cut each other up for the last three hundred years kissed and shook each other by the hand and the abbe radiguet who was very much affected again spoke of the finger of providence then they all toasted one another in the red white and blue liquors and the emperor cried here's to france the blue was not up to much and the white was hardly any better but the red met with great approval the floches barrels were next attacked and then a dance was got up as there was no music some of the young fellows whistled and clapped their hands to keep time and the girls danced with spirit the spree was really assuming magnificent proportions the seven casks were placed side by side and every one took what he liked best those who had had enough lay down on the sand and slept for a little while and when they woke up began to drink again the number of dancers increased and the ball was continued until midnight the waves broke on the beach with a faint noise the stars were shining in a deep blue sky it was like the peacefulness of a newly created world around a tribe of savages intoxicated by their first draught of brandy however when there was nothing left to drink coqueville at last went indoors floches and mahes helping one another to the best of their ability and ending by somehow finding their beds on the saturday the spree was kept up till nearly two o'clock in the morning six casks two of which were huge ones had been caught that day and during the evening fouas and chupin almost came to blows chupin who was very bad-tempered when he was drunk talked of making an end of his brother but this quarrel shocked everybody floches as well as mahes was there any sense in still disagreeing when all the village had made it up and forgotten old scores the two brothers were forced to drink together and as they still looked sulky the emperor determined to keep his eye on them the rougets did not get on very well together either when marie had drunk some aniseed liquor she lavished endearments on brismont which rouget was unable to witness unmoved besides drink made him tender and affectionate and he wanted to be loved and caressed himself it was in vain that the abbe radiguet exhorted them to be forgiving bah said la queue you'll see they'll make it up if there's a good catch to-morrow your health still la queue himself was not perfect he had not ceased to watch delphin and as soon as he saw him near margot he gave him a kick this made the emperor very indignant for it was not reasonable to prevent two young people laughing together but la queue still swore that he would kill margot rather than give her to the boy besides margot herself did not want him you don't do you you are too proud ever to marry a beggar aren't you he cried yes papa answered margot on saturday margot drank a great deal of some syrupy liquor and as she had no idea of its strength she soon found herself sitting on the ground beside the cask she sat there laughing to herself for she felt as if she were in paradise she could see stars around her and it seemed as if dance music were being played inside her head while she was like this delphin slipped into the shadow of the barrel and taking her hand asked tell me margot will you she still smiled finally she answered it's papa who won't hear of it oh that doesn't matter said the lad old people you know are always against it but if you are willing and getting bolder he dropped a kiss on her neck 
She drew up her head, but a little shiver ran all down her back. " Have done ! You tickle me !" she exclaimed. But she no longer said anything about boxing his ears ; in the first place, because she would not have been able to do so, her hands felt so lazy, and secondly, because she liked to have her neck kissed. It made her feel deliciously drowsy, like the liquors, and after a time she began moving her head and holding out her chin, like a cat who wants to be caressed. There, just under the ear, she murmured, oh, that's lovely. They both forgot La Queue, but fortunately the emperor was on the watch. Look there, your reverence, he said, pointing out the couple to the Abbe Radiguet. It would be better to marry them. It certainly would, answered the priest. He undertook to speak to La Queue on the subject the following day. In the meantime, La Queue had drunk so much that the emperor and the priest had to carry him home. On the way they tried to talk to him, but they could get nothing from him but a grunt. Behind them walked Delphin with Margot on his arm. By four o'clock the next day, the Zephyr and the Baleine had hooked up seven barrels. By six o'clock, the Zephyr had found two more, which made nine altogether, and Coqueville had a merry Sunday. It was the seventh day running that it had been drunk, and the spree was perfect, such a spree as had never been seen before and would never be seen again. Just mention it in Lower Normandy, and people will answer you with a laugh. Ah, yes, we know all about the spree at Coqueville. End of section 24「Section 25 of the Jolie Parisienne and Other Novelets – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Indu Nair Margot's Gallant by Emile Zola Translated by George D. Cox Chapter 5 General Happiness After the Tuesday, Monsieur Michel was very much astonished to see neither Rouget nor La Queue arrive at Grandport. What the deuce could the rascals be thinking of? The sea was calm and the catch must have been enormous. Perhaps, though, they wanted to bring a regular cargo of lobsters and soles all at once, and he patiently waited until Wednesday. On Wednesday, Monsieur Mouchel began to get angry. It must be stated that Madame Dufeu was not a good-tempered woman. At the least thing she flew into a rage, and although Mouchel was a big, strong, handsome fellow, he trembled before her. All the more as he aimed at marrying her later on, and was always on the alert to anticipate and gratify her wishes, meaning to make up for his present life if he ever became the master. Now, on the Wednesday morning, Madame Dufeu stormed and complained that they were missing the market for want of fish, and she accused Michel of running after girls instead of giving his attention to the whiting and mackerel, which they ought to have had in abundance. Then Monsieur Michel, in his vexation, shielded himself behind the strange failure of the cockwill fishers. For a moment, surprise struck Madame Dufeu dumb. What could Coqueville be dreaming about? It had never done such a thing before. Then she declared that she didn't care about Coqueville, 
that it was M. Mouchel's business to look after the supply, and that she would do so herself if he allowed the fisherman to take him in again. Mouchel heartily wished Rouget and La Queue at the devil, but perhaps, after all, they would come on the morrow. But on the next day, which was Thursday, neither one nor the other appeared, and M. Mouchel, in despair, went up in the evening to the rocks on the left of Cromport, whence Coqueville and its stretch of yellow sand can be seen. For a long time he gazed. The village looked perfectly tranquil. The smoke was ascending from the chimneys, and no doubt the women were getting their dinners ready as usual. When M. Michel had ascertained that Coqueville still existed, and that no rock from the cliff had fallen and crushed it, he felt more puzzled than ever. But as he was just about to go down again, he thought, he discerned two black specks in the bay, the baleine and the zephyr. Then he returned to soothe Madame Dufeu. Coqueville was fishing. The night passed, however, and Friday dawned, but still no news came from Coqueville. Monsieur Mouchel climbed upon his rocks a dozen times. He was beginning to lose his head. Madame Dufeu treated him shamefully, and he could find nothing to say to her. Coqueville still lay basking in the sun, like a lazy lizard. Only there was no longer any smoke. The village seemed dead. Could all the inhabitants have perished without anyone knowing of it? There was indeed a black mass moving on the shore, but that might be seaweeds tossed about by the waves. No news on Saturday. Madame Dufeu no longer stormed, but her eyes were fixed and her lips white. Monsieur Mouchel stayed two hours on the rock, feeling an ever-increasing desire to find out for himself the reason of the strange stillness of the village. Those houses, sleeping so quietly in the sun, irritated him, and he made up his mind to start off very early on Monday morning so as to be at the village by nine o'clock. Coqueville was not within walking distance, but Monsieur Mouchel preferred to go by land so that he might catch the village unawares. A carriage took him to Robigneux, where he left it under a shed, for it would have been dangerous to take it through the ravines and the defiles. Then he cheerfully set off to walk some seven miles along the most abominable roads imaginable though they are surrounded by a landscape full of wild beauty. The path, so narrow that in places three men could not walk abreast, goes winding down between enormous walls of rock. Then, a little further on, it passes between some precipices. Then the ravine suddenly widens, and through the opening one catches glimpses of the sea. But M. Mouchel was in no mood to admire scenery, and he only swore when the pebbles rolled away from beneath his feet. It was all Coqueville's fault, and he promised himself to call those vagabonds to account. But while he pondered, he had drawn near the end of his journey, and suddenly, as he turned round a rock, he came upon the twenty houses perched on the side of the cliff and forming the village. Nine o'clock was striking. It might have been June. The sky was so blue and clear. It was a magnificent day, indeed, and there was a soft breeze which brought with it the pleasant smell of the sea. Monsieur Michel turned down the one street which the village possessed and down which he had so often walked before and as he passed rouget's house he looked in it was empty then he went to fouasse's to tupin's 
and to Brismotes. Not a soul to be found. All the doors were open, but there was no one in the rooms. What did it mean? A slight shiver ran over him. Then he bethought him of the authorities. The emperor would surely be able to tell what had happened. But the emperor's house was empty, like the others. Even the constable was missing. This silent and deserted village frightened him now. He ran to the mayor's, but there another surprise awaited him. Everything was in a terrible litter. The beds had not been made for the last three days. Dirty china was lying about, and the chairs were overturned, as though there had been a fight. Monsieur Michel felt thoroughly upset, but he determined to go through to the end. He visited the church, but there was no priest to be found any more than any mayor. All the authorities, both civil and religious, had disappeared, and Coqueville was utterly forsaken. There was not even a dog or a cat or a fowl about the place. There was only emptiness and silence under the vast blue sky. It was not astonishing, then, that Coqueville had not brought its fish. Coqueville had removed. Coqueville was dead. And the police must be informed. Monsieur Mouchel was working himself into a state of great excitement over this mysterious catastrophe when he thought of going down to the beach. And at the sight he saw there, he uttered a cry of surprise. The entire population of the village was lying on the sand. At first, he thought there had been a general massacre, but the deep snores soon undeceived him. Coqueville had kept up the spree so late on Sunday night that it had found it utterly impossible to go to bed, so it had slept on the sand, lying just where it had fallen round the nine barrels, which were quite empty. Yes, all Coqueville was snoring there, men, women, old folks and children, some were on their backs, others on their stomachs. Not one was on his feet. They lay about like a handful of leaves scattered by the wind. Some of the men had their heels higher than their heads. Some of the women's clothes had blown aside. It was like an open-air dormitory, where the members of a family lie at their ease. Where there is any ceremony, there is no pleasure. The moon had happened to be a new one, and Coqueville, thinking it had blown out the candle, had fallen asleep in the dark. Then day had dawned, and now the sun was shining full on the sleepers' faces, though their eyelids did not even quiver. They were sleeping sweetly and soundly, with a happy expression on their drink-bloated countenances, in the utter innocence of a complete state of fuddle. The fowls must have come down early in the morning and pecked at the barrels, for they too were lying in the sand drunk, and there were even five cats and three dogs on their backs, with their paws in the air, tipsy from having licked the syrup remaining in Coqueville's glasses. For a few minutes, Monsieur Mouchel walked amidst these sleepers taking care to tread on nobody. He understood what had happened, for some casks from the wreck of an English vessel had also been washed up at Grandport. All his anger had evaporated. What a touching and moral spectacle lay before him. Coqueville reconciled. The Mahes and the Floches lying side by side. For... At the last glass, the bitterest enemies had embraced each other. Chupin and Fouas were snoring hand in hand, like brothers incapable of ever again disputing over an inheritance. And the Rouget couple formed a most amiable picture, 
for marie was slumbering tranquilly between rouget and brismont as if to indicate that henceforth they would all live happily together and never have a quarrel again but one group in particular afforded an affecting scene of family affection it was formed of delphin and margot who were lying with their arms round one another's necks at their feet the emperor was stretched as if watching over them and just above them la queue was snoring like a father well pleased at having settled his daughter's future while the abbe radiguet who had dropped on the sand like the others lay with outstretched arms as though to bless them all it was a picture touching in the extreme the memorable spree ended with a wedding a little later on and m mouchel himself married madame du feu whom he beat most unmercifully as was to be expected just mention the affair in lower normandy and people will answer with a laugh ah yes we know all about the spree at coqueville End of section 25section 26 of the jolly parisians and other novelettes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by brandon weston marguerite by emile zola translated by george d cox chapter 1 alive in death it was on a saturday at 6 in the morning that i died after a three days illness my wife was searching a trunk for some linen and when she rose and turned she saw me rigid with open eyes and silent pulses she ran to me fancying i had fainted touched my hands and bent over me then she suddenly grew alarmed burst into tears and stammered my god my god he is dead i heard everything but the deadened sounds seemed to come from a great distance my left eye still perceived a faint glimmer, a whitish light in which all objects melted, but my right eye was quite bereft of sight. It was the coma of my whole being, as if a thunderbolt had struck me. My will was annihilated. Not a fiber of my flesh obeyed my bidding. And yet amid the impotency of my inert limbs my thoughts subsisted, sluggish and lazy, still perfectly clear. My poor Marguerite was crying. She had dropped on her knees beside the bed, repeating in heart-rending tones, He is dead. My God, he is dead. Was this strange state of torpor, this immobility of the flesh, really death, although the functions of the intellect were not arrested? Was my soul only lingering for a brief space before it soared away forever? From my childhood upwards I had been subject to hysterical attacks, and twice, in early youth, I had nearly succumbed to nervous fevers. By degrees all those who surrounded me had got accustomed to consider me an invalid and to see me sickly, so much so that I myself had forbidden my wife to call the doctor when I had taken to my bed on the day of our arrival at the cheap lodging house of the Rue Dauphine in Paris. A little rest would soon set me right again. It was only the fatigue of the journey which had caused my intolerable weariness and yet I was conscious of having felt singularly uneasy. We had left our province somewhat abruptly. We were very poor, and had barely enough money to support ourselves till I drew my first month's salary in the office where I had obtained a station, and now a sudden seizure was carrying me off. Was it really death? I had pictured to myself a darker night, a deeper silence. As a little child I had already felt afraid to die. Being weak and compassionately petted by every one, I had concluded that I had not long to live, that I should soon be buried, and the thought of the cold earth filled me with a dread I could not master, a dread which haunted me day and night. As I grew older the same terror pursued me. Sometimes, after long hours spent in reasoning with myself, I thought that I had conquered my fear. I reflected, after all, what does it matter? one dies and it is over it is the common fate 
nothing could be better or easier. I then prided myself on being able to look death boldly in the face, but suddenly a shiver would freeze my blood, my dizzying anguish returned as if a giant hand had swung me over a black abyss. It was the vision of the earth returning and setting reason at naught. How often at night have I started up in bed, not knowing what cold breath had swept over my slumbers, clasping my despairing hands and moaning, must I die? In those moments an icy horror would stop my pulses, while an appalling vision of dissolution rose before me. It was with difficulty that I could get to sleep again. Indeed, sleep alarmed me. It so closely resembled death. If I closed my eyes, they might never open again. I might slumber on forever. I cannot tell if others have endured the same torture. I only know that my own life has been made a torment by it. Death has risen between me and all I love. I can remember how the thought of it poisoned the happiest moments I spent with Marguerite. During the first months of our married life, when she lay sleeping by my side and I dreamed of a fair future for her and with her, the foreboding of a fatal separation dashed my hopes aside and embittered my delights. Perhaps we should be parted on the morrow, nay, perhaps in an hour's time. Then utter discouragement assailed me. I wondered what the bliss of being united availed me if it were to end in so cruel a disruption. My morbid imagination reveled in scenes of mourning. I speculated as to who would be the first to depart, Marguerite or I. Either alternative caused me harrowing grief, and tears rose to my eyes at the thought of our shattered lives. At the happiest periods of my existence I have fallen a prey to grim dejection which nobody could understand, but which was caused by the thought of impending nihility. When I was most successful I was to general wonder most depressed. The fatal question, what avails it, rang like a knell in my ears. But the sharpest sting of this torment was that it came with a secret sense of shame, the inability of confiding my thoughts to another. Husband and wife, lying side by side in a darkened room, may be shaken by the same shudder and yet remain mute. For people do not mention death any more than they pronounce certain prohibited words. Fear makes it nameless. I was musing thus while my dear Marguerite knelt sobbing at my feet. It grieved me sorely not to be able to comfort her by telling her I suffered no pain. If death were merely the annihilation of the flesh, I had been foolish to harbor so much dread. I experienced a selfish repose, a restfulness in which all my cares were forgotten. My memory had become extraordinarily vivid. My whole life passed rapidly before me like a play in which I no longer acted a part. It was a curious and enjoyable sensation. I seemed to hear a far-off voice relating my own history. I especially saw a peculiar spot in the country near Garonde, on the road to Piriac. The road turns sharply, a scattered wood of pines carelessly dots a rocky slope. When I was seven years old I used to pass through those pines with my father as far as the crumbling old house where Marguerite's parents gave me pancakes. They were salt gatherers and earned a scanty livelihood by working the adjacent salt marshes. Then I remembered the school at Nantes where I had grown up, leading a monotonous life within the ancient walls and yearning for the broad horizon of Gironde and the salt marshes stretching to the limitless sea widening under the sky. Then came a blank. My father was dead. I entered the hospital as a clerk to the managing board and led a dreary life with one solitary diversion, my Sunday visits to the old house on the Piriac Road. The salt works were doing badly. Poverty reigned in the land, and Marguerite's parents were nearly penniless. Marguerite, when merely a child, had been fond of me because I made her ride in a wheelbarrow, but on the morning when I asked her in marriage she shrank from me with a frightened gesture, and I realized that she thought me hideous. Her parents, however, consented at once. They looked upon my offer as a godsend, and the daughter submissively acquiesced. When she became accustomed to the idea of marrying me, she did not seem to dislike it so much. On our wedding day at Gironde, the rain fell in torrents, and when we got home my bride had to take off her dress, which was soaked through, and sit in her petticoats. 
That was all the youth I ever had. We did not remain long in our province. One day I found my wife in tears. She was miserable. Life was so dull, she wanted to get away. Six months later I had saved a little money by taking in extra work after office hours, and through the influence of a friend of my father's, I obtained a petty appointment in Paris. I started off to settle there with the dear little woman, so that she might not cry any more. During the night which we spent in the third-class railway carriage, the seats being very hard, I took her in my arms so that she might sleep. That was the past, and now I had just died on the narrow bed of a Paris lodging house, and my wife was crouching on the floor and crying bitterly. The white light before my left eye was growing dim, but I remembered the room perfectly. On the left there was a chest of drawers, on the right a mantelpiece surmounted by a damaged clock without a pendulum, the hands of which marked ten minutes past ten. The window gave on the Rue Dauphine, a long dark street. All Paris seemed to pass below, and the noise was so great that the window shook. We knew no one in the city. We had hurried our departure, but I was not expected at the office till the following Monday. Since I had taken to my bed, I had wondered at my imprisonment in this narrow room into which we had tumbled after a railway journey of fifteen hours, followed by a hurried, confusing transit through the noisy streets. My wife had nursed me with smiling tenderness, but I knew that she was anxious. She would walk to the window, glance out and return to the bedside, looking very pale and startled by the sight of the busy thoroughfare, the aspect of the vast city of which she did not know a single stone, and which deafened her with its continuous roar. What would happen to her if I never woke up again, alone, friendless, and unknowing as she was? Marguerite had seized hold of one of my hands, which lay passive on the coverlet, and covering it with kisses, she repeated wildly, Olivier, answer me. Oh, my God, he is dead, dead. So death was not complete annihilation. I could hear and think. I had been uselessly alarmed all these years. I had not dropped into utter vacancy as I had anticipated. I could not realize the disappearance of my being, the suppression of all that I had been, without the possibility of renewed existence. I had been wont to shudder whenever in any book or newspaper I came across a date of a hundred years hence, a date at which I should no longer be alive, a future which I should never see, filled me with unspeakable uneasiness. Was I not the whole world, and would not the universe crumble away when I was no more? To dream of life and death had been a cherished vision, but this could not possibly be death. I should assuredly wake presently. Yes, in a few moments I would lean over, take Marguerite in my arms, and dry her tears. I would rest a little while longer before going to my office. A new life would begin, brighter than the last. However, I did not feel impatient. The commotion had been too strong. It was wrong of Marguerite to give way like that when I had not even the strength to turn my head on the pillow and smile at her. The next time that she moaned out, He is dead, dead. I would embrace her and murmur softly so as not to startle her. No, my darling, I was only asleep. You see, I am alive, and I love you. End of section 26section twenty seven of the jolly parisians and other novelettes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by brandon weston marguerite by emile zola translated by george d cox chapter two the last hope marguerite's cries had attracted attention for the door opened brusquely, and a voice exclaimed, "'What is the matter, neighbor? Is he worse?' I recognized the voice. It belonged to an elderly woman, Madame Gabin, who occupied a room on the same floor. She had been most obliging since our arrival, and had evidently become interested in our concerns. On her own side she had lost no time in telling us her history." A stern landlord had sold her furniture during the preceding winter to pay himself his rent, and since then she had resided at the lodging-house in the Rue Dauphine with her daughter Dede, a child of ten. 
They both cut and pinked lampshades, and between them they earned at best but two francs a day. Heavens, is it all over? cried Madame Gabin. I realized that she was drawing nearer. She examined me, touched me, and turning to Marguerite, murmured compassionately, Poor girl, poor girl. My wife, wearied out, was sobbing like a child. Madame Gabin lifted her, placed her in a dilapidated armchair near the fireplace, and proceeded to comfort her. Indeed, you'll do yourself harm if you go on like this, my dear. It's no reason because your husband is gone that you should kill yourself with weeping. Sure enough, when I lost Gabin, I was just like you. I remained three days without swallowing a morsel of food. But that didn't help me. On the contrary, it pulled me down. Come, for the Lord's sake, be sensible. By degrees, Marguerite grew calmer. She was exhausted, and it was only at intervals that she gave way to a fresh flow of tears. Meanwhile, the old woman had taken possession of the room with a sort of rough authority. Don't worry yourself, she said as she bustled about. Neighbors must help each other. Luckily, Dede has just gone to take the work home. Ah, I see. Your trunks are not yet all unpacked, but I suppose there is some linen in the drawers, isn't there? I heard her pull a drawer open. She must have taken out a napkin, which she spread on a little table at the bedside. She then struck a match, which made me think that she was lighting one of the candles on the mantelpiece, and placing it near me as a religious rite. I could follow her movements in the room, and divine all her actions. Poor gentleman, she muttered. Luckily I heard you sobbing, poor dear. Suddenly the vague light which my left eye had detected vanished. Madame Gabin had just closed my eyelids, but I had not felt her finger on my face. When I realized this I felt chilled. The door had opened again, and Dede, the child of ten, now rushed in, calling in her shrill voice, Mother! Mother! Ah, I knew you would be here. Look here, here's the money. Three francs, four sous. I took back three dozen lampshades. Hush, hush, hold your tongue, vainly repeated the mother, who, as the little girl chatted on, must have pointed to the bed, for I guessed that the child felt perplexed and was backing against the door. Is the gentleman asleep? she whispered. Yes, yes, go and play, said Madame Gabin. But the child did not go. She was, no doubt, staring at me with widely opened eyes, startled and vaguely comprehending. Suddenly she seemed convulsed with a wild terror and ran out, upsetting a chair. He's dead, mother, he's dead, she gasped. A profound silence followed. Marguerite, half lying in the armchair, had left off her crying. Madame Gabin was still rummaging about the room and talking under her breath. Children know everything nowadays. Look at that brat. Heaven knows how carefully she's brought up. When I send her on an errand or to take the shades back, I calculate the time to a minute so that she can't loaf about. But for all that, there isn't a thing she don't know. She saw at a glance what happened here, and yet I never showed her but one corpse, her uncle Francois, and she was then only four years old. Ah, well, there are no children left. It can't be helped. She paused, and without any transition passed to another subject. I say, dearie, we must think of the formalities. There's the declaration at the municipal offices, and the seeing about the funeral. You are not in a fit state to attend to business. What do you say to my looking in at Monsieur Simoneau's and finding out if he's at home? Marguerite did not reply. I seemed to watch her from afar, and at times to change into a subtle flame hovering about the room, while a stranger lay heavy and unconscious on my bed. I wish that Marguerite had declined the assistance of Simoneau. I had seen him three or four times during my brief illness, for he occupied a room close to ours, and had been civil and neighborly. Madame Gabin had told us that he was merely making a short stay in Paris, having come to collect some old debts due to his father who had settled in the country and recently died. He was a tall, strong, handsome young fellow, and I hated him, perhaps on account of his healthy appearance. On the previous evening he had come in, and I had disliked seeing him at Marguerite's side. She had looked so fair and pretty and he had gazed so intently into her face when she seemingly thanked him for his inquiries. 
Ah, here is Monsieur Simoneau, said Madame Gabin, introducing him. He gently pushed the door ajar, and as soon as Marguerite saw him enter, she burst into a passion of tears. The presence of a friend, of the only person she knew in Paris beside the old woman, recalled her bereavement. I could not see the young man, but in the darkness that encompassed me, I conjured up his appearance. I pictured him distinctly, grave and sad at finding poor Marguerite in such distress. How lovely she must have looked with her golden hair unbound, her pale face and her dear little baby hands burning with fever. I am at your disposal, madame, he gently said. Pray, allow me to manage everything. She only answered with broken words, but as the young man was leaving, accompanied by Madame Gabin, I heard the latter mention money. These things were always expensive. She feared that the poor little body hadn't a farthing. Anyhow, he might ask her. But Simoneau silenced the old woman. He did not want to have the widow worried. He was going to the municipal offices and to the undertakers. When silence reigned once more, I wondered if this nightmare would last much longer. I was certainly alive, for I was conscious of passing incidents, and I began to realize my condition. I must have fallen into one of those cataleptic states I had read of. As a child I had suffered from syncopes, which had lasted several hours, but surely my heart would soon commence to beat anew, my blood to circulate, my muscles to relax. Yes, I should wake up and comfort Marguerite, and reasoning thus I tried to be patient. Time passed. Madame Gabin had brought in her breakfast, but Marguerite refused to taste any food. Later on the afternoon waned. Through the open window I heard the rising clamor of the Rue Dauphine. By and by a slight ring of the brass candlestick on the marble top table informed me that a fresh candle had been lighted. At last Simoneau returned. Well, whispered the old woman. It is all settled, he answered. The funeral is ordered for tomorrow at eleven. There is nothing for you to do, and you needn't talk of these things before the poor lady. Nevertheless, Madame Gabin remarked, the doctor of the dead has not come yet simoneau took a seat beside marguerite and after a few words of encouragement remained silent the funeral was to take place at eleven these words rang out in my brain like a passing bell and the doctor was coming the doctor of the dead as madame gabin had called him he could not fail to find out that i was only in a state of lethargy he would do whatever was necessary to rouse me so I longed for his arrival with feverish anxiety. The day was drawing to a close. Madame Gabin, anxious not to waste any time, had brought in her lampshades and summoned Dede without asking Marguerite's permission. To tell the truth, as she observed, she did not like to leave children too long alone. Come in, I say, she whispered to the little girl. Come in and don't be frightened. And mind you, don't look toward the bed, or you'll catch it. She thought it more delicate to forbid Dede to look at me, but I was convinced that the child was furtively glancing at the corner where I lay, for every now and then I heard her mother rap her knuckles sharply and repeat angrily, Go on with your work, or you shall leave the room, and the gentleman will come in the night and pull you by the feet. The mother and daughter had sat down at our table. I could plainly hear the click of their scissors as they clipped the lampshades, which, no doubt, required very delicate manipulation, for they did not work rapidly. I counted the shades one by one as they were laid aside, while my anxiety grew more and more intense. The click of the scissors was the only noise in the room, so I concluded that Marguerite had been overcome by fatigue and was dozing. Thrice Simoneau rose up, and the torturing thought flashed through me that he might be taking advantage of her slumbers to touch her hair with his lips. I hardly knew the man, and yet I felt that he loved my wife. At last little Dede began to giggle, and her laugh exasperated me. "'Why are you sniggering, you idiot?' asked her mother. "'Do you want to be turned out on the landing? Come out with it. What makes you laugh so?' The child stammered. She had not laughed. She had only coughed. But I felt certain that she had seen Simoneau bending over Marguerite, and had felt amused. The lamp had been lit when a knock was heard. "'It must be the doctor at last,' said the old woman." It was the doctor. He did not apologize for coming so late, for he had, no doubt, ascended many flights of stairs during the day. The room being but imperfectly lighted by the lamp, he inquired, Is the body here? Yes, it is. 
answered Simoneau. Marguerite had risen, trembling violently. Madame Gabin dismissed Dede, saying it was useless that a child should be present, and she then tried to lead my wife to the window to spare her the sight of what was about to take place. The doctor quickly approached the bed. I guessed that he was bored, tired, and impatient. Had he touched my wrist? Had he placed his hand on my heart? I could not tell, but I fancied that he had only carelessly bent over me. "'Shall I bring the lamp so that you may see better?' said Simoneau, obligingly. "'No, it is not necessary,' quietly answered the doctor. "'Not necessary? That man held my life in his hands, and he did not think it worth while to proceed to a careful examination? I was not dead. I wanted to cry out that I was not dead. At what o'clock did he die?' asked the doctor. "'At six this morning,' volunteered Simoneau. A feeling of frenzy and rebellion rose within me, bound as I was in seemingly iron chains. Oh, for the power of uttering one word, of moving a single limb. This close weather is unhealthy, resumed the doctor. Nothing is more trying in these early spring days. And then he moved away. It was my life departing. Screams, sobs, and insults were choking me, struggling in my convulsed throat, in which even my breath was arrested. The wretch, turned into a machine by his professional habits, he only came to a deathbed to accomplish a perfunctory formality. He knew nothing. His science was a lie, since he could not at a glance distinguish life from death. And he was going, going. "'Good night, sir,' said Simoneau. There came a silence. The doctor was probably bowing to Marguerite, who had turned while Madame Gabin was fastening the window. He left the room, and I heard his footsteps descending the stairs. It was all over. I was condemned. My last hope had vanished with that man. If I did not wake before eleven tomorrow, I should be buried alive. The horror of that thought was so great that I lost all consciousness of my surroundings. It was something like a fainting fit in death. The last sound I heard was the little click of the scissors handled by Madame Gabin and Dede. The funeral vigil had begun. Nobody spoke. Marguerite had refused to retire to rest in the neighbor's room. She remained half lying in her armchair, with her beautiful pale face, her closed eyes, and long eyelashes wet with tears, while before her in the shadow, Simoneau sat silently watching her. End of section 27「Section 28 of the Jolly Parisians and Other Novelettes This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brandon Weston. Marguerite by Emile Zola. Translated by George D. Cox. Chapter 3. The Funeral. I cannot describe my agony during the morning of the next day. I remember it as a hideous dream in which my impressions were ghastly and confused. The persistent yearning for a sudden awakening increased my torture, and as the hour for the funeral drew near, my anguish became more poignant still. It was only at daybreak that I had recovered the fuller consciousness of what was going on around me. The creaking of hinges first startled me out of my stupor. Madame Gabin had just opened the window. It must have been about seven o'clock, for I heard the cries of costermongers in the street, a shrill voice of a girl offering groundsel and the hoarse voice of a man shouting, Carrots! The clamorous awakening of Paris pacified me at first. I could not believe that I should be laid under the sod in midst of so much life, and then a sudden thought helped to calm me. It had just occurred to me that I had witnessed a similar case to my own while I was employed at the hospital of Gironde. A man had been sleeping for twenty-eight hours, the doctors remaining uncertain and hesitating before his apparent lifelessness, when suddenly he sat up in bed, was almost at once able to rise. I myself had already been asleep for some twenty-five hours. If I awoke at ten, I should still be in time. I endeavored to make out who was in the room and what was going on there. Dede must have been playing on the landing, for once when the door opened I heard her shrill, childish laughter outside. Simoneau must have retired, 
for nothing indicated his presence. Madame Gabin's slipshod tread was still audible over the floor. At last she spoke. Come, my dear, she said. You are wrong not to take it while it is hot. It would cheer you up. She was addressing Marguerite, and the slow trickling of drops through a filter indicated that she had been making some coffee. I don't mind owning, she continued, that I needed it. At my age, sitting up is trying. The night seems so dreary when there is a misfortune in the house. Do have a cup of coffee, my dear, just a drop. She persuaded Marguerite to taste it. Isn't it nice and hot? she continued. And don't it set you up? Ah, you'll be wanting all your strength presently for what you've got to go through today. Now, if you were sensible, you'd step into my room and just wait there. No, I want to stay here, said Marguerite resolutely. Her voice, which I had not heard since the previous evening, touched me strangely. It was changed and broken with tears. To feel my dear wife near me was a last consolation. I knew that her eyes were fastened on me, and that she wept with all the anguish of her heart. The minutes were flying. An inexplicable noise sounded from beyond the door. It seemed as if some people were bringing a bulky piece of furniture upstairs and knocking it against the walls as they did so. Suddenly I understood, as I heard Marguerite begin to sob. It was the coffin. "'You are too early,' said Madame Gabin crossly. "'Put it behind the bed.' What o'clock was it? Nine, perhaps? So the coffin had come. Amid the opaque night around me I could see it plainly, quite new, with roughly planed boards. Heavens! Was this the end, then? Was I to be born off in that box which I realized was lying at my feet?' However, I had one supreme joy. Marguerite, in spite of her weakness, insisted upon discharging all the last offices. Assisted by the old woman, she dressed me with all the tenderness of a wife and a sister. Once more I felt myself in her arms as she clothed me in various garments. She paused at times. Overcome by grief, she clasped me convulsively, and her tears rained on my face. Oh, how I longed to return her embrace, and cry, I live! And yet I was lying there, powerless, motionless, inert. You are very foolish, suddenly said Madame Gabin. It is all wasted. Never mind, answered Marguerite, sobbing. I want him to wear his very best things. I understood that she was dressing me in the clothes I had worn on my wedding day. I had kept them carefully for great occasions. When she had finished, she fell back exhausted in the armchair. Simoneau now spoke. He had probably just entered the room. They are below, he whispered. Well, it ain't any too soon, answered Madame Gabin, also lowering her voice. Tell them to come up and have it over. But I dread the despair of the poor little wife. The old woman seemed to reflect and presently resumed. Listen to me, Monsieur Simoneau. You must take her off into my room. I wouldn't have her stop here. It is for her own good. When she is out of the way, we'll get it done in a jiffy. These words pierced my heart, and my anguish was intense when I realized that a struggle was actually taking place. Simoneau had walked up to Marguerite, imploring her to leave the room. Do, for pity's sake, come with me, he pleaded. Spare yourself a useless pain. No, no, she cried. I will remain till the last minute. Remember that I have only him in the entire world, and when he is gone I shall be all alone. From the bedside Madame Gabin was prompting the young man. Don't parley. Take hold of her. Carry her off in your arms. Was Simoneau going to lay his hands on Marguerite and bear her away? She screamed. I wildly endeavored to rise, but the springs of my limbs were broken. I remained rigid unable to even lift my eyelids to see what was going on. The struggle continued, and my wife clung to furniture, repeating, Oh, don't, don't, have mercy, let me go. He must have lifted her in his stalwart arms, for I heard her moaning like a child. He bore her away, her sobs were lost in the distance, and I fancied I saw them both. He, tall and strong, pressing her to his breast, she, 
fainting, powerless and conquered, following him wherever he listed. Dread it all, what it to do, muttered Madame Gabin. Now for the tug of war, as the coast is clear at last. In my jealous madness I looked upon this incident as a monstrous outrage. I had not been able to see Marguerite for twenty-four hours, but at least I had still heard her voice. Now even this was denied me. She had been torn away. A man had eloped with her even before I was laid under the sod. He was alone with her, on the other side of the wall, comforting her, embracing her perhaps. But the door opened once more, and heavy footsteps shook the floor. "'Quick! Make haste!' repeated Madame Gabin. "'Get it done before the lady comes back.' She was speaking to some strangers, who merely answered her with uncouth grunts. "'You understand,' she went on. "'I am not a relation. I am only a neighbor. I have no interest in the matter. It is out of pure good nature that I have mixed up myself in their affairs. And it ain't over cheerful, I can tell you. Yes, yes, I sat up the whole blessed night. It was pretty cold, too, about four o'clock. That's a fact.' Well, I've always been a fool. I am too soft-hearted. The coffin had been dragged into the center of the room. As I had not awakened, I was condemned. My ideas lost their clearness. Everything seemed to resolve in a black haze, and I experienced such utter lassitude that it seemed almost a relief to leave off hoping. They haven't spared the material, said one of the undertaker's men in a gruff voice. The box is too long. He'll have all the more room said the other, laughing. I was not heavy, and they chuckled over it since they had three flights of stairs to descend. As they were seizing me by the shoulders and feet, I heard Madame Gabin fly into a violent passion. "'You cursed little brat!' she screamed. "'What do you mean by poking your nose where you're not wanted? Look here, I'll teach you to spy and pry!' Dede had slipped her tousled hair through the doorway to see how the gentleman was being put into the box. Two ringing slaps now sounded, followed by an explosion of sobs. As soon as the mother returned, she began to gossip about her daughter for the benefit of the two men who were settling me in the coffin. She is only ten, you know. She is not a bad sort of girl, but she is frightfully inquisitive. I do not beat her often, only I will be obeyed. Oh, said one of the men, all kids are alike. Whenever there is a corpse lying about, they always want to see it. I was commodiously stretched out, and I might have thought myself still in bed, had it not been that my left arm felt a trifle cramped from being squeezed against a board. The men had been right. I was pretty comfortable inside on account of my diminutive stature. Stop! suddenly exclaimed Madame Gabin. I promised his wife to put a pillow under his head. The men who were in a hurry stuffed in a pillow roughly. One of them, who had mislaid his hammer, began to swear. He had left the tool below, and went to fetch it, dropping the lid. And when the two sharp blows of the hammer drove in the first nail, a shock ran through my being. I had ceased to live. The nails now entered in rapid succession with a rhythmical cadence. It was as if some packers had been closing a case of dried fruit with easy dexterity. After that such sounds as reached me were deadened and strangely prolonged, as if the deal coffin had been changed into a huge music box. The last words spoken in the room of the Rue Dauphine, at least the last ones I heard distinctly, were uttered by Madame Gabin. Mind the staircase, she said. The banister of the second flight isn't safe, so be careful. While I was being carried down, I experienced a sensation similar to that of pitching, as when one is on board a ship in a rough sea. However, from that moment, my impressions became more vague. I remember that the only distinct thought that still possessed me was an imbecile impulse of curiosity as to by which road I should be taken to the cemetery. I was not acquainted with a single street of Paris, and I was ignorant of the position of the large burial grounds, though, of course, I had occasionally heard their names. And yet every effort of my mind was directed upon ascertaining whether we were turning to the right or to the left. Meanwhile, the hearse, jolting over the paving stones, the rumbling of passing vehicles, the steps of foot passengers, all created a confused clamor intensified by the acoustical properties of the coffin. At first I followed our course pretty closely, then came to a halt. I was again lifted and carried about, and I concluded that we were in a church. 
but when the funeral procession once more moved onwards i lost all consciousness of the road we took a ringing of bells informed me that we were passing another church and then the softer and easier progress of the wheels indicated that we were skirting a garden or park i was like a victim being taken to the gallows stupidly awaiting the death blow that never came at last they stopped and pulled me out of the hearse the business proceeded rapidly the noises had ceased i knew that i was in a deserted space amid avenues of trees and with the broad sky over my head no doubt a few persons followed the bier some of the inhabitants of the lodging house perhaps simono and others for instance for faint whisperings reached my ear then i heard a chanted psalm and some latin words mumbled by a priest after which i suddenly felt myself sinking while the ropes rubbing against the angles of the coffin elicited lugubrious sounds as if a bow were being drawn across the strings of a cracked violoncello it was the end on the left side of my head i felt a violent concussion like that produced by the bursting of a bomb there was another shock under my feet and a third more violent still on my chest so forcible indeed was this last one that i thought the lid was cleft in twain i fainted End of section 28section 29 of the jolly parisians and other novelettes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by brandon weston marguerite by emile zola translated by george d cox chapter 4 buried alive it is impossible for me to say how long my swoon lasted eternity is not of longer duration than one second in nihility i was no more slowly confusedly i regained some degree of consciousness i was still asleep but i began to dream a nightmare started into shape from the blackness of my horizon it was a strange fancy which in other days had haunted my morbid imagination whenever with my propensity for dwelling upon hideous thoughts i had conjured up catastrophes thus i dreamed that my wife was expecting me somewhere at guerande i believe and that i was going to join her by rail as we passed under a tunnel a deafening roll thundered over our heads a sudden subsidence had blocked up both issues of the tunnel leaving our train intact in the centre we were walled up by blocks of rock in the heart of the mountain then a long and fearful agony commenced no assistance could possibly reach us it would take a month to clear the tunnel even with powerful engines and incessant labor we were prisoners in a cave with no outlet so that our death was only a question of time my fancy had often dwelt on this hideous drama constantly varying the details and touches my actors were men women and children their number increased to hundreds and they were ever furnishing me with new incidents there were some provisions on the train but these were soon exhausted and the hungry passengers if they did not actually devour human flesh at least fought furiously over the last piece of bread sometimes an aged man was driven back with blows and slowly perished a mother struggled like a she-wolf to keep three or four mouthfuls for her child in my own compartment a bride and bridegroom were dying clasped in each other's arms in mute despair the line was free along the whole length of the train and people came and went prowling around the carriages like beasts of prey in search of carrion all classes were confounded a millionaire a high functionary it was said wept on a workman's shoulder the lamps had been extinguished from the first and the engine fire was nearly out to pass from one carriage to another it was necessary to grope about and thus too one slowly reached the engine recognizable by its enormous barrel its cold immobile flanks its useless strength its grim silence in the overwhelming night nothing could be more appalling than this train entombed alive with its passengers perishing one by one i gloated over the ghastliness of each detail howls resounded through the vault somebody whom one could not see whose vicinity was not even suspected would drop upon one's shoulder but what affected me the most of all was the cold and the want of air i had never felt so chilled 
a mantle of snow seemed to enwrap me. A heavy moisture rained upon my skull. I was suffocating. The rocky vault appeared to crush my chest. The whole mountain was seemingly weighing upon me. Suddenly a cry of deliverance sounded. For some time past, we fancied we could hear a dull sound, and we tried to hope that men were at work and that help was coming, but it came not thus. One of the passengers, however, had discovered an air shaft in the tunnel, and crowding round we all saw this shaft above which we could discern a blue patch about the size of a wafer. That blue patch filled us with rapture, for it was the sky. We stretched ourselves and stood on tiptoe to breathe more freely. Then we distinguished some black specks moving about, specks that must surely be workmen about to deliver us. A furious clamor arose. The cry, Saved! Saved! burst from every mouth, while trembling arms were uplifted toward the tiny azure patch above. That roar of voices aroused me. Where was I? In the tunnel, of course. I was lying at full length. Hard walls were pressing against my ribs. Then I attempted to rise and struck my head roughly. Was it the rock closing in on all sides? The blue speck had vanished. I, the sky had disappeared, and I was still suffocating, shivering, with chattering teeth. All at once I remembered. A great horror lifted my hair. I felt the hideous truth freeze me from head to foot like ice. I had shaken off the long coma which for so many hours had stricken me with corpse-like rigidity. Yes, I could move. My hands felt the boards of my coffin. My lips parted. Words came to me, and instinctively I called out Marguerite's name. It was a scream I raised. In that deal box my voice had acquired so hoarse and weird a sound that it terrified me. Oh my God! Was this thing true? I was able to walk, speak, cry out that I was living, and yet my voice could not be heard. I was entombed under the earth. I made a desperate effort to remain calm and reflect. Was there no means of getting out? Then my dream began afresh in my troubled brain. The fanciful air shaft with the blue bit of sky overhead was mingled with the real grave in which I was lying. I stared at the darkness with widely opened eyes. Perhaps I might discover a hole, a slit, a glimmer of light, but only sparks of fire flitted through that night with rays that broadened and then faded away. I was in a somber abyss again. With returning lucidity I struggled against these fatal visions. Indeed, I needed all my reason if I meant to try to save myself. The most immediate peril lay in the increasing sense of suffocation. If I had been able to live so long without air, it was owing to the suspended animation which had changed all the normal conditions of my existence. But now that my heart beat, my lungs breathed, I should die asphyxiated if I did not promptly liberate myself. I also suffered from cold, and dreaded lest I should succumb to the mortal numbness of those who fall asleep in the snow never to wake again. Still, while unceasingly realizing the necessity of remaining calm, I felt maddening blasts sweep through my brain, and to quiet my senses I exhorted myself to patience, trying to remember the circumstances of my burial. Probably the ground had been bought for five years, and this was against my chances of self-deliverance, for I remembered having noticed at Nantes that in the trenches of the common graves one end of the last lowered coffins protruded into the next open cavity, in which case I should only have to break through one plank. But if I were in a separate hole, filled up above me with heavy mass of earth, the obstacles would prove too great. Had I not been told that the dead were buried six feet deep in Paris, how was I to pierce through the enormous mass of soil above me? Even if I succeeded in slitting the lid of my beer open, the mold would drift in like fine sand and fill my mouth and eyes. That would be death again, a ghastly death, like drowning in mud. However, I began to feel the planks carefully. The coffin was roomy, and I found that I was able to move my arms with tolerable ease. On both sides the roughly planed boards were stout and resistive. I slipped my arm onto my chest to raise it over my head. There I discovered in the top plank a knot of wood which yielded slightly at my pressure. 
Working laboriously, I finally succeeded in driving out this knot, and on passing my finger through the hole I found that the earth above was wet and clayey. But that availed me little. I even regretted having removed the knot, vaguely dreading the eruption of the mold. A second experiment occupied me for a while. I tapped all over the coffin to ascertain if perchance there were any vacuum outside, but the sound was everywhere the same. At last, as I was slightly kicking the foot of the coffin, I fancied that it gave out a clearer echoing noise, but that might merely be produced by the sonority of the wood. At any rate, I began to press regularly against the boards with my arms and my closed fists. In the same way, too, I used my knees and back and my feet without eliciting even a creak from the wood. I strained with all my strength, indeed with so desperate an effort of my whole frame that my bruised bones seemed breaking, but nothing moved, and I became insane. Up to that minute I had held delirium at bay. I had mastered the intoxicating rage, mounting to my head like the fumes of alcohol. I had silenced my screams, for I feared that if I again cried out aloud I should be undone. But now I yelled, I shouted, unearthly howls which I could not repress issued from my relaxed throat. I called for help in a voice that I did not recognize, growing wilder with each fresh appeal, and crying out that I would not die. I also tore at the wood with my nails. I writhed with the contortions of caged wolf. I do not know how long this fit of madness lasted, but I can still feel the relentless hardness of the box that imprisoned me. I can still hear the storm of shrieks and sobs with which I filled it at all times. A remaining glimmer of reason made me try to stop, but I could not do so. A great exhaustion followed. I lay waiting for death in a state of somnolent pain. The coffin was like stone, which no effort could break, and the conviction of my impotence left me unnerved, without courage to make any fresh attempts. Another suffering, hunger, was presently added to cold and the want of air. The torture soon became intolerable. With my finger I tried to pull small pinches of earth through the hole of the dislodged knot, and I swallowed them eagerly only increasing my torment. Tempted by my flesh, I bit my arms and sucked my skin with a fiendish desire to plunge my teeth in deeper, but I was afraid of drawing blood. Then I ardently longed for death. All my life long I had trembled at the thought of dissolution, but I had come to yearn for it, to crave for an everlasting night that could never be dark enough." How childish it had been of me to dread the long, dreamless sleep, the eternity of silence and gloom. Death was kind, for in suppressing life it put an end to suffering. Oh, to sleep like the stones, to be no more. With my groping hands I aimlessly continued feeling the wood, and suddenly I pricked my left thumb. The slight pain startled me out of my growing numbness. What could have caused it? I felt again and found a nail a nail which the undertaker's men had driven in crookedly and which had not caught in the lower wood. It was long and very sharp. The head was secured to the lid, but it moved. Henceforth I had put one idea, to possess myself of that nail. I slipped my right hand across my body and began to shake it. I made but little progress, however. It was a difficult job, for my hands soon tired, and I had to use them alternately, the left one, too, was of little use on account of the nail's awkward position. While I was obstinately persevering, a plan was forming in my head. That nail meant salvation, and I must have it. But should I get it in time? Hunger was torturing me, my brain was swimming, my limbs were losing their power, my mind was becoming confused. I had sucked the drops that trickled from my punctured finger, and suddenly I bit my arm and drank my own blood. Then, spurred on by pain, revived by the tepid, acrid liquor that moistened my lips, I tore desperately at the nail, and at last I wrenched it off. I then believed in success. My plan was a simple one. I pushed the point of the nail into the lid, dragging it along as far as I could in a straight line, and working it so as to make a slit in the wood. 
My fingers stiffened, but I doggedly persevered, and when I fancied that I had sufficiently cut into the board, I turned onto my stomach, and lifting myself on my knees and elbows, thrust the whole strength of my back against the lid. But although it creaked, it did not yield. The notched line was not deep enough. I had to resume my old position, which I only managed to do with infinite trouble, and work afresh. At last, after another supreme effort, the lid was cleft from end to end. I was not saved as yet, but my heart beat with renewed hope. I had ceased pushing and remained motionless, lest a sudden fall of earth should bury me. I intended to use the lid as a screen, and with its protection to open a sort of shaft in the clayey soil. Unfortunately, I was assailed by unexpected difficulties. Some heavy clods of earth roughly detached weighed upon the boards and made them unmanageable. I foresaw that I should never reach the surface in that way, for the crumbling mass of soil was already bending my spine and crushing my face. Once more I stopped affrighted. Then suddenly, while I was stretching out my legs trying to find a point of resistance for my feet, I felt the end board of the coffin yielding. I at once gave a desperate kick with my heels, in the faint hope that there might be a freshly dug grave in this direction. It was so. My feet abruptly forced their way into the space. An open grave was there. It had only a slight partition of wood to displace, and soon I rolled into it. I was saved. I remained for a time lying on my back in the cavity, with my eyes raised to heaven. It was dark. The stars were shining in a sky of velvety blueness. Now and then a raising breeze wafted a spring-like freshness, a perfume of foliage upon me. I was saved. I could breathe. I felt warm, and I wept, and I stammered, with my arms prayerfully extended towards the starry sky. Oh, God, how sweet seemed life. End of section 29